Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 13th meeting of this committee in 2021. Our public business today is an evidence session with the Right Honourable Alex Salmond, former First Minister of Scotland. At the outset, can I note for members, for Mr Salmond and for all those watching this evidence session at home, that due to the necessary mitigations that need to be in place to allow us all to meet safely under COVID restrictions in person today, the evidence session will be suspended for a short while at around 2.15pm so that we can allow the room to be ventilated and cleaned. I'd also note for those watching that every effort has been made to make this evidence session as safe as possible for all involved, including social distancing around the table and within the committee room. Can I begin by reminding all those present and watching that we are bound by the terms of our remit and the relevant court orders, including the need to avoid contempt of court by identifying certain individuals, including through jigsaw identification. The committee as a whole has agreed that it is not our role to revisit events that were a focus of the trial that could be seen to constitute a rerun of the criminal trial. Our remit is clear, and it is, to consider and report on the actions of the First Minister, Scottish Government officials and special advisers in dealing with complaints about Alex Salmond, former First Minister, considered under the Scottish Government's handling of harassment complaints involving current or former ministers and procedure and actions in relation to the Scottish Ministerial Code. The more we get into specifics of evidence, that is time, people, cases, the more we run the risk of identifying those who made complaints. The more we ask about specific matters covered in the trial, including events explored in the trial, the more we run the risk of rerunning the trial. In questions, reference to specific dates and individuals should be avoided, and questions should be phrased in general terms where possible to avoid the risk of jigsaw identification of complainants. In addition, do not refer to civil servants by name unless absolutely necessary, and do not refer to civil servants by name below senior civil service level. I would also emphasise that the committee would be content to receive written supplementary points should Mr Salmond have concerns that a response to a question may stray into this territory. With that, can I welcome Alex Salmond, former First Minister of Scotland, and I begin by inviting Mr Salmond to make the oath. Please raise your right hand, Mr Salmond, and then repeat, I swear by Almighty God that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I swear by Almighty God that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Can I now invite you, Mr Salmon, to make an opening statement, please? Thank you very much, convener. Three important points require to be made at the outset. Firstly, this inquiry is not about me. I have already established the illegality of the actions of the Scottish Government in the Court of Session, and I have been acquitted of all criminal charges by jury in the highest court in the land. These are both the highest courts in the land, the highest civil court and the highest criminal court. The remit for this inquiry is about the actions of others. There is an investigation into the conduct of ministers, the permanent secretaries, civil servants and special advisers. It also requires to shine a light on the activities of the Crown Office and to examine the unacceptable conduct of those who appear to have no understanding of the importance of separation of party and government and prosecution authorities and indeed of the rule of law itself. It was the government who were found to have been acted unlawfully, unfairly and tainted by apparent bias. I know that the First Minister asserts that I have to prove a case. I don't. That has already been done. There have been two court cases, two judges, one jury. In this inquiry, it is the Scottish Government, a government which has already admitted to behaving unlawfully, who are under examination. Secondly, my interest in assisting this inquiry is out of respect for our Parliament. I have made no personal public comment on these matters of any kind for 11 months, not a single television interview or press interview or statement. I have turned down hundreds of such offers, which, as committee members will know, has not hitherto been my normal policy. 
I have watched with growing frustration over the last six months while this committee has been systematically deprived of the evidence it has legitimately sought. Indeed, I'm just about your only witness who has been actively trying to present you with evidence as opposed to withholding it. As we saw this week, even after it is published, it is then unpublished by intervention of a Crown Office who should not be questioning the will of Parliament. I watched an astonishment on Wednesday when the First Minister of Scotland, the First Minister of Scotland, used a COVID press conference, a COVID press conference, to effectively question the result of a jury. Still, I said nothing. Well, today, that changes. I have no incentive or advantage in revisiting the hurt and shock of the last three years from a personal perspective, or indeed from the perspective of two complainants failed by the government and then forced directly against their express wishes into a criminal process. This now admitted action neither served the wishes of the complainants nor the interests of justice. For two years and six months, this has been a nightmare. In fact, I have every desire to move on, to turn the page, to resist talking yet again about a series of events which have been amongst the most wounding that any person can face. But the reason I am here today is because we can't turn that page, nor move on, until the decision-making which is undermining the system of government in Scotland is addressed. The competence and professionalism of the civil service matters. The independence of the Crown Office as acting in the public interest matters. Acting in accordance with legal advice matters. Concealing evidence from the courts matters. The duty of candour of public authorities matters. Democratic accountability through Parliament matters. Suppressing evidence from parliamentary committees matters. And yes, ministers telling the truth to Parliament matters. The day such things come to not matter would be a dark and dangerous one for Scotland. Collectively, these events shine a light <clears throat> on a government whose actions are no longer true to the principles of openness, accountability and transparency, which are the core principles on which this Scottish Parliament was founded. I remember I was there. The failures of leadership are many and obvious, and yet, convener, not a single person has taken responsibility, not a single resignation, not a single sacking, not even an admonition. Instead, we have promotions or extensions of contracts and self-serving defences. The government acted illegally, but somehow nobody is to blame. Delay and obstruction in making evidence available. A committee has been asked to do its job with both hands tied behind its back and a blindfold on. Witness after witness later adjusting evidence delivered under oath. Were it not for the independence of the judiciary, the robust scrutiny of the court of session and the common sense of a jury made up of members of the public, the matters before this committee would never have come to light and indeed no one would have cared about this inquiry. The Scottish courts emerged from these events with a reputation enhanced. Can those leading the government and the Crown Office say the same? Some people say that the <coughs> failures of these institutions, the blurring of the boundaries between party, government and prosecution service, mean that Scotland is in danger of becoming a failed state. I disagree. The Scottish civil servant has not failed. Its leadership has failed. The Crown Office has not failed. Its leadership has failed. Scotland has not failed. Its leadership has failed. So the importance of this inquiry is for each and every one of us to help put this right. My final point is simply this. I am a private citizen. Unlike just about every other person represented at this inquiry, I have had no one paying my legal fees and have had to contend with the resources of the Scottish Government being used to further tarnish my reputation. Just as they spent £600,000 defending their illegal policy before collapsing in the Judicial Review, and just as enormous time, effort and public money has been devoted to the task of refusing to give this committee the documentation it requires, 
The pattern is undeniable. The Government refused to hand over documentation in the civil case. It required a commission to extract it from them. The permanent secretary was brought to give evidence under oath just to extract documents she had a duty to provide to the court. The Government ignored the provisions of a search warrant in the criminal case and, despite the impact on the administration of justice, still withheld key documents which should have been put before the jury. This committee has been blocked and tackled at every turn with calculated and deliberate suppression of key evidence. Even Parliament, <coughs> our Scottish Parliament, has been defied despite two votes demanding the external legal advice, legal advice that the public have paid for. My evidence has been published, then subsequently censured by intervention of the Crown Office, evidence that they had previously agreed was lawful. And even today, I appear before you under the explicit threat of prosecution if I reveal evidence for which the committee has asked. Not to fulfil my oath and tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, would be a contempt. But Crown Office says it might lead to prosecution. People should just stop and think for a moment about that. The ability of any witness before any parliament to tell the truth and fulfil their oath is effectively being questioned by the Crown Office. The truth is those that now demand to see evidence have invested a great deal of time and public money in attempting to hide that evidence. When this inquiry ends, neutered though it may be, I'll consider that I've discharged my duty as a citizen and as a former First Minister. It will then be for others to consider their own positions in the light of what this committee decides. This inquiry, in my opinion, <coughs> is a chance to assert what type of Scotland we are trying to create. Few would now dispute that our country is a better place for achieving our Parliament. However, the move to independence, which I have sought all my political life and continue to seek, must be accompanied by institutions whose leadership is strong and robust and capable of protecting each and every citizen from arbitrary authority. Such a principle is a central component of the rule of law. It matters to every person in Scotland as much as it always has done. It is the bedrock of our democracy, of justice and of fairness. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr Salmond. Uh, and can I also thank you, Mr Salmond, for submitting your evidence in the chronological fashion that you have. Um, and the committee um, has agreed that we will pursue this evidence session in that manner. So I, I will ask uh, the first question, I think. I was really interested um, to read in your evidence, Mr Salmond, about the fairness at work policy. And uh, you have said that, as First Minister, you approved the policy. Uh, and were very involved in its development. I wonder if you could talk us through how this came about, um, also in relation to the trade unions and some of the evidence we've taken from the FDA about informal solutions that were used to correct potential problems, etc. Your understanding of the development and the implementation of the Fairness at Work policy. Hey, thank you, convener. I'll turn to your question just in a second, but as we've uh, agreed, I'm uh, required to uh, explain to those watching the proceedings and on legal advice uh, to read out a short legal statement. Uh, I am severely hampered in making this evidence by two constraints placed upon me by the Crown Office. First, in relation to an order placed under Section 11 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981, Members will be aware of the unwarranted intervention of the Crown Office to ensure redaction of key passages from my evidence as they relate to meetings in March and April 2018, which have a direct bearing on the events being examined by this committee. The evidence will not now be heard fully today in this Parliament, despite being freely available online and elsewhere. In my estimation, it is very damaging to the work of this committee and to a public seeking answers. It is an intervention which has drawn widespread criticism, including a, a note this morning from Lord Hope, the former president of our Court of Session. Secondly, in relation to the further blocking of evidence from this committee, 
I would draw attention of the committee to the decision of the Crown Office to prevent disclosure of evidence demonstrating the conduct of key individuals in this inquiry under reference to section 162 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act Scotland 2010. This provision, and I know this because I was First Minister when it was introduced, was not passed by the Parliament to prevent a parliamentary inquiry getting to the truth on matters of the utmost public interest. It is being misused in its current context, and the application of these provisions and the threat of prosecution <coughs> excuse me, Kivir, the application of these provisions and the threat of prosecution made me, if I offer to me, if I offer that evidence, is in my estimation both extraordinary and unwarranted. Uh, and now to address your, your question, yes, I, I was involved in the origins of the Fairness to, to Work policy. It emerged over a period of uh, 18 months. It was uh, involved in detailed discussions over that period of time. Uh, it was a well-considered, developed policy. It was original in the concept. It was the first policy, as far as I'm aware, in any public administration in these islands which brought ministers into effectively the same policy as civil servants. Uh, and it was uh, finally passed, I think, in the summer of 2010. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if you could talk about how it <coughs> came about and in relation to the trade union involvement and some of the concerns that you've said in your evidence that the FDA had raised about the lack of uh, coherent policy in that regard? Well, uh, not just the FDA, but the, the Council of Unions represented in the, in the Scottish Government, but all the, the unions jointly in the Partnership Board. Now, <clears throat> I, I supplied for the committee a minute of the Partnership Board from uh, the 24th of November uh, 2009, <clears throat> and that expresses it very well, because that's the, the minute where the, the unions are expressing their concerns, which they'd made over a, a number of years, as you'll note from the, the minute, if it's available to the committee, which goes right back <clears throat> to the origins of the uh, Scottish uh, Government, but the Scottish Executive, the former Scottish Office. So they were going back you know, 20 years uh, and more. And they'd expressed concerns uh, about ministerial offices in particular and the behaviour of a, uh, a number of ministers. The concern in particular was the, the idea that uh, civil servants working in the ministerial offices, that's private sectors, were working probably harder and longer uh, than anyone else in the, the civil service. And I think that was the, the major content, uh, contention. They had brought this. The aim and purpose of the unions, as it was explained to me, was to bring ministers into effectively the same policy as civil servants. Uh, and therefore, ministers were added to the policy which became fairness, uh, fairness at Work. And it was passed in 2010. Uh, I can answer any more detail, if you like, Linda. No, thank you for that. <coughs> I think our Vice Convener, Margaret Mitchell, has questions on this as well. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr Salmon. Um, before I, I, I go on to phase one, I, uh, I'm very conscious of what you said. You are here as a key witness, having been the First Minister from 2008 to 2014 and the petitioner in the judicial review, which was found, as you said, to be unlawful. And you, you also mentioned um, the frustration that this parliamentary committee, in, as an inquiry committee, has experienced from the obfuscation, the uh, sometimes downright refusal uh, and other times delay in providing material which, way back when we met in private, which would be um, to establish our remit, which would be two years ago now. Uh, despite doing that to make sure that when we could meet in public, we would be hitting the ground running. So my question is to you, and I understand uh, and agree in, entirely that democratic accountability and this parliament's ability um, to hold any government of the day to account if it feels it's acted uh, unlawfully, if it feels it has abused its power, or if it's merely so incompetent that it's tantamount to that. You've suggested that you think the powers are there, it's just the present government that aren't using them properly. So can you explain to me, where are the powers that 
um, allow us to move forward from the position, as again you said in your opening statement, that um, the Deputy First Minister representing the government uh, has refused to issue um, against the will of the Parliament to issue legal advice, external legal advice, as you say, paid by um, the taxpayer, and has refused to give us, or been very, very late in giving us um, information that we need now. Well, there's a number of points uh, uh, there, Ms Mitchell. The, uh, first, on the institutional point, uh, I think the, the Parliament has the ability to assert itself uh, in that position at the present moment. I mean, the, uh, it's not for me to tell parliamentarians what they do, but motions can be placed down uh, affecting the, the conduct of ministers and instructing ministers to, to do things on pain of further motions of, of whatever kind. But there are censure motions available within the parliament. The question is, does the, is there a parliamentary majority to sustain them? That, that's the question. However, I, I cannot ever think... I mean, there is an understandable reason for reluctance to reveal legal advice uh, as a, a general rule. But the, the rules as drawn up provide for exceptions in the public interest. Uh, and uh, there have been a number of precedents in the past. Uh, I think of the, the blood uh, contamination inquiry, for example. <clears throat> and although every instance is going to be different, uh, and I think most people judging the current issue would say that after two parliamentary votes, then that legal advice should and must be, be furnished. Uh, it may be that something should be written into the, either the ministerial code uh, or, for that matter, into the standing orders of the parliament to, to make that clear. Uh, I, I'm just amazed that you'd have to go that far uh, to ensure that is done. The normal assumption would be that ministers would follow a clearly expressed will of the parliament when they're able to do so. That's helpful, but can I just ask you this further question? Do you consider that the robust or the checks and balances that are in place are, um, are robust enough to ensure the proper division of power between the executive of the day and the parliament of the day holding that executive to account? And the divisions of power on the kind of people that we are looking at under our remit, the first minister, the Scottish government officials, the, super, uh, the special advisers, and our independent crown and procure and prosecution service. Uh, we know in England, for example, there's a separate um, director of public prosecution. Here, um, the Lord Advocate has a, a dual role. So are you convinced that the, the system as it is, the centralised government, which I think you said that you, you introduced and perhaps regretted doing so, are you convinced that um, these powers are perfectly OK and nothing needs to be changed, regardless of what govern government we, we are looking at holding to account, whether that's a coalition government, whether it's um, a conservative government, we live in all, <laughs> and, um, or whether it's uh, an SNP or some other uh, combination. Well, very fairly put, uh, Ms Mitchell. The, I certainly don't regret this institution and my part in, in bringing it into being. And I, I still have an ambition that this institution would go further uh, towards independence. That's my, my view. But any institution is going to learn lessons from, from experience. I mean, the Parliament has changed its procedures over the years in a number of ways. Uh, for example, the independent supervision of the ministerial code was something that I introduced. That, that was a a good thing is a good thing, but it's an example of how you can develop your procedures. I have to say I hadn't really contemplated the idea that, that a government would refuse to obey two parliamentary votes. I can just about see the argument for saying, we'll, we'll put it to the test again to see if that is the parliament's will. I can just about see that. But uh, two parliamentary votes in terms of uh, revealing the legal advice which the public had paid for, uh, which is pertinent to a parliamentary inquiry, it is not something that I would ever have anticipated. I would have thought that would have been done. In terms of the institutional balance, yes, I, I think there is an argument for the uh, separating the, uh, the government advisor role of the Lord Advocate from the prosecutorial role as the Chief Prosecutor of Scotland. I think there is an argument for that. I sort of 
made a move towards that when I became First Minister in that the Lord Advocate did not normally attend Cabinet, only attended Cabinet when he had advice, or she had advice in that case, to dispense. I thought that was a good thing. I am not certain that has been fully adhered to since, but that was certainly my practice. But perhaps it should go further. My own view, however, that we should not confuse institutional failure with, with, uh, uh, with personnel. Uh, the, uh, I think the leadership of these institutions have serious questions to, to answer. Uh, and when you get to the stage that a government behaves unlawfully, I mean, this is not something that happens very often. I'm on the record politically when governments have been here, behaved unlawfully of uh, regarding that as a, a huge and heinous thing to have happened. It's not a slight matter. You know, some consequences should follow from unlawful conduct. Thank you for that. To get on to the um, fairness of Yes, work. please. Um, I, I note, Mr Salmond, on page three of, of your submission, um, you say, after this policy, which you, th you seem to be suggesting is as good as it gets, and now you can correct me if that's not a, a, a good assumption, that there were no formal complaints against any minister under this um, policy, and it was never invoked. Can I suggest to you that um, formal complaints under this policy set quite a high bar. They had to be in writing, and if they were against, and they clearly were, we know that from the FDA um, reports, they were at a period of time from 10, 2010 to 2014. They had to be put in writing, and they had to be against someone who was very powerful as a minister or, or even as a first minister. Um, and therefore, um, that was a bar that perhaps should be looked at. But we do know, and if you could just um, put this into your answer too, that what was done, and Barbara Allison told us this, um, the former permanent secretary told us, that they tried to resolve any issues, whether they were concerns, some of them people would call complaints, if not formal complaints, in an informal manner, perhaps using mediation. I wonder if you could talk to that um, and, and just confirm that did that work well? Was it in place? And um, uh, then it would be good to know, if so, tell me how that worked. Who took the lead? Was it director of um, HR? Uh, we know the, f the deputy first minister had a role. Was she involved? Um, and we know that you had a role at the formal complaint stage. I don't know if any earlier. OK, the, well, can I, can I just say, but before Fairness at Work in 2010, there was no process, a personnel process, for set process for, for holding ministers to account or being the, on the receiving end of complaints. It didn't exist. That was the aim and ambition of the unions. What happened before that, and uh, I should say that the example was cited by the, the unions at that time, it concerned a, a minister in a, a former previous administration and how it was dealt with in terms of the, the permanent secretary. But there was no set role at all. And the ambition of the unions was to put ministers into effectively the same policy on the same footing as civil servants. Uh, now, there, had to, there was a, an issue with that, and, and the issue is quite clear that the the, there is a statutory basis for the ministerial code. In, in statute, the Prime Minister or the First Minister has the responsibility for, for any minister in his or her cabinet. And you cannot circumvent the statutory basis of the ministerial code by putting forward a, a fairness at work policy. So the, the task was to accommodate the wishes of the union representatives to have ministers in the policy with the statutory basis of the ministerial code. And what I arrived at, I mean, I, listen, I wouldn't say it's perfect. It's certainly capable of being revised uh, and uh, developed and improved. I, I'm sure it is. But it hasn't, that hasn't happened. It's been effectively wiped out altogether, which I, I think is a very retrograde step. We're now in a situation where, as far as, as I understand it, bullying is concerned. Fairness at work still applies to, to ministers. But as far as harassment is concerned, there is effectively no policy because the, the, the policy that uh, was developed in 2017 has, has been obviously the subject of uh, my judicial review and, and declared unlawful. So it's now in limbo. 
So uh, th that's a totally unsatisfactory situation. And the point I was making in my submission <laughs> is it would be an improvement right now <clears throat> to reintroduce uh, fairness at work to cover, as it previously did, uh, ministers. I was astonished when the permanent secretary gave evidence to your committee and said that she wasn't an expert in fairness at work, uh, and then said it, had, it didn't cover harassment. Well, you know, fairness at work, the first section of what it covers is bullying and harassment. It does cover bullying and harassment and is in force at the present moment for the civil service. It's just not in force as far as harassment uh, concerns with ministers. It's a totally unsatisfactory situation. It's something that whatever people think about uh, this inquiry or, or the events of the last three years should have been sorted out. You cannot have a, a policy in limbo, but in limbo it most certainly is. I thought fairness at work was a good policy, but much, much more importantly, the union representatives thought it was not just a good policy, they thought it was a triumph and a huge achievement, and I've said so on repeated occasions. Therefore, just to cast it aside, it strikes me as a, a very unusual and foolhardy step. Uh, what you haven't addressed, Mr uh, Salmond, and that was uh, useful, is the informal resolution which we know was applied to address some of these concerns. And, uh, and we know you, you know about this because on 115, page 115 of the open record, then there was a challenge about the competency of um, an allegation, just very generally, which had already been resolved under the, this um, informal process. So can you talk generally about how this informal process worked for resolving a complaint against any of these ministers, was mediation used, and who would be involved? Can I speak generally, uh, Convener? Uh, the, the, the process of informal resolution is not just for ministers. It applies across the policy. In fact, dominates the policy. And as Barbara Allison said to this committee, she thought it was a good thing. And I think she's right to think it's a good thing. Mediation is not the same thing. Uh, mediation comes in when b beyond informal resolution. Uh, that's as far as civil servants are concerned. It's also as far uh, as ministers were concerned. Uh, and then when you get to mediation, uh, it's important for ministers that the first minister is not the person doing that because the First Minister, if the, if the complaint goes forward and is not mediated, would be the person who has to judge at the end of the policy the fate of that particular minister. So what was done was to have the Deputy First Minister responsible for mediation. If mediation failed, then it goes to, a th and you have to, I'm testing my memory now, a panel of three, I think, a, another minister, a senior civil servant, and an outside uh, a, a factor to, to, for impartiality. And then, after that was finished, if the complaint was still sustained, the matter goes to the First Minister for final uh, adjudication. The key point that was made, and I checked my notes uh, some time ago on this, and I think it was in February 2010 when I gave approval to, to the policy, uh, that John Elvidge, who was Permanent Secretary at the time, explained, he said that it was absolutely vital not to have the First Minister at two stages in the process, otherwise the process would be unlawful or potentially unlawful. Uh, obviously, sound advice uh, in terms of subsequent uh, uh, events, but it was a carefully considered devised policy, supported strongly by the trade unions. It was their ambition to have ministers in that policy as configured. And of course, it's a policy which still applies as far as the general civil service is concerned, because clearly, having achieved something like that, it won't be lightly given up by the, by the workforce representatives. I ask you, was the uh, Deputy First Minister then aware of mediation, conducted some mediations um, in that informal process? Because we want to know who knew what and when. A mediation is beyond the informal process. Yeah. It's, it's part of the formal process. That's what it went. There were no uh, complaints, uh, well, I was going to say to my knowledge, but certainly there were no complaints between 2010 and 2017 that required mediation. Uh, since there were no complaints, nothing went to Nicola Sturgeon as Deputy First Minister. 
in evidence, and I only learned this in evidence, you heard that there have been two complaints under, I suspect, the bullying aspect of fairness at work against ministers since 2017. They will have been dealt with under the policy, I assume, by John Swinney as, as Deputy First Minister. I don't know the outcome of, uh, of these complaints. I heard it for the, the first time when it was given in evidence to this committee. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Can I go now, please, to Maureen Watt? Thank you, Kilmina. Good afternoon, Mr Salmond. Um, just to follow on um, from uh, Margaret Mitchell's uh, questioning, the evidence that we've received showed that there were voices who supported a robust response to the rev revolutions of the Me Too movement. The First Minister supported such a response, as did the presiding officer of the Parliament, the head of the UK Civil Service, who, of course, line manages the permanent secretary. Uh, the Chamber in this Parliament and MSPs and all parties spoke up for such a response. So do you agree that putting in place a sexual harassment procedure was not only absolutely necessary, but was also in line with the consensus view across the political spectrum in Scotland? Well, as far as current ministers or civil servants, there already was one in the Fairness at Work policy. If it was felt that it needed uh, addition or strengthening, then doing proper consultation with the, the union representatives who'd spent 18 months devising it back in 2009-10, uh, then that should and could have been done and would have been an appropriate response. But that's not what happened. What happened was the development of an entirely new policy at pace, has been said a number of times to this committee, of course, which ended up in the, the court of session and a total disaster for all concerned. But from the evidence we've heard, um, they said that it would have taken a considerable amount of work to refit the Fairness at Work uh, policy. And the Fairness at Work policy did not have specific focus on sexual harassment. And the revelations of the Me Too movement made many people think that there was a need to start afresh in how we looked at, at sexual harassment. So isn't a new procedure the best way to do this? Can I just give, give me a second? Because I, 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 well, the, this is the Fairness at Work policy of 2010, as passed then. It seems to me from some of the papers you've been given there have been some amendments I don't understand, but this is the policy I knew and understood. A free to what does the policy cover? Most types of problems or concerns are covered. These should include point one, bullying and harassment. Now, the policy which you allude to, the, the one applied to former ministers and current ministers, is a policy on harassment. That's the title of it. If it was felt that it was necessary uh, to specify sexual harassment in that policy, then what should have happened, they should have sat down with the trade unions who devised that policy and said, we want to strengthen that criteria. But to say, as the Permanent Secretary did before this committee, that she didn't think that harassment was covered by the Fairness at Work policy, when it's item number one in the areas to be covered, strikes me not that she's just not an expert in the policy, it strikes me as if, well, it strikes me that she is not familiarised herself with the policy that she then wanted to replace. I think it's a, a reasonable, it would have been a reasonable assumption uh, for the civil service, for the public and for everyone else that before you replace something, you at least understand the nature of what you're replacing. And I, I've seen the documents that have come to, to the committee, Ms. Watt, and I would say that there is a reason why the trade unions have not accepted a, a new policy applying to the workforce. And that reason is that, uh, not that they think necessarily fairness at work is perfect, but they think fairness at work is an extremely strong policy, which is why it still applies to the thousands of people who work in the, the civil service. What was done was to take one aspect, uh, ministers, but actually, as we know from the origins of the policy, it was about former ministers, because the first uh, new policy was only to apply to former ministers, not ministers, uh, and, and take that out of virtually nowhere. Uh, I think that is a, a very bad way to develop policy. Policy has to be developed and has to respond to circumstances. I can well understand that in the, uh, the atmosphere of 2017, 
But what should have been done was to look at that policy, if it needed strengthening, strengthening, and above all, consult, cooperate, discuss with the very representatives who'd spent 18 months, 10 years before developing that policy. But it appears from the evidence that we've received that complaints were handled informally when you were First Minister. Sir Peter Housden, your former Permanent Secretary, stated that no formal complaints were received when he was in post, and Dave Penman of the FDA discussed informal concerns being handled by such methods as staff being moved so that they were away from a minister or colleague about whom they'd complained. I mean, surely you must agree that there was a need for a more robust procedure and greater focus on formal complaints was preferable to what went on as when you were First Minister? Well, the policy was not uh, developed by me in terms of informal complaints. That was the policy that was developed for everyone, not just for ministers, but for civil servants. That was the preference of the trade union movement. They signed off on the policy, as did the workforce representatives. I happen to agree in this case with Barbara Allison. I think the vast majority of workforce issues should be dealt with by informal procedures. That was the, what the policy emphasised, and the Scottish Government's on the record many times uh, as saying that. However, you know, times change and, and things change. All I'm saying, Ms Watt, is that if you're going to change a policy, uh, then you should consider what the existing policy actually is, fully understand it, and above all, you should consult with the people who developed that policy in the first place. Now, Mr Penman wasn't around in 2010. He had no part in the development of Fairness at Work. Uh, but you, know, you could consult with the people who did. But the current union representatives, including the FDA representative, uh, in December 2017, uh, wrote a, a letter to the Permanent Secretary reminding her that Fairness at Work was a considerable achievement for all concerned in advance of any other workplace policy in the United Kingdom. Uh, now, it seems to me, at the very least, if the policy was to be changed, it should have been changed in a considered and developed fashion and in full consultation. And, of course, one of the other things that your inquiry has thrown up is that uh, last-minute suggested changes were being made to the, the new developed policy, I think, on the day that it was being signed off by ministers uh, and considered even after, uh, in fact, no substantive changes were made. That is not how you develop workplace policies. It seems to be a, it would be a prime requirement to develop a workplace policy in consultation with the workforce. I mean, we've been shown a staff survey by the FDA which highlights a lack of confidence among civil servants in making complaints about bullying and, har and harassment. So would you agree that there was a clear problem with under-reporting of both bullying and harassment generally and sexual harassment specifically when you were First Minister and that a fresh procedure in the wake of the Me Too movement was necessary to address this? Well, I, I saw a, a survey, a current survey from the trade unions in the Scottish Government saying there had been a sharp rise over the last uh, three to five years in complaints. Now, some people argue, and I think the Permanent Secretary does, that that's a good thing because it shows that uh, this rising level of complaints is a, is a response to more robust policies. Other people would say that uh, the rising level of complaints indicates that uh, the that, uh, workforce policy is not working. Uh, you can take, you take your pick. All I'm saying, uh, Ms Watt, is that if you're going to develop a new policy, you should do it properly. Uh, otherwise, you end up in total and abject disaster. Uh, which has happened to this policy, which is why this committee is sitting where it is today. But Sir Peter Housden said that on the subject um, of the likelihood of women coming forward to re report sexual harassment, that a formal procedure on sexual harassment was one of the safeguards that it was uh, would likely make that more um, more likely. I mean, surely you can't disagree with that. And, are you saying that, you know, if you were had been First Minister in the wake of the Me Too movement, that you wouldn't have commissioned exactly a review of the sexual harassment procedure tailored to deal with sexual harassment and to seek to address the problems of underreporting? 
Well, I'm sure uh, Peter Housden would say that uh, his advice to me over the period he was permanent secretary uh, and I was first minister tried to keep uh, abreast of these things, and I saw nothing in his evidence that suggested otherwise. Uh, I, I, the hypotheticals, I don't know, I, but certainly I wouldn't have thrown uh, out a policy which was considered such a success while well concerned. It, it seems from what I read you, Ms Watt, uh, that it would be a fairly, uh, fairly simple exercise if you wanted to specify sexual harassment in the harassment section, although that's clearly what it uh, is about in that policy. Uh, then all you have to do is uh, look at that section and say, how do we strengthen it? If you want to change the balance between informal resolution, mediation and formal resolution, then, of course, you could amend the policy to change that balance. Uh, and it may be that would be a, a good thing to do. But my point is not that, Ms Mott. My point is the last thing you do on subjects like this is rush them through in spatchcock fashion in a matter of days without consultation with the trade unions in a manner which ended up in the court of session in total disaster for everyone concerned. That seems to be just a, a minimum requirement if you're dealing with a, an issue such as this. Nor is it clear from the, uh, nor is it clear from the, uh, uh, the documents you've received just how much ministerial consideration there was to this. Uh, on the one hand, it's argued that this was something being done by the civil service, totally independent of ministers. On the other hand, uh, it, there are areas which look like ministerial intervention. But what you can certainly say from the documents that you have is uh, that this policy arrived in early November with no discussion in Parliament, no discussion in Cabinet. Uh, a new policy dealing with former ministers had no discussion in Cabinet or Parliament. Uh, and uh, the first ministerial aspect to it it was the commissioning letter of the 22nd of November by the, the First Minister. So the policy had already been well established before it seems there was any direct political discussion of it. That's one of the extraordinary things about it, and uh, I, I find that uh, virtually inexplicable, but uh, maybe others have an answer to that. Was the Fairness at Work policy discussed? debated in Parliament? The Fairness at Work policy was debated over a period of 18 months by the trade unions. Uh, the, the, uh, there was no, as I know, uh, voices raised against it. It was regarded as a, a substantial, major innovation in policy. Uh, and certainly it was publicised and everybody knew about it. Uh, there was no... Uh, there was no uh, attempt to, to hide it or keep it undisclosed. On the contrary, it was something that we, we put down as a, a major achievement and, and the unions thought. Now, I'm not saying, uh, Ms. Watt, that changes couldn't be made, should be made, but if you're going to make changes in something as sensitive and something as important, then you know, it's really, really important to do it properly. I'll take that as a no, then. Um, we've heard evidence that one of the matters which eventually resulted in a complaint against you was resolved by you apologising to the woman in question. Was it typical for issues like this to be resolved via an apology rather than a formal complaints procedure mm -hmm. when you were First Minister? Yeah. Uh, you can choose whether or not to answer that, Mr Sand. I've had three years, uh, Ms Watt, a, of two court cases, two judges, one jury. And as far as these matters are concerned, I'll leave it to the, the courts and the, the jury, and I'm not going to be drawn in a further than that. And I, I think that's an entirely reasonable position under the, the circumstances. In terms of your question, the, the vast majority of uh, issues were dealt with by informal procedures. Uh, I think Barbara Allison made that point in her testimony, if I understood it correctly, and gave the, the reasons from a civil service point of view why she thought that could be advantageous. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I please move to Alex Cole-Hamilton and then Andy Wakeman? 
Thank you very much, convener. Good afternoon, Mr. Salmond. Um, I'd like to ask about culture and behaviours in your time as First Minister in the government. Um, but before I do, I want to address one aspect of your opening statement. Um, you talked in quite striking terms about the injury done to you by this whole process, this whole experience. But you made no mention of the considerable distress and misery caused to certain women at the heart of this. Um, I want to ask, laying aside the charges of which you've been acquitted and the, the allegations that you deny, of the behaviours that you have admitted to, um, some of which are appalling, are you sorry? Well, firstly, on my statement, uh, let's not uh, correct Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, I pointed out that uh, the government's uh, illegality has had huge consequences for a number of people and specifically mentioned the, the complainants in my opening statement. Uh, as for the other part of the, the question, uh, as I said to Ms Watt, uh, over the last three years there have been two court cases, two judges and a jury, and I'm resting on the proceedings of these cases. Thank you. I, I think the nation would like to hear uh, those Mr. words. Mr. Cole I, Hamilton, I will move on. can I, I just that. say, Mr. Salmon is not here on trial no, I understand by this committee, so please be much more general in your comments. I, I understand that. Um, I will move on. Um, so, Mr. Salmon, the questions I'm going to ask um, are about cultures and behaviours um, while you were First Minister and how they were addressed. This is not a, a, a criticism of you. It's not um, asking you to uh, defend yourself or anything like that. But we did hear that while you were First Minister, there was a, a degree of, shall we call it, water cooler discussion about behaviour on your part, not, not of a sexual kind, but of um, aggressive behaviour. Um, the, sort of, um, the sort of hair dryer treatment sometimes people refer to. I just want to know, do you recognise that description? Is that something you... Uh, Mr Cole Hamilton, uh, can I just say, as I've said already, we're not here to look at Mr Salmon's actions here. We are yeah. here to look at the Scottish Government's actions in relation to the complaints. So... One thing to that can be... Yeah, a, yes. uh, Mr James Hind uh, uh, had to write to this committee, if you remember, to correct Mr Hamilton's assumption from his, from his evidence. Uh, and uh, as will be noted, Mr Hind and I are not in agreement on a range of... Uh, a range of matters, but uh, on that, I very much agreed with him and very much appreciated what he wrote. I, I don't disagree. Um, and, and if you'll permit me, convener, I, I'm not in any way trying to draw out behaviours of Mr. Sam. I, I want to know about the informal culture as to how things were dealt with at the time he was First Minister. And in particular, because I think this, this actually speaks to a lot of the evidence um, that was given in your final submission, Mr Salmond, uh, about um, things that were raised with you and things that were not never raised with you. Um, th so in terms of that sort of... Um, whether that's um, aggressive behaviour brought about by fits of passion or whatever, um, did anyone in the SNP or the civil service ever address your temper with you personally? Uh, sorry, just give me just a second, convener, because I, I was looking at some, a document last night which would be pertinent to this. Uh, if you just allow me. Yeah. <laughs> In general, uh, Mr Cole Hamilton, the First Division Association of Civil Servants have written on several occasions to this committee. Uh, you've been accused, uh, not you personally, uh, let me add, but the committee as a whole has been accused of uh, intimidation, uh, rent-a-quote politicians, undermining civil service, scapegoating uh, individual civil servants, in effect, of bullying behaviour. Now, I haven't watched every session uh, of this committee, but I have watched most of them for, for obvious reasons. And I would say, in this committee's defence, I haven't seen that. Maybe it was in the one or two sessions that I didn't see. I'm merely saying that because something is said and written to you, it doesn't make it true. Uh, and I'm quite sure you would take issue yourself with what the FDA... Nor am I saying, incidentally, the FDA aren't representing their members in the, in the best way they can. I'm merely saying you know, that this is a, a dangerous road to, to go down. Uh, and uh, the Kavira has pointed out uh, what the issues at stake here are. And I think it would be a good idea for us all to, to concentrate on these issues, uh, as opposed to trying to take it into 
into more personal stuff. Thank you. Can, can I just uh, make very clear at this point that it's my job to decide all these things? Yeah. So would the two of you just uh, think on to what we're here for? Take that on board, and Mr. Cole Hamilton, would you start again? Well, please? thank you for reminding us of the criticism that this committee has come under, Mr. Salmond. Um, but nevertheless, the, there are answers that we need today, and and I, I accept that you're right to, to withhold or not answer if you don't feel it's within the remit of this committee, and that's absolutely fine. I take uh, it. Mr. Cole Hamilton, it's I also about Mr. Cole Hamilton. It's also about committee members not asking things that are in the remit of this committee. OK, I would dispute some of this is about how um, the government handles complaints and behaviours and uh, how the development of that over time. But nevertheless, yes, I will move okay. on. Um, I, I want to um, ask a specific question, and you have raised this in your final submission. So I think this is pertinent to That's our okay. inquiry. Um, and, and that is around um, the fact that, that nobody had ever raised concerns about sexual misconduct on your part. Um, prior to November um, the 5th. That, I mean, there was a, a complaint that was handled informally around the time of the referendum, which has been discussed already today. I just want to get for the record um, about that complaint that was handled informally around the time of the referendum. Um, did Nicola Sturgeon... Mr Cole Hamilton... <coughs> well, uh, convener, I'm you sorry, You said but... it had been discussed already today. Can you be more specific about what you're talking about? Well, Ms. Watt mentioned it. I believe the deputy... Yes, and I think I it. said to Mr. Salmond that okay. he didn't require to answer that. I'm just trying to get to the... I could help Mr. Hamilton. The, if he looks you carry at, on, Mr. Salmond. If he looks at my evidence, he will see that I state explicitly, because I saw it read, read in evidence, they were asked in a question at this committee, and I'm talking here generally, that, that to my knowledge about any minister, to my knowledge, no complaint was uh, put forward or informed by Ms Sturgeon, and I have not uh, made that uh, a charge against Ms Sturgeon, uh, and, and I think the committee would be wrong uh, to believe that was the case. To my knowledge, uh, no such complaint against any minister uh, reached the de desk of the, of the Deputy First uh, Minister. OK, so... Um, so the, can I just ask, just for the record then, um, and I think you've, you've largely covered that, and I appreciate it, but prior to the 5th of November 2017, uh, when she asked you about the Sky News allegations at the Edinburgh Airport, which you've covered in your own submission, that we will come on to again um, for other aspects of this inquiry, um, was there any occasion where Nicola Sturgeon raised questions or concerns with you about what she would describe as sexually inappropriate behaviour? I, I'm, I'm going to answer, uh, convener, uh, but the, if the inquiry is to stick to... I'm going to answer to, to help Mr Cole Hamilton, but if the inquiry is going to stick to its remit, then there, I mean, there are huge, huge issues at stake here. Uh, so the answer is no to your question. Uh, but they, they are not issues about any individual. And it's not... I mean, I've got... Uh, points to make about what I believe the current First Minister has done or not done, and they'll be made in response to relevant questions relevant to the committee. But uh, I've seen it pursued on the committee that somehow Nicola Sturgeon was covering up. That's not, not the case. My charges against Nicola Sturgeon don't include that. And the point I was making in my submission until that event, and incidentally, we, I hope we do go on to discuss it, because it, it wouldn't have been front-page news in any newspaper if it had ever been publicised at the time now, given what I know about it. Uh, that was, in all my years in public life, the first uh, indication of anything of that nature was in November 2017. came from a report from 10 years before a supposed incident, uh, and it was dealt with. Uh, it seemed to cause a great deal of consternation uh, by the permanent secretary, uh, and uh, perhaps we can explore that, because it may have been a factor in her thinking at that time. I can't be sure of that. But... Uh, and I merely make the point in my submission that over that 30-year period I'm speaking about, I must have been, for periods of it, the most investigated politician, certainly in Scotland and perhaps across these islands. And the fact that nothing came forward over these 30 years is a reasonable indication uh, that uh, there wasn't much there to, to, to come forward. And uh, I would think you should bear that in mind. And as I said uh, about my other criticisms of the, the First Minister, 
That is not one I hold. And I note that uh, I have criticism of Mr Murrell uh, as well, which we may get on to, to, to later. Uh, but I think he said that in his uh, evidence as well. And, and with that, convener, is it possible for us to get down to some of the, the yes, big issues I, I in this inquiry? So. I, I think, Mr Colhamilton, you've had quite a bit of time already, uh, not terribly relevant, and I'm looking at the clock and I'm anxious to get this session covering this element. I have one um, key question. Over. So, oh, well, if you've got a key yeah, question, just key I'll be interested question relating to, to the airport um, inquiry. And this is very important, Mr Salmon, because this will come on to questions I want to ask the First Minister next week. I just want It's a very simple question. When she presented the um, allegations to you in November 2017, did you threaten to resign from the SNP as a response to that allegation? <laughs> I, again, we're in territory which I... Uh, the, the answer is no, Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, and since you've raised it, let me, let me say again, the uh, press story, which, a Sky News story, which didn't amount to anything, I never, under, without the circumstances of this inquiry, we never would have amounted to, uh, to anything. It uh, would have... Uh, it were not the, the, the sort of uh, uh, matter where I'd be threatening resonance. So the, the answer is no. I, I think... In the atmosphere at the time, perhaps people were overreacting because of the atmosphere at that time in November 17 in a number of ways, uh, which perhaps explains uh, uh, other people's actions. But uh, the, the Sky News story was never broadcast, of course, and there was a good reason for it never being broadcast. Uh, and again, uh, I would just say that there are enormous issues before this committee, uh, and there's going to be plenty of questions that you'll be able to ask my successor over areas which are fundamental to this inquiry. But, uh, no, I didn't uh, threaten resignation. There was nothing to threaten resignation about. Uh, and uh, threatening resignation, I'm not sure, is the right term anyway. That's so very helpful, helpful no. convener. It actually <laughs> helps a, a subsequent line of questioning. But I'll pause there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Can I move on, please, to Andy Whiteman? Thanks very much, convener. Good afternoon, Mr Salmon. Thanks for coming along, and thanks for all your written uh, evidence. Um, can I take you back to the events of October 2017, which we've already talked about? This was, as you say, a, quite a heated um, uh, moment uh, with actresses and Westminster MPs being implicated in all of this, and particularly in respect of this parliament. Amar Anwar wrote in the Sunday Herald on the 29th of October 2017 of a, quote, catalogue of sexual harassment, stalking, social media abuse, sexual innuendo, verbal sexual abuse, touching, sexual assaults, requests for sex, cover-up, isolation and bullying in the Scottish parliament. Um, and that was the trigger, we know, for the First Minister, current First Minister, to write to the presiding officer. Uh, the government obviously set and trained certain procedures, and indeed the parliament set and trained certain procedures. Um, you've touched on this already, but just for clarity, if you had been First Minister at the end of October 2017, we know what the current First Minister did, um, but what would you have done in response to all of that? Well, I don't think the approach would have been much different uh, until it came to looking at a change of policy. I mean, normally what you do, you'd have a, a discussion, a debate that happened in the Scots Parliament on the 31st of October. There was a debate uh, or a discussion in Cabinet the same day. There was a revision of policy called for. Uh, so up until that point, I, I don't think any change at all. Uh, I would have thought that after hearing the variety of views that uh, came across in that discussion, you would then address the policies that you had in place to see if they needed strengthening or improvement, uh, and you would do that in terms of the negotiations. Now, back in 2009-10, uh, uh, obviously it wasn't the same heated discussion, but you know, that development of the policy took 18 months. Uh, now, people might say, well, that's very slow, but it's not if you're developing a policy of, of this importance. So uh, I hope and believe I, I would have then taken the policy we had and say, what do we have to do to adjust it uh, to meet the change in, in, in circumstances? And above all, uh, I would have taken the, the, the workforce representatives uh, uh, with me on that. It should be said that the, you know, I mean, I was involved in Fairness at Work because there was a very specific issue that had to be reconciled about the ministerial code and the balance of the ministerial code with the overall policy. Uh, 
the you know these things, the negotiations that take place, are negotiations on the management board. They're, they're not negotiations which would normally involve ministers, never mind the first minister. In the case of Fairness at Work, there was a particular aspect that, that required first ministerial approval, which is the reason for uh, for my involvement. Now, in the circumstances of no October, November 2017, there's much more politically charged atmosphere, but therefore all the more important to take the views, to feed them in. But I repeat my point, I think Fairness at Work was a robust foundation to be building on, and certainly shouldn't be something that's jettisoned. And even if it was to be jettisoned, you wouldn't jettison it for part of the workforce and keep it for the rest of the workforce. That seems an extraordinary uh, circumstance that they has now been arrived at and totally unsatisfactory. OK, thanks, thanks very much. I mean, obviously, the, the whole events of the end of 2017 did bring down a lot of powerful uh, men. And I, I want to move on to the, one of the critical changes that was made in the procedure, which was the retrospective element. Now, indeed, in the judicial review, at, at, uh, you sought a declarator at 4B to the effect that the procedure was, and I quote, incompetent in respect that it involves a retrospective application of the procedure, and you, you amplify that in your legal um, arguments. Now, of course, as you're aware, the petition was conceded, so we never actually got a court. I mean, it, in hindsight, it might have been useful for that judicial review to have run, and some of these issues would have been uh, resolved, perhaps. But did you set out this particular argument about retrospectivity because you felt that it was, it was not competent ever to investigate complaints of historic sexual harassment as a matter of principle, uh, or because you felt the allegations against you shouldn't be investigated? No, no we put forward the argument on legal advice. The, the, the legal advice was that if nothing else had been wrong with the policy, and as we both know, there were many, many things uh, wrong with the policy, but if nothing else had been wrong with the policy, it may well have fallen on the, uh, the question of retrospectivity, not just because it was retrospective, but because there had been in place at the time uh, a perfectly acceptable, robust policy. Where retrospectivity has been allowed legally, I mean, and again, I'm straying into things, and perhaps you are as well, but that's a white one that we don't necessarily have the expertise on, but, but where, where there has been no policy or no available policy then a retrospective argument has much more sway. Uh, the second issue, of course, is required in terms of policies consent, the, the, the people who it could be applied to, you know, stretching back, presumably, to the dawn of this parliament, uh, you know, normally would be uh, consulted or give their approval in some way. Uh, indeed, there was a letter uh, which has emerged quite recently, which was meant to be sent to former first ministers, uh, myself included, presumably, uh, but I know wasn't sent to former First Ministers, which, uh, among other things, asked them uh, to consult ministers in their administrations from, from the past, which struck me when I saw it, a, a quite extraordinary thing to, to be happening. Retrospectivity was very substantially in doubt, let, let, let's put it that way, and would have been a, a huge challenge uh, for the government to overcome legally if they'd got that far. But as we both know, the they fell in the, in the very first hurdle. My legal advice, and legal advice is that, but you know, I've given this committee a substantial part of that legal advice in terms of the, because the, it was laid out not just to the court and the open record, but also to the permanent secretary as we, we sought to try and explain what was wrong with the policy that had been developed at, at pace. Uh, but my legal advice was there were many grounds on which uh, the policy would have fallen. And of course, the, our first petition for judicial review, our draft petition, was drawn up in uh, July, uh, long before the application and the illegal, unlawful application of the policy was known. And you're quite right, retrospectivity was one of the grounds. OK, just seeing as you mentioned that draft letter, I have a copy of it here. And to my understanding, it has not been provided to this committee as part of the disclosures of the Scottish Government. But to... This is the draft letter to former First Ministers to either as a courtesy or to consult them over the application to them of the new procedure. But just to confirm, you never received any consultation or information as a former First Minister that this new procedure could be applied against former Ministers. Is that correct? None, none whatsoever. Okay. Uh, uh, you beat me 
No, no, that's fine. To the punch, I mean, I, I... Uh, can, I, can I intervene just a wee bit here, Mr Wright, when the committee hasn't seen this letter, it's never been well, submitted Fair enough. My, my reply was going to be... So, sorry, I can do that. <laughs> yes, please, my Mr My reply Sam. was going to be pertinent to that. I was, it was one of the documents I was going to offer to the, the committee today, since I only received it in the last few days. Right. Uh, but uh, I'll be can happy... I ask the answer it? to your question is no, I was not consulted. You Thanks very right. much. Um, Mr Wright, can I ask how long this letter is? Beg your pardon? Can I ask how long this letter is? Uh, it's two pages. All right, well, please don't read it out. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we could accept that, uh, you will, Mr Reitman, uh, give it to the clerk so that all the committee can see this letter. Yes. And it can be looked at in the evidence. Yes, if at all possible. I, I, yes. I, I, merely, I merely mentioned it, Convener, because Mr Salmon mentioned yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's before. fine, but we'll Thanks. get it circulated um, during our break. Carry on, Mr Reitman. Uh, and then just to clarify something, I know, I know you feel uncomfortable about this, but you, you, you make the point in your fourth submission that there were no formal complaints made against any minister under the policy, and thus it was never invoked. But in uh, a letter that Levy McCrae wrote to the Permanent Secretary on the, 20, on the 5th of June 2018, you do say, in relation to Allegation D, there is a particular problem in relation to Allegation D. This was dealt with previously under the procedure in place, fairness at work policy and procedures, and that being so, it would be not appropriate to resurrect it, uh, uh, given that the new procedure was not uh, in contemplation or in force when the incident giving rise to the complaint occurred. So there, there had been a complaint, but it had been dealt with and resolved informally. Is that correct? The is the open record. But yep. Can I reply to you, uh, as I replied to the morning what, that you know, after two court cases, Two judges and a jury, uh, I think I'm entitled to rest on the verdicts, and particularly the verdict of a jury. And can I also remind all members, I've already said this, we're here to look at the actions of the Scottish Government. So please be very, very careful what we're referring to in all our questioning. We're expecting our witness to be careful in his responses to us, so I think that the same respect should be shown to our witness, Mr Whiteman. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, now, as we've already indicated, one of the key things about the new procedure was its retrospectivity. Um, do you think, as a matter of principle, that there should be a procedure for investigating complaints of sexual harassment against former ministers in the Scottish Government? I, I don't think you can make that argument if there was... I mean, I think legally, uh, what I've been informed is you could perhaps try that argument pre-2010 when there was no such policy. It would be very difficult to, to make that argument uh, uh, and make it legal or lawful. Uh, and it's not a good idea, for a whole range of reasons, to embark on unlawful procedures. Indeed, it's a breach of the ministerial code, arguably in terms of the policy that was put forward. It's also a breach of the European Convention. Uh, which, of course, every minister in all their actions in this parliament has to follow, something that we've embraced uh, since the, the start of this parliament. Just two further questions, Convener. Um, given that, then, uh, and given the fact that a lot of women came forward in the aftermath of Me Too with historic complaints, you're basically saying that there shouldn't be any procedures in place to help resolve them because they didn't come forward at the time. I think it would be very difficult to pursue a, even a workplace policy it not applying the procedures that were there at the time. Uh, I mean, the procedures are there at the time. Uh, you know, they are, it would be possible to employ these procedures uh, and, uh, in, in a lawful fashion, as I understand it. But to invent a, a totally new procedure, which hadn't been in contemplation at the time, and apply it retrospectively, and, and of all the arguments that came forward in terms of the Me Too movement, and the perfectly legitimate questions that you're asking about the balance between informal complaints and uh, mediation and a formal process, is entirely legitimate, entirely what might be thought of. And the idea that out of that, out of nowhere, in fact, came the idea that let's have a specific policy for former ministers in the Scottish Government what I put to you, Mr Whiteman, is if that had been a major issue being contemplated at the time and being thought of as the major issue must come up, then someday perhaps yourself or any other person would have mentioned it in the parliamentary debate, a full parliamentary statement by Mr Swinney, if I remember correctly. No one mentioned it in the parliamentary statement and no one mentioned it in the, in the Scottish Cabinet. 
Well, then, of course, this policy was never discussed. Uh, so wherever it was coming from, uh, it wasn't coming in something that they, uh, that was seen as the major issue. I'd have thought the major issue uh, politically would be to look at your current policies and say, how can we make these responsive to the situation we have now, uh, as opposed to saying, let's have a policy for, for former ministers. I think the origins and reason for that came from elsewhere. OK, thanks very much. I mean, next week we are actually, in fact, stage three of the Scottish Parliamentary Standards Sexual Harassment and Complaints Process Bill, uh, which, in fact, does allow for historic behaviour back to 1999 to be investigated uh, against uh, MSPs who behave badly to their own staff. So a legal basis can be found. I'll leave it there. Convener, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mr Brightman. Uh, Alistair Allen, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, as has been made clear by Convener Rightly, of course, uh, we're not here to look at incidents. We're to, here to look at how uh, complaints against you were handled. Um, part of that discussion that we've had as a committee has been about workplace culture more broadly um, within the Scottish Government. Um, now, it's not for me to rule uh, on uh, whether um, we should have been allowed to pursue uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's line of inquiry any further, but um, I did notice that when you were asked about it, you kind of turned on the committee. Uh, now, while I have um, questions about the committee and some of what it's done too, um, do you not feel it is relevant for us to ask you about the workplace culture on which Sir Peter appeared to be commenting and to ask about your part in that culture? Well, Mr Allen, I wasn't turning on the committee. I was pointing out to Mr Cole Hamilton that there had been a range of criticisms from the FDA about the conduct of the committee. What I said was that on the committee proceedings that I had watched, I didn't, I didn't find these criticisms justified as an observer. So I wasn't turning on the committee. I was, if you like, defending the committee, and I was merely pointing out that just because people say things, in this, in this case the FDA's criticism of the nature of questioning, doesn't make them true, and a, a reasonable observer might come to a, a different conclusion. As far as the Peter Housden's evidence is concerned, Peter made the point very strongly that, in his opinion, it's in his written evidence, that the workplace culture in the Scottish uh, uh, Government that he led as the senior civil servant, stood comparison, good comparison, with any other department uh, across the UK. What you heard in subsequent evidence is that there are now more complaints in the Scottish Government uh, uh, civil service than there are in other departments. Uh, now you can, uh, of the UK Government, uh, I would never describe the, as a government department, but the Scottish Government as compared to other administrations, let's put it that way. Uh, now, you can take two views of that. You can either take the view that perhaps the policies employed in the past did not sufficiently encourage people to, to make complaints, or you can take the view that the rising number of complaints indicates that there is a, a problem that requires to be addressed. Who knows? It may be a mixture of both, but certainly a, a subject to study. But I think Peter Housden gave a very good case as why he believed that the, the culture and performance of the Scottish Government over his term of office, in terms of what was uh, seen in surveys of workforce satisfaction at the time, was extremely good, uh, compared with Whitehall departments. Uh, the permanent secretary makes the case, and I, I saw her make it a number of occasions, she thinks things have dramatically improved since. Uh, the trade unions issued a document quite recently saying that that wasn't the case. Uh, it's a matter which, no doubt, this committee might want to reflect on and, and put in the recommendations. My point uh, earlier on, though, uh, is that I believe that fairness at work was a good policy, a sound policy, a robust policy. The fact that it's still in, in play for, for the civil service is an indication that that's the view of the, the civil service unions as well. And any changes to that policy, in my estimation, should have been built on that policy. That would have been a, a good thing to do, eh, as opposed to casting it aside for, uh, for other purposes. That's very helpful, Mr Salmond. But my question, you'll have noticed, was about the fact that we have evidence from uh, Sir Peter in which he comments on your personal role in the workplace culture. And I wondered if you had any comments on that. Uh, no, uh, I, uh, I watched Sir Peter's uh, uh, evidence, and uh, 
uh, and merely make the point that people can observe in different ways. I had an excellent relationship with Peter Housden, and what I can say that uh, in my uh, time as First Minister and his time as Permanent Secretary, he never expressed any uh, concern to me directly whatsoever. Uh, and therefore, but I took his evidence and his uh, letter that he sent to you subsequent to his evidence uh, uh, as an indication that while well, he thought uh, policies should be improved over time, and he didn't dispute that, uh, that new policies can come forward, that Joe the Peace, his uh, evidence suggested that he thought in his period as permanent secretary that workplace culture was uh, stood comparison uh, with other comparable institutions, although certainly uh, there is always room for improvement. What I also can say, at no time when Peter Housden, or for that matter John uh, Elvidge, was permanent secretary, uh, did we end up in the court session uh, on the receiving end of a, a calamitous uh, decision of unlawful behaviour. Uh, so perhaps uh, both uh, John Elvidge and Peter Housden can, can argue that it indicates their tenure of office in this regard, in that regard, was, uh, was better than, than uh, more recent uh, experience. Thank you. Can I ask about timelines around the um, development of changes to, to the policy? In your written evidence, you've suggested that the Chief of Staff to the First Minister um, was responsible for the inclusion of former ministers in the procedure uh, in an email of the 17th of November. Can you tell me why um, the Scottish Government route map, document YY023, one week prior to this, includes a paragraph on I quote, allegations by a current member of staff against the former minister, uh, and notes that there was no formal process how to capture this. And I wonder, can you also um, give me your, your view um, on how what you've said about the email on the 17th of November um, squares, as it were, with the, the permanent secretary's statement on the 8th of September to this committee uh, that the decision to include former ministers came from an analysis that was already underway and that work had already been undertaken on the Fairness at Work procedure, uh, and that from the very beginning it was agreed that the tidying up or the making consistent of the Fairness at Work procedure would always address the issue of, of former ministers. So I wonder if you could offer some view on that timeline, please. Well, you've got a, a number of points there, Mr Allen. The, the first indications that have been seen by this committee suggest that there were two documents I think on the 7th of November and the 8th of November. One was from, uh, uh, one was from um, the uh, uh, investigating officer, uh, as, as she became, uh, and one was from James Hind. Uh, one was the route map, which is why I, I think you're, uh, what you're referring to, uh, and the other was uh, James Hind's first draft policy. Uh, now, it's a point of, uh, of some detail, but it was the... James Hine gave evidence to say he started with a blank sheet of paper, but that doesn't seem to square with the fact there was also a, a route map. But what you can certainly say is the issue of former ministers was being considered about the 7th and 8th of November. As far as I'm aware, that's for the, the first time. The point I made about the uh, Chief of Staff's email on the, the 17th was not that she originated the, the idea of former ministers, it was the a phraseology uh, former ministers uh, of previous administrations, regardless of party. Uh, I'm not arguing that the uh, Chief of Staff to the First Minister originated the concept of former ministers, uh, but certainly we know because she uh, proposed a, a wording for the First Minister's commissioning letter, I think it was, of the 22nd of November to the private secretary of the permanent secretary, uh, it shows that she was uh, aware uh, and indeed proposing that on behalf of the, of the, uh, of the First Minister. Uh, the evidence I've seen before the committee would suggest that the civil service were working on the question of former ministers, whether that was former ministers of, of previous administrations uh, be, be before then, but not uh, uh, as explicitly as uh, eventually came out of the, the letter sent by the First Minister on the 22nd of November. Now, my view on this is that is, however you think of it, and whether you think it was a good thing or a bad thing, it is a significant departure from previous policy, a, a departure that hasn't been followed by any other administration, and not that I know of, in, in many administrations anywhere, is to have a, a policy saying, right, we're going to have a policy on former ministers. It, it did seem uh, to come out of... Uh, 
very surprisingly in these documents of the 7th of, 8th of November and the, the clarification that the Chief of Staff gave that this should apply to former ministers of previous administrations regardless of party, it seemed potentially to extend it back to the, 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 dawn, of, uh, the dawn of devolution. But certainly it shows that the Chief of Staff of the First Minister was very much aware of it on November the 17th when she was proposing such amendments. I think a more interesting question is why it suddenly emerged in November the 7th and November the 8th, and why two civil servants, one who said he was starting with a blank sheet of paper, while simultaneously another civil servant was, was thinking of a, another document. I, I find uh, that aspect, which have emerged in your inquiry, quite surprising. Well, you have referred to the issue of, of retrospectivity there. Uh, in your written evidence, you have taken issue with the inclusion of former ministers in the Scottish Government's uh, complaints procedure. And as Mr Whiteman has alluded to, um, the Scottish Parliamentary Standards Sexual Harassment and Complaints Process Bill is currently at stage three, um, and it will create a complaints procedure for Parliament that includes former parliamentarians in the same way as the, the, the government's procedure now includes former ministers. Do, do you not feel it's right that former politicians, whether they're ministers or not, can be held responsible um, for actions or allegations about actions in the past? I, I think retrospectivity is a difficult question legally, but if you're approaching it, uh, then you would approach it by the legislative route, which you're currently doing. Uh, there's a vast difference, Mr Allen, between uh, putting forward legislation carefully considered by a parliament and the parliament then enacting it, which of course doesn't make it bomb-proof legally, as, as we know, because legislation can also be challenged. Uh, there's a huge difference between considered legislation and the spatchcock development of a policy at pace over a matter of weeks for, for reasons which are not altogether clear. Uh, the, the first of these, that is the legislative route, has a, a basis in argument and reason and legislation and gives everyone protection and some security. Uh, the, the first route ended in abject total disaster. Now, we can hypothesise about this all we like, but what is certain and what is factual is on the 8th of January 2019, the actions and content of the policy and the behaviour, therefore, of the Permanent Secretary and interested party, uh, the First Minister, uh, was judged in the court session to be unlawful, procedurally unfair, and tainted by apparent bias. Now, no one involved in this, not myself, not the complainants, not anybody, would have uh, wanted that, uh, uh, that uh, extraordinary development, uh, which is the result of the nature of how that policy was developed. So, whether we can argue that retrospectivity through legislation can be applied, that's an entirely different thing from what happened in the case that you're examining? Well, of course, it was the application of the, the policy rather than the policy, the policy per se that the, the court ruled on. But given that the court of session judgment didn't come to a view about the um, position of, of former ministers or as, a, as a principle, if you like, as an issue, um, why would we have any reason to say that there's a legal issue about the inclusion of former ministers or a, or a legal difficulty about uh, including former ministers in the policy. Uh, presumably you think, as a matter of principle, it's right that employees have a, an avenue of, of complaint, even if the complaint is regarding a former uh, employer. Well, that, that bears on the question of whether there was an avenue at the time. And, uh, and as the first First Minister or Prime Minister or a uh, person elected who introduced such a policy in 2010, uh, then obviously I think that was a, that, that's something that should be noted. And, uh, uh, and that uh, was thoroughly agreed with. Mr Allen, when I took out the petition for judicial review, it was on, oh, I can't remember, seven or eight grounds. Uh, my legal advice, and it, legal advice is just that, it's only advice, uh, is that uh, we had a very, very high likelihood of success. Uh, before we knew about anything to do with the application of the policy, uh, which was initially concealed from us, and then which we learned about uh, as the judicial review uh, went on. Uh, I wouldn't have taken out the judicial review without the advice saying that the policy was uh, unlawful. Uh, and I think there was a, a great deal of understanding uh, in terms of the Scottish Government of the jeopardy that their policy uh, was in. 
Retrospectivity was an issue. Mr Whiteman uh, uh, raised it, uh, and I have made the point there is a difference between legislation and uh, a spatchcock thing invoked. Uh, you will note, however, Mr Allen, it was not just the application of the policy that was judged in Lord Pentland's interlocutor, but the procedural unfairness of the policy. The interlocutor is procedurally unfair and tainted by apparent bias because of its application. Uh, and the procedural unfairness we can well get on to, uh, if you like, in now or in the judicial review. But there were many, many things wrong with the policy. Why were there many things wrong with the policy? Because it was developed at pace, as the civil service says, spatchcock, as I would say, over a period of six weeks, and in an apparent pi panic for reasons which uh, hopefully this committee can, uh, can try and determine. However you, however you look at it, from nobody's point of view, was it a satisfactory outcome? It was an abject, total, complete disaster. You have mentioned quite legitimately the views of the unions and others about the, the uh, original policy, Fairness at Work. Um, <coughs> it is also clear from our, our evidence um, that um, the Scottish Parliament, I uh, appreciate we are talking about a different policy there, but the, the Scottish Government, your Permanent Secretary, uh, and the Council of Scottish Government Unions um, all thought it was right to include former ministers, um, or in the case of the Parliament, MSPs and complaints procedures. So can I, can I just clarify, are, are you in principle at least um, aligning with that position? The, I, I mean, I haven't looked in detail at the, at the current legislation, but if you are going retrospective, then you certainly should do it by a legislative form and, and make, the, make the argument for it. Uh, because otherwise you'll end up on the receiving end of, uh, of more court judgments. Uh, I would have thought, though, that the overwhelming priority uh, in any workplace policy might be to look at what's happening at the present moment and what's happening in the future. I think the legislative base of going retrospective in workplace policy is, uh, would be the only way you could possibly do it. Uh, but uh, certainly it's not speculation as to what happened to the uh, to the policy that uh, originated in uh, November and December uh, 2017. Uh, we know that from the, the judgment in the, the court of session. And although the permanent secretary has been very anxious to give the impression that, that uh, it was only on one aspect of the uh, application of the policy, uh, and uh, I, think, I think she said in one press statement that other parts were dismissed. She actually said that in a press statement. Of course, the reality is that, uh, the, as you rightly say, many aspects of the problems with the policy weren't considered. They didn't need to be considered because the, the government had, been, uh, had thrown in the towel, had conceded everything that could possibly be conceded, uh, so the rest of the arguments didn't have to be explored. Uh, but to think that the rest of the arguments were robust from the Scottish Government's point of view has been suggested to this committee, I think, is a a huge extension. That is certainly not the legal advice that I received. And of course, uh, as things stand, we'll never see the legal advice that the government received because they've kept it under wraps for so long. Thank you for the moment, convener. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jackie Bailey, please. Thank you very much, convener, and good afternoon, Mr Salmon. Um, I wonder whether I can move us on um, to talk about the interests and the confidentiality of the complainers um, and start with an issue raised by both myself and Willie Rennie yesterday in the chamber. Um, this is an issue that arose um, in the context of one of the meetings held with the former chief of staff, um, Jeff Aberdeen, that was a precursor to your meetings with Nicola Sturgeon. Um, do you know whether the name of a complainant was shared at one of those meetings? Uh, yes. OK. Can I ask you how you know that? Because obviously we're interested in evidence being corroborated at this committee. Yeah, because my former chief of staff told me that. OK. Uh, is anybody else party to that information? Uh, as far as I'm aware, and you'd have to ask the people uh, concerned, but as far as I'm aware, there are three other people who, who know that to be true. OK. I believe the committee have written to them, so thank you very much for that. Um, can I take you to the daily record leak, again sticking with the interests of the complainers? Um, how were you notified of the daily record story on the 23rd of August? Uh, well, can I go through that, that day in, in, in sequence? Because I think there's a, a bit more to it than the, the daily record uh, story. Uh, this was, if I remember right, the 23rd of August, uh, and we were, I had a meeting with my 
legal team at Edinburgh Airport, uh, and we were considering what to do, and basically when to lodge our petition for judicial review, because we'd had the uh, decision from the, the permanent secretary uh, the day before. So we're meeting how to respond and basically went to lodge a petition. We, we received a communication from the Scottish Government saying that they were going to make a press statement uh, on the fact of the complaints at five o'clock, uh, which I, I cons we considered remarkable then, but, but I consider it even more remarkable now because I, I now know that they were advised against any publicity by the police in a, a meeting two days previously, at least the Crown agent was. But they were going to make a statement at five o'clock. Now, obviously, any hope of confidentiality in the process would have gone once that statement was made, because the, the idea that the, the press would have just said, well, there's been two complaints and we're not going to report anything else, it would have been uh, extraordinary to believe. So we said uh, uh, in return that we would launch uh, an interdict along with the judicial review in order to prevent that statement. Uh, the government response was that they would therefore withdraw the statement. Therefore, there was no need to put forward our interdict. At four o'clock, or roughly, we were told by uh, the government that they'd received a, a query from the daily record uh, and were concerned that the daily record seemed to have knowledge of the, of the complaints. But the daily record didn't come to us, and, uh, and therefore, if we'd gone ahead with the interdict at that stage, given that we were interdicting a government statement uh, as opposed to the supposition at some newspaper, uh, then we might well have provoked the very thing we were trying to avoid. Uh, however, the daily record came to us about eight o'clock and emailed us at quarter past eight saying that they had a substantiation of their story. Uh, I, the phone call came to me. I said nothing in response, they, apart from the fact put it in writing. They did put it in writing. Uh, and the, uh, the daily record uh, put uh, the story out uh, uh, at uh, uh, 10 o'clock. That was their, their deadline. Uh, I released a statement uh, saying that I was going to sue the Scottish Government uh, and I held a press conference the next day, but the press conference uh, didn't talk about the nature of the complaints. It, it talked about the judicial review and, uh, and why I thought the government were behaving unreasonably and unlawfully. What then happened the next day is there was a, another daily record story uh, which demonstrates that the daily record had either a copy of or an extract from the Permanent Secretary's decision report. Uh, so someone had to have given them that document. And subsequently, it's been confirmed that the daily record had a document, whether it was the whole report or an extract from it. The Permanent Secretary was asked about this in questioning, and, and she said it caused enormous distress to everyone concerned, and I'm absolutely sure it did, to the complainants, to, to, to me, to, to everybody. Uh, the only question I would have for the Permanent Secretary is what, you know, notwithstanding the leak, what did she think would have happened if she'd gone ahead and put out the statement at five o'clock on that day. Uh, and I, I find it extraordinary. As you know, the ICO has investigated the matter. Uh, they came to, the, the procurator came to the conclusion that uh, she was sympathetic to the idea that the source of the leak was from in the Scottish Government, as she said. The government's internal review, wasn't an investigation, identified 23 people who had access to the information. Uh, but the ICO weren't able, they did say that the, the, the leak, of course, was prima facie criminal. It was a criminal leak. Uh, but they had 23 suspects and, uh, and no ability to, to go beyond that in terms of determining who might be responsible for the, for the leak. But said they were sympathetic to the idea that came from within the Scottish Government. Whoever did that uh, should uh, uh, answer for what is a uh, a very, very uh, serious matter which caused the, caused the enormous distress and the implications uh, that followed. Okay, thank you for that, that response. Can I just pursue a couple of things you, you said? Um, uh, firstly, the, the second leak, as I understand it, contained confidential information from one or both of the, the complainants. Um, you said that this has been subsequently confirmed, that a copy of the report was given to the daily record. How was that subsequently confirmed? Can you tell me well, what there's the evidence no, is? There's no doubt that the daily record had the report because the language is identical 
uh, in the in the report uh, to to parts of the permanent secretary's decision report. Uh, the editor of Daily Record uh, uh, said they had a document in the uh, Custody Walk documentary uh, last year, uh, so I, I had no reason. Uh, n not to be. I mean, the Daily Record have not, uh, as far to my knowledge, certainly not. I would think have said anything direct to the ICO or to any investigator. But he he said it on the the Custody Walk documentary. And but they had the document. There's no question about that, or or part of the document, or an extract from it. Uh, there's one point of <laughs> some confusion that I certainly haven't got to the bottom of yet, uh, and that is that the ICO's procurators report lists the, the various interested parties who have had copies of the, the report. It lists, for example, the complainers. It lists myself. It comes to the not uh, unreasonable uh, assumption that neither the complainants or myself had any interest in, uh, in leaking the contents of the report. It lists the Crown agent, uh, but uh, the police, of course, who some people suggested might be the source of the leak, of course, had refused to accept the report from the Crown agent, so it couldn't have been the police. But it does list the principal private secretary to the First Minister in that group of, of people who, who... Now, I'm not... Let me be absolutely correct here. I'm not suggesting principal private secretary or the First Minister leaks things to the Daily Record. But when he came before this committee, he firstly confirmed that he had a copy or had received on behalf of the office, a copy of the report, but subsequently wrote to the committee saying that wasn't correct. My question is quite simple, is why did the procurator for the ICO list the First Minister's office in the list of, of people or interested parties who had access to the report? I don't know the answer, I just know that that was done, and I can't believe the procurator for the ICO did it for no reason. There had to be a reason for, for believing that. My own feeling about this is that civil servants, uh, I'm not saying that civil servants never leak, but they, they, they actually seldom leak. But if they do leak, they don't leak to the political editor of the, the Daily Record. Uh, and therefore, I think the, the, the leak was politically inspired. Uh, from who, I think, should and require further investigation, I, I think the matter shouldn't be at an end. I think it's a, a hugely serious matter. And one thing I, I would say, just finally on this, that over the last uh, few months, there has been a, a major police operation in Scotland, uh, ordered by the Crown Office, trying to find out the, who leaked information uh, to Kenny McCaskill MP, uh, which came to this committee. That investigation, that I know for a fact, because Mr McCaskill told me a day or so ago, is still ongoing. Uh, and at the express wish of the Crown Office, that's been made clear, incidentally, by the police to everybody they've interviewed, uh, including me, incidentally. Uh, and my question is this, where has been the police investigation ordered by the Crown Office into what has been, for many people concerned, not least the complainants, a hugely distressing leak to the Daily Record in August of 2018. As far as I know, there has been no, nothing said or done by the Crown Office in terms of trying to determine where that leak came from. There does seem to be a disparity in their attitude to criminal behaviour as they see it. Can I just pursue this very quickly, because I'm very conscious of time. Um, in your submission to us, at page 10 of Appendix 4 in our papers, Appendix D, sorry, um, that, that you talk about I am confident that I know the identity of those involved in the leak. Um, do you have any evidence to support that beyond what you've just told us? And are, are you suggesting that this requires further police investigation? I think it does require further police investigation. I do believe I know the identity, but you know, I'm not here at the committee to, to speculate on individuals that I cannot substantiate. Every statement that I make before this committee, I intend to have documentary evidence to support. Uh, and restricted to that. But on your question as to whether there should be a police investigation of this matter, I think there absolutely should be police investigation of the matter because whoever uh, leaked that document at that time caused a enormous distress, certainly broke the law, and certainly there have been huge consequences for, for all concerned as a result of that leak. Thank you, Mr. Sam. Convener, I'm very conscious of time, and we've taken 
you know, a long time to get through one section. We have two more to do. I wonder whether it would be appropriate before we break um, to ask whether Mr Salmond would be available to stay longer to ensure that our questioning can be completed. Well, I think I'll consider that at the break. Thank, Thank you, you Ms convener. Bailey. Um, I can run on till half past two, and I would quite like to do that before we have to break, because I would be keen to get this section complete so that we can move straight on to the judicial review after the break. Now, I understand that Mr McMillan has a couple of questions. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Mr Salmond. Good afternoon. It's, uh, earlier on, you stated that uh, you believe that the, uh, the FAW policy was robust, and that you've put that on record a couple of times already today. But I'd like to read out just two quotes from evidence that have been provided uh, to this committee. The first of which was from Sir Peter Houston, uh, and I quote, With the Me Too movement, we saw a very considerable time delay in women coming forward in a whole series of different environments. In those circumstances, it seems right to enable those complaints to be made against former ministers. And he continued, If we were to run the tape in the other direction and say that a person can never make a complaint against a minister, unless he or she is in post, that would seem highly restrictive. Do you agree with Sir Peter Housen that, uh, that it was the right for former ministers to be included in the procedure? Well, they, they weren't included in the procedure. Uh, that's one of the remarkable things about, uh, about what was done. If you were going to do that, uh, then uh, two things you would do. One is you would have the legislative base for doing it, as Mr Whiteman has pointed out, is being gone through at the present moment. Uh, and secondly, at least it would, be, would have been my preference, uh, you would then take that legislation and apply it to the procedures that you have, i.e. the fairness at work policy. Or, for that matter, if it was decided that that wasn't good enough, develop another comprehensive policy to apply to all situations. Obviously, that wasn't done. It wasn't something that was put into the, into the procedure that was there. It was something that was stood alone. And indeed, the, the issue of ministers was taken out of uh, fairness to work as far as harassment was concerned. Uh, the, uh, that is a, a shoddy uh, way to approach things and the outcome uh, we all know about. So if you're going to do it, uh, you would do it uh, properly. And incidentally, if Peter Houston had been permanent secretary, it would have been done properly. Uh, thank you for that. The second quote is from uh, Malcolm Clark of the Council of Scottish Government Unions. Uh, and he said in a quote, hindsight is a great thing and if more could have been done around former ministers, we would probably have introduced that earlier as well. Uh, do you not agree with his sentiment that former ministers should have been included in the procedure? Well, the, I don't think Malcolm Clark, Peter Houston or anybody would uh, agree with the uh, the policy that was uh, defeated in the, the court of session so resoundingly, uh, because nobody I can think of would ever want that circumstance to arise with the, if I can remind you, £630,000 of public money, which, uh, which went uh, in terms of the, the court proceedings, not to, to mention the innumerable uh, internal civil service legal time which was spent on it. I mean, if... Uh, Perhaps if more time had been spent in devising it and less time spent attempting vainly to defend it, uh, then we'd all be in a, a much better place. But the, the, all I say about fairness work, it, it was developed with the unions over an 18-month period. It was carefully considered, and above all, it was lawful. Uh, the policy which you're examining uh, as part of your inquiry it, it was the exact opposite. It was rushed through and it was unlawful and was an abject disaster. If you are going to apply a retrospective policy, then get a legal base for it. And if you're going to apply any policy, then do it in comprehensive, full discussion with the trade unions. As you found in this committee, that did not happen uh, in this case. In my experience, it happened in every workplace policy, but somehow not in this policy. Thank you. I mean, you certainly you have cast doubt on, uh, on whether former ministers should uh, have been included in the, in the procedure. And, but surely it's quite clear from the, the two quotes that I've read out uh, that, the, that there are many good reasons to actually include former ministers. 
and that uh, in reasons, uh, or certainly in all likelihood, uh, the, the reasons that are responsible you know, for the inclusion of former ministers. Do, do you not think that, that the former ministers should have been included in, in new policy? Well, they certainly shouldn't have been included in the way that uh, it was done, Mr McMillan. The, the way it was done ended in the abject uh, defeat in the, the court of session. If you're going to do something, then do it properly. I accept there is a, a good debate to be had about retrospectivity, but if you're going to do it, then do it properly. Do it from a legislative base and don't do it and, and go down to defeat. Now, the question perhaps for this committee is why was it done in the way it was to be done? I mean, what was the extraordinary rush to get a policy for former ministers through in November and December 2017, but not to develop or to, to extend it to any other aspect of the process. If I remember correctly, when the, the Cabinet Office were consulted in mid-November 2017, then the, uh, the response came, uh, does this apply to former civil servants? And of course, the answer came, there are none. If you're going to introduce something like that, then in the whole concept of fairness at work, which I remind you for the first time brought ministers into the workplace policy, the prime aim of the, the union, so people would be as far as you could on an equal footing, what has happened to date is that former ministers and now ministers have been separated from the, the workforce policy and are considered in an entirely different way. The union ambition was to have a considered policy, including everyone, which was properly developed and legal. That's what was done. What was done in 2017 has been an abject disaster for all concerned. Do you believe that the formation uh, of the policy, uh, sorry, of the procedure, do you believe that the, that the Me Too movement was the genesis of this new procedure? <laughs> I think it would be difficult to understand why, out of the Me Too movement and the range of huge issues which were discussed in Parliament uh, on October the 31st, that, that if anyone thought and believed that out of that, what you absolutely required in the Scottish Parliament was a policy on former ministers, uh, that strikes me as, uh, as very, very difficult to, to believe. Uh, the, uh, the issues that were at stake and being discussed, you would have thought would have applied to a range of uh, the policies that which then would be developed. Uh, and as evidence for that, Mr McMillan, uh, as I said to Mr Whiteman, no one in that parliamentary statement raised that issue. They raised many issues, some of which might have been uh, uh, suitable for uh, looking at in terms of policy, but not that one. And it strikes me, therefore, to argue that this policy came about just because of the Me Too movement. Uh, that is uh, difficult to, to understand. Okay. Um, you stated in the written submissions that you hope that the First Minister would intervene in the procedure under uh, obviously <coughs> which that you were being investigated at the time. According to our evidence that we've received, uh, the procedure was intended to be entirely independent of ministerial <coughs> involvement. Uh, wouldn't the First Minister actually intervening on behalf of, of her predecessor or, or any uh, minister from the same political party, wouldn't that have looked like a, an attempt to potentially tamper with uh, an independent investigation? Well, the, the difficulty is that the, the First Minister had a role in the policy uh, along with the Permanent Secretary, up until December the 5th. Uh, I haven't counted the number of iterations of the policy up until then, but we're well into double figures. And in each and every iteration up until December the 5th, the, the First Minister is there in the policy to be informed at the same time as the Permanent Secretary. Thereafter, the Permanent Secretary assumes the dominant role in the policy as decision-maker, and the First Minister is to be informed at the end of the policy from a party basis. Uh, incidentally, something else that would have gone down legally, the idea you can develop a civil service policy and hand it across to a political party would, is obviously a, a, a great difficulty in legal terms. Uh, but I think the question is, that's not how the policy was being developed. At some point, there was a decision to exclude the First Minister. Now, as I've already explained at some length, the, the policy in terms of fairness to work, and including the, the, where the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister came, 
it was part of the, the argument that had to be had because of the statutory base of the ministerial code. What you might find more interesting uh, is why, if it's all, all a question of making things independent, why the First Minister still has a role in the policy as it applies to current ministers and is informed at the same time as the Permanent Secretary in that policy. Uh, does it not strike you as somewhat curious that the First Minister is informed about current ministers but not about past ministers? and that uh, that development in December the 5th uh, uh, came out of no precedent I can think of in terms of putting the permanent secretary in that position of determination in that policy and just that one aspect of the policy. Uh, and incidentally, because I, I know there's, there's interest in it, that uh, one of the other things that would have certainly been problematic, and indeed Lord Pentland commented on, although he had no requirement to, uh, was there is a mediation proposal in the policy for current ministers, but no mediation in the policy as applied to past ministers. Uh, something, as I say, that uh, Lord Pentland uh, noted in, uh, when delivering his interlocutor in uh, January the 8th, 2019. If the committee can find an explanation for that, then uh, we'll all be interested to hear it. Thank you. Um, my final question is just regarding, the once again, on the intervening uh, point. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, any government minister intervening in uh, an independent government procedure uh, at the request of a friend or a colleague? And, and did you ever do that as First Minister? Well, any previous uh, policy would have, uh, would have allowed for the First Minister's role because it affects ministers. So you just need to check the Fairness at Work policy or, for that matter, if you became a minister, Stuart, and the SNP were uh, continuing in office uh, and you... Uh, were the subject of a complaint, then the First Minister would have a role okay, as specified in that policy. She would be informed that that had happened. Uh, so it can't be that unusual, since it would apply to you if you, you gain ministerial uh, if you gain ministerial office. Uh, the point I made, I think, in WhatsApp messages that you've seen to the First Minister was actually the reverse is true. When the inquiry into the First Minister was uh, established, uh, many of the opposition parties, and I can understand that, said, oh, was this about the First Minister intervening? Actually, the First Minister, there's nothing to prohibit the First Minister from making an intervention. Indeed, if you read the ministerial code, you'll see that the First Minister is duty bound to act if she has a reasonable belief that her government is in danger of behaving in an unlawful fashion. Uh, and uh, therefore, it, it was entirely legitimate for me to ask the uh, First Minister to do so. Whether she did or not is, is a matter for her, but not to, to allow an unlawful policy to continue uh, is arguably uh, in breach of the, the ministerial code. Uh, the First Minister made, made her choices, but uh, to argue that uh, this is not uh, somehow a, a difficulty in this when it wouldn't apply in the case of a policy to current ministers, uh, I think, is, uh, is difficult to understand. Plus, and secondly, I'd say in the circumstances of the time, I had no idea where this policy had come from. There would be no public publicity about this policy. There would be no debate in the Parliament. Uh, and as I subsequently found out, uh, of course, everyone else in the civil service was only informed about it after the policy had been applied. Uh, so I naturally assumed that there must be some error for example, of not having a mediation element in the policy, which the First Minister would be entitled to, to point out, as she would be for current ministers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm keen to wind up this session uh, under our obligations. I understand Murdo Fraser has a short question. Thank, thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Salmon. I have a lot of questions to ask around both the Judicial Review and the Ministerial Code, but in this section, just one follow-up question, if I may. And as a follow-up to the question that was put to you at the very start by Margaret Mitchell, who was asking you about the role of the Crown Office. And you referred to the fact that the Crown Office had uh, asked the Parliament to redact part of uh, your written evidence mm -hmm. to this uh, committee. You um, have been not just First Minister of Scotland, you've also been twice a member of the House of Commons uh, for substantial periods, and indeed you are a member of the Privy Council. In your experience, would the Crown Prosecution Service in England ever have asked a committee of the House of Commons uh, to redact uh, evidence that it had published in the same fashion? And if it had, what do you think would have been the response 
of any Speaker of the House of Commons to that request? Well, the straight answer is uh, no, uh, they, they wouldn't, and uh, the normal response from a, um, certainly the House of Commons, but any parliament, I would argue, would be to, to re reject any such overtures and say the parliaments are there to serve the people, uh, and the prosecution service, whether it be the Crown Office or the, the Crown Prosecution Service in, in England, uh, is there under the same obligation. Obviously, the parliament shouldn't be interfering in the independence of the of the prosecution services, but neither should the prosecution service be presuming to interfere in the legitimate business of the parliament. Uh, now, to say these things, uh, as Lord Hope did this morning, uh, and I'll listen to him on the radio, is not to undermine the, the position of the Crown Office. On the contrary, the, to say these things is to say, look, that institution should not be doing that, and therefore what is it in the leadership of the Crown Office that's deficient that's drawing itself in to what is properly the political arena? You know, to say these things is to protect the institutional uh, framework, to make it more robust, to, to say that the things have to be properly done, not improperly done. I mean, the, 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 before I came to the committee, and the convener kindly allowed me to, to read a statement into the record, that I, I received the... Uh, a letter of what I was and wasn't allowed to talk about. Uh, and according to that letter, I'm not allowed to talk about areas of my written evidence that were submitted in good faith to this committee, which are easily available online in reputable journals for anybody to, to, to see, which are wide part of political debate uh, and uh, are accepted uh, as that. The idea that the only place that can't be discussed as in a parliamentary committee, is the direct opposite of what should be true. Parliamentary committees should actually be able to discuss things that cannot be discussed elsewhere because of proper exercise of parliamentary privilege and the duties of, of members of parliament. And therefore, it seems to be an extraordinary position and clearly something is wrong. Whether it's institutional, as Ms Mitchell suggested, or whether it's personnel, as I suggest, is a matter for the Parliament to decide, but clearly it's an intolerable situation and should not be allowed to continue. Okay, thank you. I mean, these are issues we will need to consider in due course and not necessarily for this inquiry, but it's very helpful to have your response. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, thank you, Mr Fraser. It's quite right. That's a, a matter for the SPCB <coughs> to consider. Um, uh, just before we come to the end of this session, there's a couple of things, Mr Salmon, that I'd like to pick up with you for what I've listened to. Um, you, you'll be aware, you've heard, that this Parliament is um, about to go through the final process, and you've noted that it's legislative in relation to former MSPs. I understand the, uh, the Senate in Wales is also considering such a thing, and that the Westminster Parliament has agreed that former MPs can come within the scope of a policy. I just wondered if you feel there's a difference between MPs, MSPs and ministers. Why governments shouldn't be doing this if other public institutions are? Well, I don't think that was the point I made, but of course in 2017 uh, the Parliament didn't do it for MSPs. Uh, if it's now being done in a legislative base, then that's a, that's a, a reasonable argument that no doubt the Parliament will judge on. But uh, the Parliament, as far as I know, ha has not embarked on an unlawful policy and got itself into deep trouble. Uh, from what you described, the Parliament is going about things in a responsible way and no doubt the debates will be had. That is not the case you're examining. The case you're examining is something that was done in an irresponsible and unlawful fashion. Convener, I, I see in the press, I think the, the, the description that's most commonly made in the press about the government's policy and what happened is botched. You know, your committee is examining, as is often said, the botched policy. The policy wasn't botched. The policy was unlawful, unfair and tainted by apparent bias. Botch doesn't cover it. Uh, and I'm quite certain whatever the Parliament decides in terms of retrospectivity and past MSPs, it will do so in a lawful and orderly fashion and with due regard to all of the arguments and put forward a, a sensible proposition. I, I, I think you're, 
your statements about the policy will we will look at in the judicial review aspect and about the application of that policy. Regarding the policy that was in place that you're obviously you know, uh, were involved in and, and feel that it was a very workable policy, I just wondered what, as First Minister of the time, you would have done had you received a complaint about a former minister. Well, uh, you cannot proceed uh, on the basis of, of, of something where there is no policy and no lawful way to, to do it. Uh, uh, there are huge questions that you would have to, to ask as to the basis of it, of which the primary one, I suppose, would be, was there a policy in place at the time of the, the supposed uh, or, or purported uh, incident? You'd have to consider that. And, Jim, but you cannot proceed on the basis that you, if there's no policy to proceed on, uh, and certainly don't uh, construct one or, or bring one into being in a matter of weeks to say, well, we'll better get a policy in place so as we can uh, we, we can do something a, a, about that. So I'd have thought these would be the, the primary questions. But any time you're proceeding on such a matter should be done with uh, careful consideration uh, and with proper argument and development. The policy which came into being is deficient in innumerable ways uh, and uh, has questions to answer across innumerable ways. Uh, and therefore, whatever you do, you certainly wouldn't do what was done in November and December 2017. Uh, you would take the argument in principle, see it was a policy, but you wouldn't invent a policy to meet a complaint. You most certainly wouldn't do that. And a final quick question about the, the fairness at work policy. The First Minister to be the ultimate arbiter on what happened. Uh, with this, was there any provision there should the complaint be against the First Minister? The, if the complaint, as I recall, if the complaint was against the, the First Minister, I, I recall the Deputy First Minister would be, uh, would be the person uh, responsible. Uh, and that, I mean, I, I can check the record, but I'm Sorry. pretty certain that's the case. The I mean, two aspects of that was in terms of, uh, of fairness at work. The other aspect, I think there was some debate about that at the time as to whether it should go outside the, uh, the Scottish Government, but then no such complaint was made, so it never came to, uh, came to pass. But I think it was the Deputy First Minister that was finally uh, agreed upon. Uh, the, uh, Fairness at Work looked at a whole range of you know, possible possibilities, but the structure that we arrived at, and it was to try and balance any workforce policy, which will have to be done, uh, incidentally, with the, the, the ministerial code, but the, the balance that was arrived at was the informal resolution which applied to all of the civil service. That was the, that was the cross Fairness at Work. Uh, then mediation, which was uh, effected by the Deputy First Minister, uh, and then, if that uh, wasn't accepted, it went to a panel of three people, and a report was given to the first minister, who and he or she. Now, as I said, I've subsequently learned from the proceedings of this inquiry that there have been two complaints under fairness at work since 2017. I would assume that they have been dealt with in terms of the the policy. That is to say, the, through the, the various procedures that. Uh, that I've just outlined. OK, thank you very much. And uh, we're now ready to suspend later than I had planned. Uh, so we'll suspend for a short break, reconvene in 20 minutes. So if everyone... Uh, I'm sorry, I should have formally said, for the benefit of our broadcaster, I hereby suspend the session... <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 13th meeting of this committee in 2021. And this is an evidence session with former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond. I can confirm that Mr Salmond took the oath at the start of this morning's evidence session. And I'm going to open this session, uh, Mr Salmond, with uh, an issue that we didn't quite cover this morning that moves us into the judicial review. And I wonder if, uh, not to take too long over it, but if you could give us a, a fairly short view on your feelings on how the complaint process was actually run. Well, the, the, the judicial review, of course, wasn't just a, a challenge to the application of the procedure. It was a challenge to the basis of the procedure itself. But I, in terms of how it was run and what I know now, and it should be said that we were well into the judicial review before documents were revealed to us, were extracted from the government, uh, which told us there had been significant problems in application, as well as significant problems with its, uh, with its legal base. Uh, but I can't think of uh, uh, anything uh, which could be worse handled in terms of how it was approached. The, uh, clearly, the uh, policy or the application of the policy went against one of the tenets of the policy in terms of no prior involvement uh, by the uh, investigating officer, Judith McKinnon. I've heard it said at this committee that this is something that crept into the policy you know, late on, that there had been some sort of change. In fact, if you go back to the very first draft of the policy from uh, James Hind, way back in, I think, November the 8th or somewhere thereabout, you'll see that almost exactly the same phrase, no prior involvement, uh, and I think one is any aspect of the case and then what, the other is any aspect of the complaint. It's one of the very, very few things that are consistent through innumerable drafts is the question of no prior involvement. And, no prior involvement is not an esoteric thing. It's, a, you know, it's obviously a cardinal principle of, uh, a, of perceived impartiality and impartiality of somebody doing an investigation. Uh, so the application of the procedure was obviously deficient, but the procedure itself was deficient and, in my estimation, would have fallen even if they had been properly implemented. There's one more significant thing, if I may convene. It only emerged in the vast data dump of documents that this committee received in uh, November, December of last year. That there was another hugely significant matter which we had no idea of, and I had no idea of until I saw these documents. And that's that the permanent secretary herself, as the deciding officer, as the person making the decision, actually met one of the complainants and phoned the other one in mid-process, actually before I was even informed that there were complaints against me. Now, that in itself, I would just say, if, if it's a very bad <coughs> thing for an investigating officer to have prior involvement, it's a really difficult thing legally for a deciding officer to have during involvement in the middle of a process in terms of uh, perceived bias. But perhaps even the most significant thing about that is that is the first time my legal team, myself, this committee, anybody knew about that. It wasn't disclosed across the judicial review, uh, despite the duty of candour, which was explained to the government by their own counsel and by uh, Lord Pentland. Uh, and it wasn't even disclosed in the criminal process, where I know, and I'm not going to stray into it, but there was a specific search warrant applied on the government a year past October, November, which specifically asked for contact between the permanent secretary and complainants, and that contact wasn't disclosed even to a search warrant by the Crown Office. I know this committee has been hugely frustrated by the lack of information, but you can see that the pattern of non-disclosure goes right through the judicial review, right through the criminal case, and right into this committee. It's not an odd document that's been missed out. <coughs> it is a sequence of deliberate suppression of information inconvenient to the government. And we'll move on to questions from our committee, please. Uh, Martin Fraser. 
Thank you, Commissioner. I have a number of questions, if I may, Mr Salmon, about the judicial review. And the reason that is very relevant to the work of this committee is it is the loss of public funds, not least in paying your own legal costs, that uh, were a substantial driver for, for this committee inquiry being established. And the, the misuse of public funds clearly is a very serious matter. We know that the uh, award of expenses that was made to you, uh, conceded by the Scottish Government, was, the, was at the highest level possible only made, in, in the words of Lord Hodge, where the defence has been conducted either unreasonably or incompetently, which would suggest in itself, given that was conceded by the Scottish Government, they accept there were substantial flaws in the way that they conducted the case. Um, you've also referred to the fact that we as a committee have asked uh, on numerous occasions for sight of the Scottish Government's legal advice. That's not been granted to us. Twice I've managed to uh, persuade the Scottish Parliament to vote for motions in my name that that uh, legal advice be produced, but the Scottish Government has uh, resisted uh, those demands. So we are uh, in the dark to an extent as to what exactly was the Scottish Government's legal position and the arguments they put forward. But I'd like to try and explore with you your own uh, legal position. Um, you say in your, in your evidence that um, when you became aware in March 2018 that a complaints process was being uh, implemented against you, at that point you took legal advice uh, and the legal advice you took said that the, the process was defective in a number of ways. Now, I'm a lawyer myself, Mr Salmon, and, and, and you'll know many lawyers too. Um, legal advice usually, or very, very seldom, comes in an unequivocal fashion. It's usually uh, it, some shade of grey. It's not black or white. So how would you characterise the legal opinion you received in terms of the, the strength of the argument? Well, well I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, I, I've got some experience in terms of ministerial office of receiving legal advice from that, but I have very limited experience as a, a, as a private citizen. Uh, but I do know that all legal advice, uh, in terms of counsel advice, will come on the balance of probability, or some phrase like that. Uh, I was told, uh, and this is long before the application uh, of the... Uh, the uh, process made it uh, clearly uh, unlawful. Uh, I was told that I had a very high probability of success. Indeed, I was in the unusual circumstance, I think, for most people, that uh, uh, my counsel were, uh, were suggesting that decisions should be made to take legal action. Uh, and I was reluctant, not for any legal reasons, I was reluctant because I was the former First Minister of Scotland uh, about to to sue the, the current government of Scotland with all the political implications that we'd have, regardless of how uh, it, it turned out. Uh, and I was in a position of drawing... I mean, anybody else, I believe, who were in these circumstances and getting the legal advice I would have got would have gone to the judicial review much earlier uh, in, the, in the process, given the, on the balance of probability, high probability of success, and that is before... The, uh, the questions of the application of the procedure uh, came to uh, prominence in October, late October and early November uh, 2018. I'll, I'll come on to that point in, in, in a second, but, but just so, so we're clear about this, again, according to your written evidence, you shared your uh, legal opinion with the First Minister initially and then with the Permanent Secretary. Did you ever receive a substantial argued response to that legal position you put forward? Yeah, I mean, I should say in fairness, at the meeting in early July, that I gave the, uh, what was a draft petition for judicial review to, to the uh, First Minister, who didn't want to, to read it full. She glanced at it, but, but handed it back to me. But, uh, you know, I did that on the basis to indicate that the legal advice was, was strong, uh, and, you know, given that it was coming from uh, uh, Ronnie Clancy QC and, uh, and Duncan Hamilton, who is well known, are, are my advocates, and then that's probably not surprising. They're, they're highly esteemed in the, in the profession. But we also uh, sent substantially, I mean, the, the letter of the 5th of June uh, 2018 sets out the, the various grounds uh, to the permanent secretary. What, what we got back, and you've got the correspondence, so you can judge for yourself as a committee, what wasn't arguments saying, no, you're wrong in that point because we've had advice to the contrary or, or any detail or any argument. But what we got back was we are satisfied that the process is lawful, full stop. Now, that may be a, 
a tactic that's used in litigation between private citizens, but we're talking here about a government who are fully conscious that, you know, I, I as a former First Minister, are seriously contemplating a, a major civil action. Uh, and therefore, we would have expected to get a substantive reply telling us where we're wrong. You know, perhaps they're going to say, well, we're about to legislate for, for, for this anyway or, or do something, you know, remotely legal. Uh, but no, all we got was letters from the permanent secretary saying, you know, I, this process is fair basically because I, I say it's fair. Uh, and at that stage, you know, the, there was a very, very firm view in my uh, council that uh, we should go ahead. But again, I was reluctant, and therefore we offered legal arbitration. You know, there was a, a method, as I saw it, for settling these legal arguments, nothing to do with the, the substance of the of the complaints, but just settling the legal parameters uh, with, you know, a retired judge or, I mean, uh, you know, I introduced the, the Arbitration Act. I, I know how it works. I mean, it's to do it quickly in private, so there's no breach of confidentiality for any party. Sets out the, the legal position and then we could go forward. And I made it quite clear if the policy <coughs> was found to be legal, then I would submit to the policy. Uh, but that was rejected uh, as well. You, you asked about cost. Uh, uh, my uh, total legal bill for everything, advice, uh, was £591,689.73. Uh, recouped from the Scottish Government was £512,252. That, I don't know, I've worked out the percentage. It's a very, very high percentage. Normally, as you'll be aware, uh, your uh, percentage, what you recoup in costs, because this is not money for me, it's money for the, the, the legal bills and the court bills and all the other things, if you're taking out a petition, uh, is much, much lower than that. It, it was at the very highest level. And the reason for that was, and it, this indeed it was conceded by the government, as you heard in evidence, it was we had to go through a whole commission and diligence procedure to extract documentation. And I, I saw Paul Coquette, one of the government's lawyers, giving evidence to you, and very, you know, very honestly, he came forward and said, you know, that in his view, that was unprecedented. He'd never heard of having to have a commission to extract documentation, but a commission we had to have. And without that commission, of course, we wouldn't have got the documentation, uh, and uh, and uh, the government uh, uh, would have been managed to hide it. And uh, okay, just to understand one last point. The government were prepared to go before the court and say there was no more documents. And that wasn't the fault of their counsel, because he apologised repeatedly at the commission and made it absolutely clear it was the fault of his client, i.e. the government. Those on which a duty of candour was placed had been withholding documentation, not just from the petitioner, myself, not just from the court, but from their own counsel, which can't happen very often and is a totally extraordinary position. You, you, you referenced Mr. Coquette's evidence. Uh, when we took evidence from us, he indicated, I think it was on the 31st of October 2018, that uh, it was established there had been prior contact, which, which he said, in his words, uh, everyone Everyone who was involved realised that it was a potentially significant issue. That's what you told us. Um, when, when did your team become aware of that? Uh, well, we became aware that something was wrong uh, because a whistleblower in the Scottish Government told us in October, by means that were sent to us, that there was something seriously wrong with a government press statement that had been released in late August when I launched the, when I held a press conference to say I was taking legal action against the government. And that press statement, I know you've got it because uh, it's come up on, on the record, that press statement said uh, this was a, they published for the first time the policy and said uh, yeah, this policy uh, uh, approved in December 2017 and published at that time on the Scottish Government internet. Now, that press statement very recently, just a couple of months ago, was revised because, of course, it wasn't published at the time. It was published in February. Why is February important, 2018? Because that was after the complaints came in. So 
obviously, when we got that information, there was a question. How can complaints come in under a policy which was publicised internally to Scottish Government employees until February? How can complaints come in in January? That obviously doesn't make sense. And it was for that reason that we started to ask questions eh, about uh, the contact between uh, various people in the civil service and the complainants prior eh, to the uh, formal complaints came in. And remarkably, and it's been done very often, so it's obviously something that the permanent secretary thinks is a strong point. You know, she has said on various occasions the, the reasons that the petition was conceded weren't in the original petition. <laughs> Well, obviously, they weren't in the original petition because uh, it wasn't known about, and it wasn't known about because the, the government, uh, totally contrary to any duty of candour, chose not to tell us. And that, of course, as I've just mentioned, was about the permanent sector, about the, the investigating officers' prior involvement. The first I learned about the permanent sector's prior involvement it was just before Christmas when documents were obtained by this committee. That is remarkable, unprecedented. And, of course, in terms of the award of costs, as you can imagine, I, I mean, I can't, well, I can't speak for the court, but uh, the, uh, the, I don't think the court was uh, was uh, the, the court. I, I think were, was uh, could understand why the award of costs was agreed uh, on a, a, an exemplary and punitive scale because of the conduct of the case by the government, of which, and let me repeat, uh, their counsel were totally innocent. Uh, indeed, as this committee knows, both counsel of the government. Uh, and I think it was the thing that eventually forced the, the concession. Both counsel to the Scottish Government said they would resign from the case unless it was conceded because it had become unstatable. Not likely to lose, not with a high probability of failure, the Government's case had been unstatable. And it was only when the Government received that ultimatum from their own counsel, who I can imagine were not best pleased by not having the documentation given to them, that they finally collapsed and conceded the case. Well, we have put that specific point to the Lord Advocate, as you know, but he pleads uh, uh, legal privilege and declines to, to respond to that particular point as to whether counsel offered to resign. But just, just to continue this issue of the emergence of documents, uh, the, the, clearly at the end of October, the Scottish Government became aware there was, there was a problem. But even then, was it still the case that they were not uh, assisting uh, your own uh, legal team and is that what led to the Commission and Diligence having to proceed? Yes. Uh, as we, we began to, to get documentation in answer to our questions, and as I now know but didn't know then, because the counsel to the government had told the government lawyers in early November about uh, duty of candour and disclosure uh, and, and the importance of it. That's in your documents. And then, of course, uh, when we went to a preliminary hearing, uh, Lord Pentland did not uh, grant a commission at that stage in November, but issued a reminder to the government as a public authority they had a duty of disclosure. The specifications should not be necessary in a case like this because it was against a public authority and therefore that public authority had to provide the court with all the information. We then found that although more documents were provided, it was quite clear there were documents missing. You have know, got uh, you know, documents and a gap and then another document. And so, in that case, we went uh, back to the court, and I think, and the date should have to check, I think December the 13th, uh, 2018, and asked for the commission, and this time it was granted. As Paul Coquette said in evidence, he'd never experienced a precedent like it. The reason it was granted was these exceptional circumstances where it was clear to everyone that, that there, was a, there were missing documents, that information was missing. We went then into the Commission of Diligence and um, I actually brought some of the papers along with me because the government didn't want us to give them to this committee. Uh, we went into the Commission of uh, uh, Diligence and the counsel for the government apologised profusely on repeated occasions for the position he was in, i.e. documents were literally coming in as the Commission was ongoing in batches each document be more incriminating in the sense of strengthening our case and weakening the government's case was actually happening in live time as the Commission was going on just before Christmas in 2018. Uh, and uh, that settled. And by then, of course, uh, my legal team 
I think they removed the bit about the balance of probability. They just said, look, this, this is only a matter of time now. They, 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 have to, they have to concede or we'll certainly win when it comes, when it comes to court in, the, in January, given what was being revealed in the documents. Because what the documents showed, now I don't want to get too technical legally because I'm not qualified for a start, but the, the documents showed, that, and the Lord Advocate conceded this, that the government's own pleadings to the court were wrong were inaccurate, misleading. Their own pleadings, this is the Scottish Government's pleadings to the court of session, were misleading. Uh, now, I can't put myself in the, in the shoes of, uh, of uh, Ruddy Dunlop or, or Christine O'Neill, but I can imagine that they were none best pleased in that circumstance, because obviously that reflects on, on, on potentially reflects on their uh, professional rep 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 reputation. Uh, the one thing I would say is that everything I've seen uh, is that the Government Council they behave perfectly honourably. And I think, although the Lord Advocate refused to confirm it on numerous occasions, I think you'll find information that both councils said they would resign the case in Sarah Davidson's uh, uh, report. I don't know how much of it you've actually seen under redaction, uh, but it's certainly there. Uh, and uh, I assume that the committee have been given that information. I am, um, as I said, not legally qualified, but I know a wee bit about Scots law. It's not unprecedented for counsel to resign from a case because they can't continue it because of their professional obligations. I think it must be unprecedented for it to happen when you're representing the government and to have to threaten to do it eh, or to say you're going to do it, let's put it in more even language, eh, in order for the government to, to face reality. That is an unprecedented, extraordinary position. Final question for me um, on this, because I know others, others will want to come in. I mean, what, what, what you've outlined, um, and indeed not just what you've outlined, but what the committee has discovered, is an extraordinary catalogue of failures in the handling of a, a legal case by the Scottish Government. And indeed, witnesses from the Scottish Government had effectively conceded that to us uh, in, in the course of the inquiry. Um, you've been First Minister of Scotland. If this happened under your watch, who would you hold responsible? Well, principally the, the government's principal legal advisor, who I'd, I would have expected to be guiding the case. Uh, if we're talking about the specifics of this case, uh, then I, I, can, I can only believe that the sum that James Wolfe is an eminent uh, a, uh, lawyer. Uh, I can only believe that there was other. It can't just be legal considerations. I mean, nobody continues a, a, a case that they're going to lose. As the broad advocate sort of said, you know, it'd be quite interesting to find out the result. I mean, you know, this is not an academic matter. This is not some interesting case that will inform people for for years to come. This is people's lives are, we're talking about here. The complainants, myself, other people involved. You, you don't have some uh, legal debate in order to. Uh, to find that out, because, and of course, as you rightly mentioned, there's the cost of the public purse, because all that delay, certainly from October, and I believe from before that, incidentally, uh, you know, the decision not to accept arbitration, when they must have known how weak the case was, the decision not to follow external counsel advice in October, when they knew probably on the balance of probability they were going to lose, uh, the decision to continue on, all that runs up the clock. You know, these extraordinary bills are run up. You know, the 512,250 paid for my legal fees, uh, the 100,000, 30,000 or some paid direct to their council, and, and the huge bill for internal occupation of civil service and, and legal time. All that clock is running as they are refusing now, that cannot be just the Lord Advocate, because if that had been a legal matter, then surely he would have said, well, time to settle. That has to be a, a decision of the Permanent Secretary and presumably a, a decision of the, of the First Minister. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Mitchell has a short supplementary on what she's just heard. Please. Yeah. Thank you, convener. It was specifically on the Scottish Government signing a certificate confirming um, that there were no 
further documents after you'd successfully petitioned for um, more documents. They said there was nothing relevant. Who signed that on behalf of the Scottish Government? And I, I've got three parts to this. It won't take long, can uh, Ms Mitchell, very everybody shocking. else wants to come in Who as well. It? So Would it be yeah, the, so ask it all at once. the respondent... Um, uh, who was the Prime Minister's Secretary, or would it be the interested party, who was the First Minister, uh, or, or who would be, if not signing it, who was responsible for what it was, a, a really serious, um, if not a criminal, offence? And saying that, just as the, 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 the convener is, is only allowing me to, to get in this one question, um, given what we've said about the checks on government, if they're allowed to behave with this without sanction, um, what kind of deterrent is that? So has there been any sanction? And who would you expect to, to take that sanction looking into this unlawful, if it was unlawful, um, behaviour? I on don't the, know if you're able to answer, Mr Samad, well, or if you just have the opinion. Question, I, I, my legal team will certainly know and will certainly uh, write to you, uh, Ms Mitchell. I, I'm not even sure whether we got to the, the, the point of decision that the, the, the undertaking was prepared to be signed, but then when we said, no, we're going ahead anyway, <laughs> uh, I think they were through objection about December the 13th, but I can get the precise uh, uh, detail on that from you, from, from a legal team. O on your other point, look, <laughs> people, you know, make mistakes uh, in terms of civil service, just like anybody else, government ministers, politicians, it happens all the time. Uh, but... Uh, you know, in terms of the right, Richter scale of mistakes, you know, this is this is right up there. This is a, 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 a very big one, and you would have expected, under the circumstances, of taking the choice of not conceding when they must have known their legal position was, if not untenable, then very difficult, and winding up the expenses over that period. You would hoped and believed that someone would have accepted responsibility. You know, when, I, when I walked out of the uh, a court of session in January 8, 2019, then I pretty clearly, not, I didn't say Leslie Evans should now resign. I, I, I did the normal language that perhaps the permanent secretary should now consider her position. I did that because I, I knew that she had claimed ownership over this policy. And she said on uh, June the 21st, in a letter to my lawyers, it was a policy established by me. That was her words. Uh, and I thought, therefore, she had responsibility for the policy, responsibility for not uh, conceding timiously in the judicial review and for a range of other things that could have been done. And therefore, I, I made. But somebody has to. Uh, somebody has to accept responsibility for a, a, a calamitous. Uh, occurrence and defeat, and as I've said in the first session, convener, not a botched policy, an unlawful policy, an unfair policy, uh, and one tainted by apparent bias, according to the court ruling. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, I, I am aware of the time. This is not me trying to hurry MD up, and I know everybody has very kindly said that they're happy for this session to go on longer. But it doesn't mean we should just let it go on indefinitely because uh, we do have a lot of business to get through. So I would ask everyone to please bear that in mind. And I'll go now to Alistair Allen. Thank you, Dina. Um, Mr. Salmon, I wonder if I could um, just pursue a, a point that was raised by Mr. Fraser uh, just before we uh, broke up. Um, and that was around the difference between the concept of privilege in Westminster and Holyrood. Now, I don't intend to pursue you for an answer on that. I appreciate you will know a lot more about it than I do. But I think the practical consequence of it was that you seem to be surprised that the Crown Office took an interest in the question of whether Parliament and its committees were in danger of breaking a court order in its view. Um, in this instance, one relating to the protection of the identity of complainers in a sexual harassment allegation. So I'm quite content for the Crown Office to take whatever view it wants on this and to act independently. But I'm just curious why you would be surprised. And shouldn't Scotland's Parliament just be subject to the same court orders and the same liability for, for, uh, for consequences from the Crown Office as anyone else in the country? I think there are very good reasons for Parliaments uh, having privilege in a range of ways. 
Uh, without parliamentary privilege, then some of the major scandals of the age would never have been revealed. Some of the major issues of the, of the age would never have been tackled because at some point a parliamentarian had to use that privilege in the public interest, which couldn't have been done outside Parliament. Uh, I think the Scottish Parliament should very much be doing that, not to use it irresponsibly, not to, to use it in a cavalier fashion, but to accept the responsibility as parliamentarians to be able to do things that other people can't. And the reason that privilege is given to parliamentarians is this Parliament is to represent the people who, in Scotland in particular, as we both know, are the ultimate authority. It may be the Crown Office, but the Parliament representing the people is the ultimate authority. Now, you asked me why I was surprised, uh, Mr Allen. I was surprised because the Crown Office had said diametrically the different thing uh, two weeks ago in terms of the evidence that had been submitted and published in the Spectator uh, magazine. Uh, so it is somewhat of a surprise uh, to find out that uh, the Crown Office adopted a different view in the evidence before this committee than they adopted two weeks ago in the evidence published in a, a magazine. And that requires explanation and exploration by this committee. Uh, and thirdly, I resent the idea that anything in my evidence, legal by my lawyers and legal team with the intent that we had, would ever transgress on the order from Lady Dorian. I've got a number of reasons for saying that. Well, uh, let, me, let me finish. I didn't say you said it. You asked me about my attitude of surprise to the Crown Office. The reason for it is quite simple. <coughs> We're talking here about the civil case. On October the 2nd, no, October the 4th, I beg your pardon, 2018, in front of Lord Pentland, my legal team moved an order to protect the anonymity of the two complainants in the civil case in the, in the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government didn't turn up. They weren't even represented at that hearing. So when I hear some people say that this is all about protecting anonymity of a complainant, and when I know that wasn't the view of the Crown Office two weeks ago, and when I know that the Scottish Government didn't turn up in the civil case on uh, October the, uh, the 4th, 2018, then you should allow me an element of surprise and an element of disquiet that an argument is being used for totally different reasons. And the very last point I make to you is this. That evidence has been widely shared. Everybody in this committee, I presume, has read it, even though they're not allowed to discuss it in detail. Is there anyone who seriously thinks that that evidence prejudices the identity or breaks in any way the anonymity given uh, to complainants? I haven't met anybody who says that, who's read the evidence, and therefore it is passing strange that the Crown Office should have adopted the attitude that they have. It's not for me to speak for this committee or this parliament, but I'd hope that this parliament, if it feels it doesn't have the powers, then soon gets the powers to exert its authority over things like that. And that surprise is shared not just by myself, but as I said earlier, by Lord Hope, the former president of the council. Can I? can I can I interrupt you, please, as convener? I just want to make it plain to everyone and to everyone listening that it's the Scottish Parliament corporate body who is the publisher here, and uh, not the committee. And so all these questions are for the SPCB, and uh, I would refer anybody that's interested to their explanation they made by answering a written inspired question uh, the other day about it. As far as this committee is concerned, we operate within the legal parameters set out in our committee's handling statement, and that's what we will continue to do. And the evidence that we are considering today and questioning on is the evidence that has been published by the committee in that matter. So back to Alistair. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, on another theme um, about some of the proposed solutions that you, you had in mind to the, the situation that arose in terms of 
uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution. Um, those being, well, I should say they're all different, and we're aware they're all different, but those, those including, uh, in totality, conciliation, arbitration and mediation. Um, now, they all have different levels of formality, different repercussions uh, in terms of binding parties and so on. Um, however, to take them in their generality, do you have a view about whether um, such alternatives are, are appropriate for a public law matter, given only that, given only that a, a court of law can hold that a decision of a government, such as the decision of a permanent secretary, is unlawful? Well, of course, the court of law has held it to be uh, unlawful, uh, Mr Allen. Uh, I, I think the question of mediation uh, is a fairly obvious one, and uh, I, just, I don't even know the answer to it yet. Uh, maybe it was just because the policy was being so rushed that they forgot to include the, the paragraph. But mediation as a proposal is not a, a, a difficult concept. It is in, in some form or another in every personnel policy I've ever heard of. And I know there's some people much better qualified to, to speak. This is not an unusual concept. But in terms of this policy, the fact that mediation is included for current ministers, but not for former ministers, eh, would lead me to believe eh, that either the, the word processor wasn't working properly or, or whatever happened, but certainly I can't believe it was a deliberate act to inc eh, exclude mediation. So mediation is missing eh, from the, the policy for no understandable reason whatsoever. So it wasn't an unreasonable uh, idea to, to suggest it should, be, it should be looked at. As far as arbitration is concerned, well, arbitration, I think it was 2010 that was brought in, the, the, the bill, it was designed to, to provide a, a much cheaper and much less and much more private and confidential way of addressing certain disputes. There was no reason whatsoever that shouldn't have been applied to this particular uh, dispute. Uh, as has been said, and I know the committee understands this, this is not about the substance of the complaints, this is about the legality of the policy. Uh, I made it clear when we put forward the proposal that if my legal advice had been wrong, then I would have submitted to the policy. Uh, but uh, the government seemed the less confident about their legal position uh, than we were. Uh, the idea that that wouldn't have been a better way, and it's not the benefit of hindsight, to approach this matter than what has transpired over these last uh, three years uh, would be a, an extraordinary position to, to adopt, clearly. And as I say, not just with the benefit of hindsight, then mediation would have been, uh, sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon, arbitration would have been a much better, uh, uh, a much better means of trying to find a satisfactory resolution than what subsequently happened. I understand that you, you feel very strongly about that. And um, we've also heard copious evidence um, in committee uh, as to why others take a, a different point of view on that. I wonder, can you understand the, the point of view, or do you have a view on the point of view, um, that it would be fundamentally inappropriate um, to take a public law matter involving accusations of sexual harassment and try to resolve that behind closed doors. Um, wouldn't it be inappropriate to do that rather than in open court? And in terms of perceptions, do you have a view on whether that might look like sweeping the matter under the carpet? Well, two things. One, mediation as a concept is not sweeping matters under the carpet. I've heard that phrase uh, many times over the last uh, couple of years. That's part of a properly constructed personnel policy. As far as arbitration is concerned, uh, I can't speak for others involved in the, directly involved in this process, but I can't think anyone wouldn't think that would have been a better way to approach things than what subsequently happened. The idea that the people at the centre of this, whether they be complainants or myself, want things debated in a public court is, uh, I think, to misunderstand uh, being in the eye of that particular storm. It's confidentiality in debating not the substance of complaints, but the policy under which they were being applied to see if it was legal or not. It would have been an infinitely preferable uh, way to, to proceed. And with respect, I mean, I, and I know this is not the... because the committee is examining the behaviour of the civil service, of ministers, 
and special advisers. Therefore, by definition, you tend to interview more people who are being examined uh, than people who are commenting. Uh, but the people you say have supported the rejection of arbitration, with respect, are the people who rejected arbitration. Uh, you would hardly necessarily think, I mean, it would be great if people would come along and say, well, perhaps in reflection, we could have avoided this abject disaster and saved the Scottish people £600,000. That might be a, a good thing for people to say, but people who took a decision uh, would, might be expected to defend it however disastrous the decision subsequently turned out to be. Of course, some of the people who expressed, or from the evidence we have, seem to express a lack of enthusiasm for um, these alternative routes seem to include the complainers themselves. Well, the difficulty with that argument, Mr Allen, and I know you'll do this as you study your papers, that in terms of the mediation offer, it was rejected by the permanent secretary before it was put to the complainants. That's in your papers, and uh, they were presented with it later as a fait accompli, that it had been done. Uh, and even then, if you, again, if you examine your papers, one complainant said that uh, she might wish to consider it at a later stage. Uh, but the offer was rejected by the permanent secretary before it was even put to the complainants. In terms of arbitration, it was rejected without putting it to the complainants at all. They weren't even consulted. And therefore, Mr Allen, the people you say are defending the position of not going to ab legal arbitration are the very people who took that decision not to accept legal arbitration. I just want to ask as well about the, the point that you, you make about distinguishing the, the substance of the complaints from the, the, the nature of the policy. Um, the Scottish Government's former Director of Legal Services told us that um, arbitration would not be appropriate in this situation, um, firstly because it would not have been possible to separate out the substance of the complaints from the procedural issues, and secondly that arbitration was inappropriate um, where there was a significant degree of dispute over factual issues, such as, such as there was in this case. So, um, for all of those reasons, can you understand um, why there were some difficulties about separating the two issues out in the way that you suggest? You no, know, there are no difficulties whatsoever. Uh, we weren't aware when we were offering arbitration that there were any procedural difficulties in the implementation of the policy, because we didn't become aware of that until several months later, because the government were concealing the evidence. Uh, and as far as the question of settling the, the ground rules in terms of law uh, for uh, settling a dispute. That is what arbitration is about. If you couldn't separate the, the ground rules from the, the detailed dispute, there never would be any arbitration. All that the arbitration was designed to do was to see if the policy was proper and legal, not to apply it to any particular case, to see if the policy in itself was constructed in a legal fashion. And I, I mean, you're perfectly entitled, of course, to, to ask any questions you can. I think in terms of the people watching this, the people who've paid the £630,000 that the government wasted, that many people watching this will find it surprising that, that anyone is seriously arguing that the judicial review in the full public court it was worth the public expenditure that the government wasted upon it. Well, you'll notice, Mr Salmond, I didn't offer any opinion about whether it, it was uh, a good value for money. Um, I'm asking you about some of the, uh, whether you have some views about some of the points of law that have been raised. Um, the Lord Advocate on that subject said about the appropriateness of arbitration uh, as a general rule where an allegation is made that the government has made a decision uh, that is not valid because it is in breach of some public law or rule. That is, generally speaking, not an issue that it is appropriate to submit to private arbitration. Given the nature of a dispute here, which was about whether the government had gone wrong in law in relation to its uh, handling of the, hand the harassment complaints, very serious questions would arise as to whether that was something uh, that should be dealt with by a private procedure. Any arbitration might simply give rise to further legal issues, so it might not necessarily result in... Uh, finality. Do you have a, a view on the assessment of the Lord Advocate about the situation there? Well, I think some of the key phrases you've just read out are might not necessarily. Uh, that sounds very much like the, the... Well, 
Uh, you're reading out presumably from, from his evidence. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have the opinion of external counsel uh, and what they thought about it? Uh, since one, one thing we can absolutely say is that the Lord Advocate's uh, learned uh, uh, account and advice on these matters uh, was subsequently found to, to not, be, uh, to not stand, stand the, the test of the court of session. Uh, and if that's, uh, that's the case in terms of the arguments about the overall policy, it might be the case that he was wrong on arbitration uh, as well. The record of the government uh, in this case and is, uh, is not one that, uh, that anyone would have a great deal of confidence in, either in terms of the legal advice they've been getting from their internal lawyers and the Lord Advocate, I think from what we've seen, we might place more stress on the external advice they were getting, but are not willing to give this committee or the public. And finally, I, I wasn't actually expressing the view of being surprised to yourself. I, I was thinking much more of the, the people watching this, our, well, your constituents, uh, and the people who paid the bills. Thank you, convener. OK, can I move to Andy Whiteman, please? Thanks, Convener. Um, just five relatively quick questions, Convener, if we can deal with them. First of all, in an answer to Murder Fraser, uh, you said you had um, documents there in your possession that were disclosed in the Commission. Um, my understanding is that whilst there's a bar on uh, under the 2010 Act, uh, I know you dispute the application of the 2010 Act, but there's a bar on, on, on revealing documents that you attempted to, uh, to admit to the criminal trial that were inadmissible. Any documents that were revealed to the, the, civil, to the Court of Session um, could I invite you to consider whether you were able to hand them over to the committee? I think we've already done so. We have in, done. In okay. No, we haven't handed them over. We, we, in correspondence, we indicated our willingness to do it. We then had correspondence with the government, who only would agree, or what they didn't agree, if we gave the documents to them so as they could, as they put it, make suitable redactions. Uh, my view is that if the committee wishes to see these documents, we shall hand them over. And, of course, the committee has had leave already from the, uh, uh, the uh, Court of Session in terms of other documents in the, in the civil case. Uh, and a committee request to, to have the full transcript of the Commission in Diligence uh, would be uh, well received by uh, my legal team. And, uh, and uh, we would be very happy. And, of course, the committee can then make whatever redactions it, 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 it feels are necessary. But, uh, yes, I, I think you would find the, the, the documents most uh, informative. Thanks. I'll well, certainly follow that up with my committee colleagues. Um, secondly, in, in any, any civil petition, um, such as you drafted for the judicial review, a competent lawyer will tend to include a whole suite of complaints and a range of remedies sought in order to maximise their chances of success. Now, your, uh, uh, what you seek is set out in, in paragraph four of your draft position for declarator and declarator and some orders and reduction of the decision, etc. Can you say, and, and you have a, a number of grounds for um, alleging that the procedure was unlawful, can you say anything, given that none of these were tested in court ultimately, can you say anything more about which of the grounds for judicial review you were advised give you the highest chance of success? Yeah. Well, for any dealt with retrospectivity, in the absence of any legislation, in the presence of a, a proper valid previous policy, in the absence of any consent for, from those who are being, uh, are being, uh, is being applied to. Uh, I think the uh, procedural unfairness, which, if you remember, is in the interlocutor, uh, the, one of the strongest arguments, uh, and I'm not competent to judge the strongest argument, but certainly has put to me one of the strongest arguments was the, the nature of the investigating officer. I'm not talking here about the prior involvement that was subsequently discovered, but the nature of how the investigating officer conducts uh, his or her uh, activities. It, it means that in this procedure, and totally different from fairness at work and, and totally different from elsewhere, the investigating officer basically presents the, the case for the prosecution before the defendant is even informed about the procedure. Uh, and then the person who's been complained about, instead of being able to present their own case, has to give that case to the same person, to the investigating officer, to present on his or her behalf. Uh, and that, uh, 
my legal team told me is, a, is not something that the courts uh, take kindly to. There's a, another question, which is about the Permanent Secretary's decision not to allow me any contact with uh, civil servants uh, uh, or even have documents like my own diaries at that stage, uh, which she spelt out boldly in a letter saying, I've decided not to allow you contact with civil servants or documents. It was felt that the court would regard that as a, an unreasonable uh, a position. And then thirdly, and the same thing is access to witness statements. Uh, in any case, people are normally given access, not necessarily the names of, uh, of witnesses, uh, but certainly the content of witness statements, of what was, was actually witnesses were saying, uh, so as they can have their, uh, uh, their, uh, their own witnesses prepared by the de defence to give their account, and then the two things can be judged by someone in a, an impartial manner. So these procedural difficulties about being able to present your own case with information that should be available to someone on the receiving end of a complaint it are, you know, well, certainly things that are in the fairness to work policies, I'm sure you're, you're well aware. And, and this, this, and lastly, of course, the, it was pointed out, uh, uh, as again you'll be aware, this hybrid nature of the procedure whereby the, the civil service takes the procedure so far, then hands it over to a political party to implement a sanction. It is highly questionable. If a political party wants to implement a sanction on someone, then they've got their own procedures to do it and should have their own procedures to do it, not rely on a civil service procedure that's somehow handed over to them to, to make a decision. In every conceivable way, uh, this policy was badly thought out, rushed through, without consultation, and then badly implemented. It would have fallen on innumerable grounds. You rightly say that most of these grounds weren't tested. They weren't tested because they didn't have to be tested because the government collapsed eh, and collapsed in terms of the, the expenses that were to be awarded as well. But lastly, Mr Whiteman, that wasn't the view of the Permanent Secretary. On the day of uh, January 8th, uh, 2019, where this calamitous event from her perspective you would have thought occurred, eh, a this enormous defeat in the court of session occurred with massive publicity and massive cost, she put out a press release saying, all other grounds were dismissed. Now, you and I both know how misleading that was. You've put it correctly. The other grounds weren't tested because the case had already been lost by the government. So why put out a press release? The permanent sector, we're not talking about a politician, we're not talking about myself or any member of this committee under pressure and trying to put a we're talking about the permanent sector of the Scottish government's press release. All other grounds were dismissed, apart from this one narrow ground as you and I both know in terms of whatever view we take on these, there were very substantial problems that would have had to be addressed, even if the investigating officer had not transgressed the policy. Okay, thanks for that very full response. My third question. Uh, in para 24 of your submission on the judicial review, and I quote, you say, we have a witness recognition bracket statement which recounts that in late November 2018, a special advisor told the witness that the government knew they would lose the JR but that they would, quote, get him in the criminal case. Uh, can you say anything el uh, more about um, who this witness is or who the special advisor is, or indeed whether you can supply this committee with a copy of the witness recognition statement? Well, it certainly happened, and uh, we've got the statement, and I'd have to consult the, the person concerned. The point being that, and the reason for it being there, is it demonstrates in November of 2018, the hope was in the part of that special advisor and others that the, uh, the judicial review would be overtaken by the criminal case. And what substantive evidence beyond that statement we have for that lies in the whole question of sisting, uh, which, uh, as I know you'll appreciate, and, you know, very few people watching probably will understand, but the idea that if the criminal case had been advanced, then the civil case wouldn't have gone ahead pending the outcome of the criminal case. Uh, and many people seem to invest a great deal of hope uh, that the criminal case uh, would ride to the rescue, uh, like the cavalry over the hill, and somehow the civil case would never be heard. If you're in a situation uh, where you have got a high degree of expectation, you're about to calamitously lose a civil case, then that is, uh, obviously was a pressing concern for, for many people. 
Yes, you, you, you say that in your fourth submission as well. I think uh, the committee would welcome if you have any further evidence on the question of um, evidence that the government was consider assisting, I think would be useful to the committee. Uh, that brings us on to one of the essential difficulties because uh, there's been a lot of talk about section 162 and it's in the case and you know what it is. This is by the prohibition I've got in supplying evidence. Much of that has been around text messages, which I know the committee has been very exercised about. You also realise it applies to government documents. Government documents that I've seen in the criminal case, disclosed as part of the disclosure in the criminal case, documents which should have been provided to this committee in terms of its remit, that this committee should have seen these documents. Uh, this is not, they were disclosed during the criminal case, but they're not about the criminal case, they are about the judicial review. Assisting has been mentioned by a couple of your witnesses. You've got one single document on the question of assisting. You know there were 17 meetings with external <coughs> counsel. You know that Paul Coquette told you there were daily meetings, as he put it, to discuss how the case was going. You know that Judith McKinnon told you that she had thrice weekly meetings about it. And yet this committee, barring that one single document, doesn't have an iota of an email, a text message, a one note, any other piece of information on a question which I can tell you was a huge preoccupation uh, of the government in uh, September and October uh, 2018. And I think it would be a very wonderful reason for this committee uh, to ask why. And I excuse would me, really Mr. love Salmon. to excuse supply me, you Mr. with that Salmon. evidence. It's up to this committee to decide what they're going to ask well, and where they're going to go. I'm in the, so, convener, I'm in the hands of, uh, of the committee. I make are. no observation of whether you should or should not <laughs> uh, ask to have the evidence. I'm merely pointing out that even if you did, the Crown Office would forbid me, on pain of a criminal penalty, from giving you these documents. And perhaps that pertains to Alistair Allen's uh, a question. I don't think that is the right balance between the Crown Office and a parliamentary committee. Well, I have one more question now because you preempted my final one. Um, in para 29 of your judicial review submission, you say um, on January the 8th, 2019, Lord Pentland issued an interlocutor, which you enclose at Appendix D, reducing the investigation and the Permanent Secretary's decision report. You then go and say the government provided undertakings not to distribute documents, and you say that those undertakings were recorded in the minute of proceedings. Now, forgive me, there's a lot of evidence in this inquiry, and I only joined the committee in December, but I'm not aware as to whether we have the minute of proceedings. If we don't have the minute of proceedings, is that a document that you would be able to provide the committee? Were we to wish it? Yes, uh, as far as I understand it, and I would be very willing to do it. I'm sort of surprised you don't have it, but, uh, uh, My but if, if you don't have it, and uh, I, mean, I know we've got it, then of course we'll, we'll, we'll hand it over to the committee. Okay, thanks, Camilla. Yeah, I, I think we do have that, but we shall double check. Thank you very much. Move on now to uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just uh, one question, and it's really just for uh, just a bit of clarity, probably more so for people watching this session as compared to uh, obviously what's been discussed thus far. It's, um, it was a, a comment from the Lord Advocate to the committee, uh, and I quote uh, the petitioner in the judicial review uh, challenged the lawfulness of the government's harassment policy and its application in this case uh, on a number of grounds. And for the reasons set out in the government statement uh, to the committee, the government accepted that one of those grounds of challenge was well founded and it conceded the case. Uh, so therefore, just with that, so, uh, I think just for that clarity, uh, do you agree that, uh, the, that it was only on one ground that the government conceded the case? Well, I, I agree with Lord Pentland's interlocutor, his judgment uh, that uh, the government was found to have behaved unlawfully, uh, procedurally unfairly, and tainted in a manner tainted by apparent bias. That's the interlocutor from the Court of Session. Uh, the government collapsed the case. You're petitioning for judicial review, which is to set aside a procedure as unlawful. If the government uh, comes to you and says, we'll collapse the case and we'll agree to expenses on the the highest scale because of our behaviour during the case, uh, then I, I doubt if any, uh, any uh, lawyer on earth wouldn't say you've won. Uh, to go ahead further and to win on all or many 
perhaps of the other grounds as well, would just have cost people more money uh, when the, the case was, uh, was being dealt with. One thing is the, the reduction, of course, wasn't just reduction of the decision, it was reduction of the documents uh, and the undertakings Mr Whiteman referred to. Uh, the, we uh, were given by the government, but we moved to have them in the in the interlocutor as well, uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, it was understood that uh, the court was behind uh, the reduction, the destruction, effectively, of uh, of the decision and the and the documents. The, the victory was as comprehensive as you could possibly get in legal terms. The, the point I was making earlier uh, was the permanent secretary's portrayal of it was at variance with reality. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Bailey, please. Thank you very much, convener. Um, can I ask you four questions, and I, I, I don't require long answers. Um, in terms of the duty of candour, that requires full disclosure of information by the Scottish Government. You described a search warrant to the Permanent Secretary from the Crown Office for material in relation to the criminal trial. We also know there was a commission on diligence um, to recover documents, and they came forward in various tranches. Yet when this committee asked for information in the complaints handling phase, am I correct in saying that there were still documents that you hadn't, or your legal team, hadn't previously seen? And if that's the case, what did they relate to? Hey, I, I think I, I specified, a, or we specified a number, because we went through the many, many documents that came to this, uh, or about to come to this committee in, uh, in late last year, and uh, we went through each and every document and cross-compared with what had been uh, disclosed in both the civil case and the criminal case, and we found, uh, I, I'm, I, th I think, 40 or so, but uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't hold myself to an exact number, a substantial number of documents that we had never seen before, uh, which is spectacular, because it's... It's both the duty of candour that we should have seen these, regardless of the exact specification. The whole point of a duty of candour is you're meant to hand over things which are important. Uh, and the criminal case, where they were actually specified in the, uh, in the search warrant, they uh, applied to the government uh, a year past October, or thereabouts, in 2019. Now, the most spectacular of these, but by no means the only example, is a series of documents which demonstrated that the Permanent Secretary had met the complainants, one complainant, and telephoned the other on March the 6th, I think it was, 2018. That's the day before I was informed there were any complaints against me, after she'd received the investigating officer's first report, in mid-process. Uh, and as a point I made earlier, there's two aspects to that. One, it's uh, an extraordinary thing to happen, uh, in some views at least, m even more serious than the investigating officer meeting uh, before a, a process starts, to, to meet people in mid-process. But even if you disregard that, the, the question is one of disclosure. Uh, why wasn't that information clearly pertinent to the judicial review disclosed in the civil case? Uh, you know, despite the, you know, the, the instruction of the court and the advice of their own counsel that this was really important to, to follow that. And secondly, and even more spectacularly, uh, the, the search warrant in the criminal case specifies meetings between the permanent secretary and complainants. The Crown Office in this case did not receive that document, I believe, uh, or if they did, they certainly didn't disclose it to us. I believe they didn't uh, receive it, uh, which is almost beyond imagination. Uh, and it's not a duty of candour. That's a refusal to, to produce information in the face of a search warrant. That's obstruction of justice. Uh, and uh, there are consequences for such things. It's a pretty serious charge. And, of course, um, I want to explore with you just briefly the role of the Permanent Secretary, because from what I can see, she oversaw the development of the policy. She was the final arbiter in terms of complaints. As you've just outlined, she met with complainants. She's responsible for leading the government in the judicial review process. Um, do you think she's discharged her responsibilities in line with the Civil Service Code? No. OK. Thank you. Can I move us on to the independence of the investigating officer. Um, 
On the 17th of October, the investigating officer was interviewed by junior counsel, and she was open about her contact with the complainants. On the 31st of October, there was written counsel's opinion. On the 13th of November, a freedom of information request tells us there was a meeting between counsel, the first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, the permanent secretary, and the chief of staff. As a former first minister, would carrying on legal action in the court of session, knowing that you had acted unlawfully, be a breach of the ministerial code? Yes. Do you believe that this was the case in this instance? Well, we cannot be sure because I, like you, haven't seen the external legal advice of October uh, 20, uh, uh, 2018. Uh, clearly, it was, as I think was said to you in evidence, a highly significant moment when, when it w was realised by counsel that there had been a prior contact. Everything about it suggests, even how it's been described in terms, is on the balance of probability uh, that uh, that advice showed that they, they, or indicated the government were about to lose. If that is the case, and if that legal advice says that, and the case was continued in the knowledge of the, the First Minister against that legal advice, then that would be a breach of the, the ministerial code. If we could just see the document, then we'd all be better informed. Well, indeed, this Parliament has asked twice. We've still not seen it. Um, so good luck with that one. Can I move us finally on to the judicial review in terms of sisting? Um, and you say that um, the sisting of the judicial review was, was about delaying the process in the court of session so it would be overtaken by the criminal trial. Now, can I refer you to your own submission to us um, paragraph 24 of Annex B, where you say, we have a witness recognition statement which recounts that in late November 2018, a special advisor told the witness that the government knew that they would lose the judicial review, but that they would get him in the criminal case. Would you share that recognition statement with the committee? That's what Mr Whiteman asked ah, me. Ah, excellent. Need, uh, I missed that. The, uh, and my answer was, would obviously need the permission of the, of the witness. Uh, I'm anxious to share all documentation I can which establishes this point. Uh, there is no question, and I think uh, if we are able to, to share the documentation on assisting the government documents as well, uh, that there was a, a belief that the criminal case might uh, overtake the judicial review. And I'm not suggesting, I mean, and that assisting was being examined by the Lord Advocate because uh, uh, quite clearly, as the government's legal advisor, you would expect him to be looking at that, not just Mr Kekett uh, and others. Uh, it would be very important for, for those to see it. I'm not suggesting, incidentally, for a, a second that the Lord Advocate was engaged in thinking, therefore, we should accelerate the, the criminal case in order to avoid defeat in the civil case. I'm not suggesting that for a second. I'm merely suggesting that there was a widespread knowledge by November 2018 uh, that the judicial review was going to uh, fail in the part of the government uh, and that there was a prospect of it being assisted if the criminal case uh, was, uh, came, to, uh, uh, came to a moment before the judicial review hearing in January 2019. And the reason for saying this is I can think of no other reason that you would postpone taking a decision on a case that you knew on the balance of probability you were highly likely to lose unless you thought there was going to be something else happening that avoided I mean, there's no point in saying, OK, we won't concede because it will put it off until... January before we, we lose catechismically, remembering that the clock is ticking all the time in terms of expenses. The, the, the case in January is going to be much more serious than conceding in October. I mean, conceding in October would be embarrassing, it would be difficult, but it wouldn't be as cataclysmic as, a, as a, an open court case in, in January. So okay, perhaps uh, we'd hear what other motivation could there possibly have been than the belief that something might happen and intervene which meant that the judicial review 
never came to court. And as I say, if the judicial review had never come to court at that stage, if it had been postponed or assisted behind the, uh, the criminal case, and let's be frank here, if I'd been convicted of anything, anything at all, then this uh, inquiry would have been moot. Nobody would have cared about the, uh, the civil case or the judicial review or anything like that. This inquiry wouldn't be sitting and it would have been entirely overtaken by events. Fortunately for me, and I believe fortunately for justice in Scotland, that didn't happen. And this inquiry is taking place. And hopefully the, the lessons that come from this will improve the Scottish institutions so that people can have more confidence in them whether they uh, believe in devolution or independence. Thank you very much, convener. Maureen Mott, please. Uh, thank you, um, can I just go back to uh, the, the uh, timing of the concession of the judicial review, which, of course, was conceded solely on the basis of one um, issue, which was the contact between the uh, complainants and the investigating officer. When we talked to Paul Coquette, he said, and I quote, it took time to work out what the circumstances really meant. It was not a slam dunk moment. Work required to be done as we tried to establish what the full factual circumstances were and then work out whether the combination of the wording of paragraph 10 of the procedure with the facts that were emerging and continued to emerge as we found out more, out more, had that effect. And the Lord Advocate, when he gave evidence to us, said when the issue was identified in late October, people immediately went to paragraph 10 of the procedure. That was not considered to be fatal. It was identified that there was a debate to be had. Any lawyer in, who is involved in litigation understands that many issues may arise uh, that one may have to defend and argue in court, but the government was content that its interpretation of that sentence was one that was capable of being argued and defended in court, and one that it would be right to submit to the determination of the court. The issue of apparent bias depends ultimately on close knowledge of the facts, regrettably at the point where matters had to be investigated in November and things were reviewed in the light of that, the full factual picture was not known. So wasn't it quite, um, quite in order that the government took time to concede the case? Indeed, the Lord Advocate has been an advocate and a QC for some 30 years. He's also been a previous Dean of the Faculty, which I think is um, a post of which is elected uh, by his peers. So, laying aside what external counsel says, are you really questioning the ability within government to decide when the case should have been conceded? Well, uh, so what, uh, laying aside what external counsel uh, had to say, isn't that the exact point that, uh, that Parliament have voted for uh, on uh, two occasions? Uh, why don't we know what external counsel? You say that uh, the present Lord Advocate is a past dean of the faculty. The external counsel is the present dean of the faculty. I'd have thought it would be of extraordinary interest to see what Roddy Dunlop and Christine O'Neill were saying uh, in October uh, 2018. And given that the public have paid dearly for the mistakes of the Lord Advocate and others, I think they're entitled to see uh, that, uh, that legal opinion, which would answer your question and answer the questions of, of many other people. In terms of the, the hopes of the, of the Lord Advocate, then I sat in the court session uh, where uh, Lord Pentland delivered his interlocutor. And although, of course, the case had been conceded and uh, there wasn't much to be done, uh, it was patently obvious in terms of what Lord Pentland said, to, to my hearing at least, that. Uh, that he knew exactly what the problem was. Uh, he commented on the, the nature of the no prior contact stipulation. He looked back and saw almost exactly the same phrase was in the very first iteration of the policy on November the 8th that it hadn't changed in any material sense. It was still no prior contact. The name of the investigating officer had changed. Uh, so I, I don't think the Lord Advocate would have done very well 
uh, if he'd been uh, if he'd been in the, the, the shoes of uh, Roddy Dunlop and having to argue the, the case, and I suppose that the practitioner, the person who was actually having to argue the case in court, uh, probably recognised the the essential difficulties. Uh, two further points. One, why was this information only becoming available? Ms. McKinnon has said that she discussed her role openly with her superiors. You know, this is not, uh, doesn't seem to me a particularly difficult thing to do to find out what the prior contact was. It doesn't require a, a massive investigation. Uh, as for everything I know is that Ms. McKinnon was perfectly open about what she had done. It wasn't a secret. And therefore, <clears throat> I, I can't see why it would have taken any length of time to do that. So why was, did there have to be some <clears throat> major consideration taking weeks and months in order to establish the inevitable result. <coughs> Excuse me, come here. And just one other point. Um, you said that um, mediation uh, could have been pursued or arbitration um, could also have, I think you said, a much, been a much better means. I think any HR professional would say that in, the term, in terms of a sexual harassment case, both are totally unsuitable. Well, obviously, it can't be the case that both are totally unsuitable, since mediation is in the policy as regards current ministers, as I know you as a, 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 an HR professional will know and will have recognised. So it cannot be thought to be totally unsuitable, Ms Watt, because it's actually in the policy, but it only applies to current ministers, not past ministers. That was the point I was making. As far as arbitration is concerned, anybody else who was facing what I was facing would have taken their counsel's advice and gone to court and exposed the Scottish Government much earlier. The only reason, the only reason I didn't go to court and was looking for another means of trying to settle the issue is because I was a former First Minister and was aware of how cataclysmic it would be for the current Scottish Government. <coughs> Thank you. I now have uh, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Salmond, you've already um, referred to two texts that are in the public domain and that the Chief Executive of the SNP was asked about when he gave evidence on the 25th of, um, of January. No, is that right? No, sorry. Which were sent on the 25th of January 2020, the day that you first appeared in court on, on criminal charges. The official report lists the text in full, and I think it's worth reading it out so you can respond to this, Mr. Chairman. Totally agree, folks should be asking the police questions. Report now with the Procurator Fiscal on charges, which leaves the police twiddling their thumbs. So good time to be pressurising them. Would be good to know the Met looking at events in London. And the second text, again from Mr Murrow. To be honest, the, whole, the more fronts he is having to firefight, uh, the better for the complainers, for all complainers, so the CPS action would be a good thing. The explanation for this has um, been the subject of some credibility. Um, both Mr Murrow and the First Minister, uh, when she's spoken to Parliament on that, said it. Uh, when they reflected on the messages now, um, they seem quite out of character. And Mr Murrell says to me that suggests just how upset I was at the time. Uh, would that be your reading of them? And is that a credible response? Ms Pritchell, I, I, don't, I don't want to be rude, but I, I've got a small chest infection just now. I, I know. Uh, I was actually if, just going to say, would you like to have a little break, Mr Simon? If, if, if that's all right, I'm sure. yes. anxious to answer that question. But yes. I, I think it might be better if I Absolutely. see if I can sort my chest out and, Please do. Uh, and come back and do it. Um, if uh, one of our clerks could make sure Mr. Salmon gets over to his material. <coughs> oh, and uh, I hereby suspend the meeting. <laughs> no.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 13th meeting of this committee in 2021, which is an evidence session with former First Minister of Scotland, Mr Alex Salmond. And I can confirm that Mr Salmond took the oath at the start of this morning's evidence session. I can also confirm um, that all necessary mitigations have been taken, allowing us to meet safely under COVID restrictions in persons today, and we have just had a short sanitation break. Now, just before we had that break, uh, Margaret Mitchell had asked a question. I'll ask Ms Mitchell to repeat it. Right, Mr um, Salmond, it was about two text messages in the public domain, um, which were in the official report from the 8th of December, and when I asked um, Mr Murrell about when he last came before the committee in January. And um, the text messages were sent by him the 25th of January 2020, the date the yourself um, first appeared in court on criminal charges. And um, do you wish me to, to read them in full again? Okay. The text, the first text says, totally agree, folks should be asking the police questions. Report now with the PF on charges which leave police twiddling their thumbs. So good time to be pressurising them. Would be good to know met looking at events in London. And the second text says, TBH, and I presume that's to be honest, the more fronts he is having to firefight on the better for all complainers. So CPS action would be a good thing. Mr Murrell's explanation for these texts was reflecting on these messages now. They seem quite out of character. To me, that suggests just how upset I was at the time. Now, given both Mr Murrow and um, the First Minister, when she spoke to Parliament about them, seem to accept these as quite reasonable explanations. I wondered um, if there was some doubt in your mind about the credibility. Well, thanks, thanks Mr Mitchell, and, and pardon uh, excuse me for the delay. 22nd of January uh, last year, uh, the preliminary hearing of the, uh, of the criminal case, uh, we were presented with a, a memory stick uh, by the Crown Office under disclosure. Uh, and we didn't, weren't able to use it, which was extremely unfortunate in the preliminary hearing. Uh, and the next day, I think it was, in the offices of uh, Levy and McCrae, uh, we went through a series of messages. Uh, it was one of the most uh, extraordinary days of my life because uh, I'm not allowed to describe in the, any detail the, the messages, but uh, let's say I recognise the one you've just read out. There are many other messages, uh, and what they speak to is behaviour <laughs> which I would never have, never have countenanced from people I'd known in some cases for 30 years. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there has been behaviour which is about not just pressurising the police, like the one you've read out, but pressurising witnesses, a collusion with witnesses. We're talking about the construction of evidence because the police somehow were felt to be inadequate in finding it themselves. And the point about this is that on the 25th of August, I think it was 2018, a police investigation started. When a police investigation starts, these matters are for the police. They have the investigatory function. Uh, they, they don't need uh, assistance from uh, uh, Inspector Murrell or, or Sergeant Riddick or, or uh, uh, Constable McCann or, or Special Constable Allison. Whether people are in the Scottish Government or the SNP, then they have no investigative function. It's a matter for the police. Not only shouldn't they be doing anything other than... than uh, supporting the police in their activities, but they certainly shouldn't be seeking to pressurise. One other thing about this, the, in July of last year, because rumours have been current in the SNP for some time about, about such messages, Kenny McCaskill wrote to the Crown Office, and I have a copy of the letter which I'll give to the committee, asking if there was any evidence of pressurising the police by, by Mr Murrow. And he got a reply saying that... Uh, there's no such evidence. A, not a reply saying, and a reply that said the messages had been looked at. But there was no such, no such uh, evidence that uh, 
uh, though evidence that Mr Mulder pressurised the police and the, and the messages had been inspected. Not, oh, there are messages to that effect, but it didn't happen. Just the message has been looked at and just a blank uh, no. And then subsequently, Mr McCaskill, as you know, uh, made the messages available to this committee and to the Crown Office. And as you say, they have now been confirmed, as I understand it, as being genuine. And I'm not surprised they've been confirmed as being genuine. Rather similar, I think, to this committee's experience in the lost the battle but not the war text message from the Permanent Secretary to Barbara Allison on the day that the judicial review was lost by the government. Similar in the sense that it was said in Barbara Allison before the committee that it uh, wasn't sent to her. And then the message is revealed and, and the message is, is accepted as fact. Similar to what happened in Mr Murrell's message. There are a number of other messages in the public domain and uh, I can go through them if this committee wishes. There are many other messages which I am prohibited from sharing with this committee. Uh, when a police investigation starts, all other activity should stop. It's not for the SNP or the Scottish Government uh, to, uh, to supplant the police in their investigative function. Uh, it's for everyone to accept that's the due process of law and should be allowed to continue without impediment. That's been very helpful in establishing um, just the veracity, I suppose, of the explanation and setting that in context. It, really, it raises very worrying issues, especially as Mr uh, Murrow was on North when he gave us that explanation. So um, thank you for that. That's helpful. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm going to move on now to Mr Cole Hamilton. Um, and, and, and can hear that Mr Sam's chest is, is sore. <coughs> uh, so if we could um, try to avoid huge long uh, questions and responses. I think it's the answers that uh, should be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like to say, you know. <laughs> Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, convener. And uh, welcome back, Mr Sam. I hope you're feeling a bit better. Yeah. Um, can I just say, uh, we'd like to put a pin in your offer there, because uh, we might like to hear those messages. Um, perhaps other colleagues will pick that up with you. Um, I certainly would. Um, I I'd like, I've got quite a lot of ground to cover, but you'll be glad to know that a lot of this is yes, no answers. It's about, sure. in particular, um, the two meetings we're aware of, um, on the 20, one on the 29th of March between your for, former Chief of Staff, Jeff Aberdeen, and the First Minister in the Parliament, um, and then the meeting on the 2nd of April in the First Minister's House. Um, we understand that on learning of the investigation, you asked Mr Aberdeen to try and broker a meeting with the First Minister, um, and that in her evidence, she said that she agreed to meet with you on the 2nd of April. Is it your position that the First Minister was aware of the arrangement uh, to meet with you on the 2nd of April before she met Jeff Aberdeen on the 29th of March? No, my, my position is that the meeting of the 2nd of April was arranged on the 29th of it March. Was arranged. Uh, and I, I know this because Jeff Aberdeen phoned me on the uh, 28th of March, the day before the meeting, to tell me it was going to take place. Uh, and he phoned me the day after the meeting to tell me that the meeting had been arranged for the 2nd of April, which I think was Easter Monday, in, uh, in Glasgow. I mean, self-evidently, the only person who can invite you to their home is the, the First Minister. Uh, and uh, I heard Mr Murrow saying uh, several times that uh, I was regularly popping in. Uh, can I just point out that I stay 200 miles uh, away from, uh, from Glasgow? Yeah. And as far as I can remember, I've been to uh, Nicola and Peter's uh, home six times in my life, maybe slightly more, but it's not a question of just popping in. And I understand that your relationship with the First Minister had begun to deteriorate anyway. It's not like you'd just be popping in for a friendly cup of coffee. Well, uh, even when my... Uh, my relationship with the, the First Minister was extremely good. I, I didn't pop in yeah. because she stayed in Glasgow and I stayed in Aberdeenshire, and that was a, an arranged meeting. Uh, uh, and that was the purpose of the, yeah. the meeting on the, the, the 29th of, of March. Uh, and I can answer anything else you like. 
That's great. I, I'd really like to unpack just the, that particular arrangement around the 29th of March, because this is very important. Um, in her evidence, the First Minister is quite vague about it. I mean, that tallies with the fact that she suggests that she forgot it. Um, she suggests that she forgot it because she also suggests that nothing of real consequence was discussed other than the arrangements for that meeting and that you had something serious to talk to her about, potentially around allegations that you were facing. Um, can I just ask about Jeff Aberdeen? Did he, so he told you that he was going to um, meet the First Minister um, the day before you, you, you got that call from him, confirming that meeting was going to happen. Um, did he explain where that meeting was going to take place and what time it was going to take place? He, he told me the meeting was going to take place on the, on the 29th. As you know, Mr Aberdeen had been approached by another official uh, who brought him into the process, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the meeting was taking place with a view to to briefing Nicola and arranging the meeting for the 2nd of April. As you know, the meeting of the 2nd of April, my former Chief of Staff, Mr Aberdeen, and Mr Duncan Hamilton, on my council, uh, attended with me. It, it was a meeting arranged for, for that purpose. Very good. Um, and on the conclusion of the meeting on the 29th of um, March, did Mr Aberdeen give you a readout of what was discussed in detail? No, he told me the next day that the, the meeting on the 2nd of April was on. Uh, he, he didn't have to give me, because yeah. the purpose of the meeting was to, uh, to brief Nicola on what was happening and to make sure the meeting on the 2nd of April was taking place. But it, uh, it was your understanding that um, uh, the First Minister already knew about the complaints and the investigation, um, and, or, or was Mr Aberdeen breaking that news to her at the 29th of March? Uh, well, uh, uh, the... The first confirmation, I mean, anything I've said today, as I've said a number of times, I've got documentary evidence for, or evidence for, uh, the, well, there's no dubiety about it. So uh, I know that Nicola Sturgeon knew about the complaints process at the meeting on the 29th of March, because I was told so by Jeff Aberdeen, who told her a meeting arranged for that purpose. Whether she had any prior knowledge of it, I cannot say, uh, but I know that she knew on the 29th of March. Does it strike you as odd, as somebody who has described herself um, as being somebody as close to you for 30 years um, as anyone else, uh, within her family, practically, a, a, a strong personal ally of practically a generation, um, that if she's learning this um, huge news about your personal life, about the investigation that is happening under her own government into you, um, if, if, if she was to, as she suggests, um, just find out at that time or on the 2nd of April, um, do you not think that the reaction would have left a mark, that she would have remembered those occasions? Well, I think that's a, a question you should, uh, oh, okay. you should direct at, uh, quite, uh, yeah. at Nicola when you, when, you, when you see her next week. All I can say is that the meeting on the 29th of March was not impromptu, was yeah. not accidental, was not uh, a popping her head round the door. It was a meeting arranged for that purpose, and the meeting on the 2nd of April was not popping in yeah. to Nicola and Peter's home. It was a meeting arranged for that purpose. Thank you. That's very helpful. And on the meet I want to turn to the meeting of the 2nd of April. And the First Minister says in her written <clears throat> evidence to this committee that she agreed to meet you for two reasons. The first was personal and the second was political. The first was um, she understood you to be in a state of profound distress around the news that she thought you were going to give her at the meeting. Um, and the second one uh, it was that she thought you were going to resign your party membership and that she would have to prepare the party for that eventuality. She, she had that um, belief. And this is why I asked you about resignation before in respect of the Edinburgh Airport meeting. Because if, if that's not a reaction you're given to, if that's not something um, you would react in a normal way to that kind of allegation, why would she believe that you were going to resign from the party um, for a set of allegations she hadn't even well, professes to not even heard about. What, what do you think she believes <clears throat> well, happened I, there? I, I don't know. I, I, my own view is that insofar as the Edinburgh Airport thing was important, it was important on the impact it may or may not have had in the permanent sector. It, it's not a, uh, it was not, as I now know and can confirm, a matter of any consequence. And I don't think anybody was actually thinking about it by the, the time we got to the... Uh, uh, the following April, certainly, uh, certainly I wasn't. Uh, as far as the resignation from the party, right? Well, let's consider the circumstances. Uh, I had uh, received the seventh of March the the indication from the permanent secretary that there was an investigation launched against me. 
uh, I, with my council and advisors, was looking away for why this could be uh, done properly, amicably, uh, and certainly confidentially, not just in my interest, but in the interests, as was said before, of complainants and everybody else with a, an ounce of sense. What possible purpose could resignation from the SNP contribute uh, to that uh, <laughs> to that situation. I mean, a, a public resignation of me from the SNP at that stage would have been regarded as uh, astounding news, and, and it would be the diametric opposite of what uh, I was trying to achieve. So I had no thought of resignation whatsoever. It never entered my mind at that stage. Why should it? It was the diametric opposite of what uh, I was trying to achieve. I was trying to find a proper, considered uh, response to a situation, some of which I couldn't understand because I had no idea where that policy had come from. It was, in that sense, a bolt from the blue. Uh, but certainly resignation from the SNP never entered my head. So just to confirm, neither you nor any of your lieutenants had let um, the First Minister or any of her private office <clears throat> know there was a suggestion that that was on the table? Well, when you're under a committee, you speak for yourself. Yeah. I had not indicated to anyone at that time that I was yeah. about to resign that's to the Scottish helpful. National Party. And, uh, you yeah, know, I'm here under oath telling the truth, and that's what I'll do. But uh, yeah, I think I would have, uh, just as I said, appealed to sort of a rational appraisal of that. Uh, a resignation from the SNP would achieve the diametric opposite of what uh, I, I was looking and hoped could be achieved. Thank you. I'd like to move to the 2nd of April, and this is critical, because um, the First Minister's <clears throat> version of events is diametrically opposed to yours and other people's version of events of what happened at that meeting and the revelation of, um, uh, firstly, the fact of the investigation, um, that that was the first time that she'd learned of it, um, and secondly, that whether she was going to help you or not. Um, and this is critical because it speaks to the ministerial code, a possible breach of ministerial code, which if found to have happened and she'd misled Parliament, then she would be required to resign. Can I ask you, um, when you attended the meeting, you met with her in private mm -hmm. for a period. Mm -hmm. Um, would you please tell us um, a, a brief summary of what, how that discussion went? Well, we, we discussed uh, uh, the situation. We discussed the, uh, what uh, I'd been sent, which was not comprehensive, but uh, uh, had, uh, had some detail in it. There was no suggestion that uh, you know, she was surprised and astounded at what the meeting was for. But the meeting was for that purpose. Uh, we went through that. I was looking for the options that we had, uh, and uh, as, a, as we've already discussed, the, the one that we'd centred on as being proper and a reasonable thing to suggest, and incidentally proper for the, the First Minister, uh, was a, a mediation policy which was absent from the policy we'd seen for no apparent reason. Uh, and for the reasons I detailed in my uh, submission, that, that was something I thought Nicola could and should go ahead with. Uh, the indication she gave me is that she was willing to do that, uh, but she wanted an appropriate time. <clears throat> Her difficulty wasn't in intervening. It was that she didn't want to initiate it with the Permanent Secretary as opposed to waiting till the Permanent Secretary uh, came to her. Uh, and that was the distinction she was drawing. Uh, but she gave me every indication, as I would have expected, uh, from somebody I'd known over that period of time, that if it was proper to assist, that she would do so. And I felt the mediation proposal was a proper thing to ask for two reasons. One, because it should have been in the policy and wasn't. And secondly, as I've explained in my submission, that <clears throat> over and above any other duties, uh, a First Minister has a, an obligation to make sure their government is acting lawfully. Obviously, my council came with me uh, for that purpose to, even at an early stage, point out the manifest difficulties with the procedure which we were, were undertaking. It should be said that uh, at the meeting, Nicola didn't show a, a great knowledge of the procedure itself. Um, I mean, she was, she was quite vague about where it had come from. Can I ask, sorry to interrupt, <coughs> um, during that discussion, you've already said to Ms Bailey that the <coughs> name of one of the complainers was intimated to you and <coughs> three other people. Um, did that, the name of that complainer come up in that discussion? I, I think it did, but it, but it wasn't uh, introduced into the, into the, uh, the, the position <coughs> because it had been told to uh, Mr Aberdeen before then. 
So you think it did come up in the discussion? Uh, the I think one? it did, but I, I, yeah. it's not. Uh, it wasn't. It's not opinion. something I've, I've you know, tried to recollect because, and the reason for not trying to recollect it is because I, I know the, the name of, as we discussed earlier, the name of the complainer, was given to me, offered to me by Mr. Aberdeen, who'd got it from uh, a senior government uh, official. Uh, let's see, about two weeks previously, slightly more than that. So the, the, what didn't come up as an issue because uh, it was already known. Yeah, which is surprising um, because yesterday in Parliament, in First Minister's questions, um, she said that she didn't believe that you had been passed the name of a complainer. So, so I, I do find that surprising. We'll take that up with the First Minister herself. I just have a couple more questions, um, Convener. So you clearly indicate from... WhatsApp exchange messages on the 1st and 3rd of June in 2018 that you'd left the meeting on the 2nd of April with that impression that she was going to assist you. Um, but then also in those messages, it's clear that she changed her mind. Um, how did she communicate that to you? And, and what did you think was going to happen and then she withdraw in terms of an offer? Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any communication with Nicola beyond the phone calls and the text uh, WhatsApp messages. Uh, that are detailed to you. So <clears throat> you have everything yeah. that there is to have apart from the, the phone calls. As you can see from the, the messages, it, it was something of a surprise to me uh, when uh, she said that, you know, uh, I've said I'm not going to intervene. And I, I say back to her, that's not my recollection of, of what your position was. That was a surprise and a disappointment and, and obviously felt to me yeah. like a, a substantial and disappointing change in her position. Uh, why I wasn't uh, I wasn't sure, but uh, but it certainly was a, a change in a change in her position. In her view, absolutely. And and one final area, um, convener, just back uh, another aspect of the second of April. While you were there, do you mm. recall Peter Murrell arriving home? No, I uh, I I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. I was told because uh, I was on my uh, I was on my way to America. And I was I got to get I got dropped off at Glasgow Airport. Uh, I and I, I think we were in a taxi. I'm not. I think it definitely was a taxi actually. Uh, and on the way to Glasgow Airport, we discussed that uh, Peter had uh, had arrived, uh, uh, but I hadn't seen him, so I, I didn't know that had happened. I was told on the way to the airport. And final final question on this <laughs> convener. So was, sorry, it, it, I should oh. just say there was no surprise to me that Peter wasn't there because of the nature of what we were discussing. Because you believed it was government business. Well, I, I knew it was about the complaints the that had been made against me. There was no other uh, agenda or business that I was aware of. And uh, yeah. And I, as I say, it, it's not a, it's not a, the geography, apart from anything else, dictates I wasn't just popping in. And if this had been a meeting to help the First Minister prepare herself and the mm. party for either the impact of the investigations, the revelations around them, and or your resignation, as she suggests, it was, would you have expected Peter Morrill to know about that, to have some involvement in that, even join the meeting? Well, yes, but it wasn't, so it wasn't a surprise to me that, uh, uh, that he, he, he wasn't there. And uh, the, uh, so Peter's non-attendance wasn't a surprise because I knew what the, what the meeting was about. I'll pause there, Convener, thank you. Okay, Martin Fraser. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if I can just follow up um, just a couple of the points mm. that Mr. Cole Hamilton put to you, and then perhaps ask you something else briefly. But um, I just want to be, be, be clear about uh, the version of events, particularly in relation to the meeting on the 29th of March that Mr. Cole Hamilton mm. has, has referred to. Um, you've set out your position. You, you say in your written evidence that, uh, and, and I quote, you know, quoting from your written evidence uh, about. Um, the uh, First Minister's version of events. In fact, well, in fact, you're referring to the meeting here, second of April, that the, the First Minister's claim is wholly false. Now, you know, Nicola Sturgeon was somebody who you worked with very closely over a long period of time. Mm. She was your deputy when you were First Minister and succeeded you as First Minister and leader of the SNP. She has said this week, and you will have seen her, her public statements on the matter, that uh, the claims you're making are untrue, that you have no evidence to support them. In effect, she is denouncing you as a liar and a fantasist, are you? Well, uh, what I would say is, uh, given some of the things that have been said about me this week, uh, uh, I don't think you have to add more. Uh, there's there's uh, plenty have been said. 
The key thing is the evidence. Uh, now, I've already expressed my and I assume your frustration that uh, there's some evidence in this is not available to you. Uh, but there is no doubt, uh, and it is absolutely certain, that the meeting on the 29th of March in the Scottish Parliament uh, was prearranged for the express purpose of Nicola being briefed in the situation with regard to me and complaints, and the meeting on the 2nd of April arose from the meeting, or the final arrangements for it at least, were, re were arose from the meeting of the, of the 29th of March. Otherwise, how on earth would I have known to, uh, to turn up on the 2nd of April? There's no other way the invitation could be gathered. Uh, as to why the meeting of the 29th of March was for a substantial period of time, if we remember effectively written out of history, and I know that some people say, well, what difference does four days make? The difference is, of course, if the meeting of the 29th of March is admitted, and indeed the subject matter is admitted, then it makes it very difficult to argue that the meeting of the 2nd of April was on party business as opposed to government business. Uh, and all I would say is that that meeting uh, was, in Nicola's terms, forgotten about. But she says she was reminded of it in late January 2019 or early February 2019 in evidence to the committee. If that were the case, then under the ministerial code, the correct thing to do would have been to correct the record as timorously as possible as opposed to waiting 18 months till Sky News broadcast it, eh, as is what actually happened. Eh, I'm here under my oath, and I'm giving you the, the explanation under my oath. That is what happened from my belief. Eh, the one thing I would add, and be quite clear about this, that many of the attacks on uh, Nicola in regard to this were about how she was trying to intervene in my favour or or whatever. I think there was nothing, and I've said so in my evidence, would have been improper with the intervention I was asking her to make. I mean, I'm well aware of what the Ministerial Code says. I was hoping that she would report to the Permanent Secretary uh, what I'd said, uh, as the Ministerial Code would indicate, because I could not believe that arbitration, or rather, I beg your pardon, I could not believe that uh, mediation would not be properly part of the policy and that might be a, a, a route forward. Uh, so I, I don't share the view that it would have been improper for, for Nicola to intervene. On the contrary, if a, if a First Minister hears a substantive danger that uh, their government might be drifting into illegality or that something significant has been left out of a policy, then my view is that is a perfectly proper intervention to make. Thank you. But can, can I press you on this point? Because it is of fundamental importance to the issue of whether the ministerial code was broken by the First Minister or not, because she has one version of events, and you have a directly contrary version of events, and she has asked you to produce the evidence. Now, you've said to us there is, you have no doubt that your version of events is correct, but where is the evidence? Who, who can corroborate your version of events? Well, I'm not the only one who knew about the, the meeting of well, the, well, who the, else did? the 29th of March. It, it, it was known about certainly by Duncan Hamilton, it was known about by Kevin Pringle, I believe, uh, and I mean, Mr Aberdeen didn't uh, just tell me. I mean, obviously, Mr Hamilton went with us uh, in the 2nd of April, so he knew about the, the meeting, the fact it had been arranged. So, in terms of exact evidence, uh, the, the people who turned up at the meeting knew. So, that's corroboration. But in terms of the breach of ministerial code, uh, I would have thought... Uh, either the explanation breaches the ministerial code, because either uh, the meeting on the 29th of March wasn't forgotten about and Parliament was deliberately misled, or alternatively, it was forgotten about and Parliament wasn't informed when she was reminded of it. Now, you know, my submission to the ministerial code says these are, to me, clear breaches of the ministerial code. What happens as a result is not for me. It's for this committee, it's for Mr James Hamilton, it's for others. All I can do is come here and tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, with the frustration, of course, that we all know there is evidence in terms of uh, March 2018, which this committee is prohibited from hearing. 
We can, of course, ask Mr Hamilton and Mr Pringle and Mr Aberdeen their version of events, and, and we may well uh, pursue that. Can I just ask the Convener a couple more questions? Well, as I understood it, you had Mr Aberdeen's version of events in Evans. Yes, we did. Perhaps I should move on, uh, Convener. Um, you allege in your uh, evidence you've given us, the written evidence, that there is a conspiracy. You don't use the term <coughs> conspiracy, but you say the evidence supports a deliberate, prolonged, malicious and concerted effort amongst a range of individuals within the Scottish Government and the SNP to damage my reputation, even to the extent of having me imprisoned. And you name, as part of that conspiracy, Peter Murrell, Ian McCann, mm. Sue Riddick and Liz Lloyd. Why would these people conspire against you? I believe the motivation uh, for furnishing complaints to the police uh, was initially uh, to defeat uh, the judicial review by having it postponed. Uh, I think it came to be believed that, uh, among some people that uh, the loss of the judicial review, the loss of a court case, would be cataclysmic, uh, not just for uh, Leslie Evans, not just for senior officials, in the, uh, in the Scottish Government uh, and special advisers, but would be cataclysmic for, uh, for Nicola Sturgeon herself. And I, I think, unfortunately, uh, people came to the belief that the police process would somehow assist in, firstly, not losing the judicial review and thereafter making sure that the loss of the judicial review was uh, swept away in the inevitable publicity of the criminal trial. And if I had been convicted of any offence in the criminal trial, that would have been the case. Uh, now, and you ask for evidence. Well, in the document I provided to you, in this committee, uh, making the point about the investigative function, the, uh, uh, Barbara Allison was asked, would it be proper for the Scottish Government to be, uh, uh, to be uh, contacting people uh, whether you describe it as contact or a fishing expedition or whatever, after the police investigation started. Uh, and Ms Allison quite rightly said, no, that would be totally improper. Once the police investigation starts, it's a matter for the police. But I've provided you with an email which shows that was happening. And the name at the bottom of that is Barbara Allison. And incidentally, I don't believe that Barbara Allison was a witting uh, part of, uh, of a malicious plan. I think uh, I know she was given that information by a special advisor to, to write unsolicited. A day later, uh, Ms Riddick writes, and I'll fall, she provided uh, with a, a letter from the SNP. The person concerned had never been an SNP member. Uh, we have a statement from that person, which was uh, given to us for uh, the purposes of, uh, of my defence. Uh, you have the evidence put in by Anne Harvey. And the significance of the evidence of Anne Harvey is twofold. One, that the email she's provided is contemporary. This is a senior official in the SNP Whip's office at Westminster, a lawyer, an officer of the court, who's asked for names, refuses to provide them, because she says, in terms of her professional responsibility, she's not going to participate in a witch hunt. This is not something she's describing now after the event. This is something she was describing in late August 2018. These things were going on after the police investigation started. In terms of what's in the public domain, uh, then can I, I point out that uh, in the criminal trial, uh, my counsel read out a message from a complainant refusing to go to a meeting with a senior official because she was beginning to be feel pressurised rather than supported. In Sky Television, I, I've seen an account of a text message of uh, the importance of getting another complainant back in the, the game uh, from uh, Ms Riddick. Uh, I've seen uh, reported and in the public domain a, a text message which says that if the police can't find the evidence, if it felt like telling them what they need and I'll get it for them, uh, and, uh, of course, again, at the trial, a text message was read out saying, I have a plan by which we can remain anonymous. Now, these are 
things material which are in the public domain. There are also material, which, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, were said before they came into the public domain did not exist, or their bona fides were questions, which, of course, was the first response to the pressurising the police uh, and all fronts, uh, issue for more fronts to fight on. That was the first response. It can't possibly be true, but they are true. The messages are real. Uh, these messages are in the public domain. The evidence uh, from Anne Harvey and of the emails which I provided you with is before this committee. And there is much more evidence that I would dearly love uh, to provide to this committee if I wasn't under an injunction in terms of section 162 that I'm not allowed to provide to a parliamentary committee uh, evidence which was disclosed to me as part of the criminal proceedings. And like in all things, I've abided by the legal advice and I must follow that stricture. Even though, as I noted earlier, as First Minister who introduced Section 162, it was never designed for that purpose. It was designed to stop witness statements being used by drug dealers or whatever to pressurise witnesses. It was designed to stop witness statements uh, uh, coming or being discovered in skips across Scotland. It was part of Lord Coolsfield's report in 2007 about the handling of information. It was never, ever designed to prevent information coming to a committee of this parliament. And its use in that fashion by the Crown Office is a beyond belief and totally and utterly disgraceful. Just, just two more brief questions, Camino. Yes, could, could I ask, um, please, Mr. Salmon, to um, not go back to the criminal <clears throat> trial, but to stick to the remit of this committee, please. I understand well, I... that you think a lot of these things are peripheral, and I, I let you answer that question in full because it's obviously important to you and important to members of this committee. But if we could just bear in mind from now on that we should be sticking within remit. Thank you. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll follow your, uh, your, your advice, Convener. The, the, well, I'll follow your orders uh, in terms of uh, the position. Uh, just to say, I mean, the evidence coming to this committee is relevant to this committee. Uh, the origins of the, the evidence are maybe out of scope, but the evidence, if it's relevant to this committee, is, is relevant. That's the, the point I'm, I'm making. And not, not, yes, Mr Salmond. I mean, um, clearly and obviously you're correct. The committee's remit is not to rerun the criminal trial or to yes. question the verdict of a jury. Mr uh, Salmond, I, I understand what you're saying, but we also have a policy of taking evidence, which is that the evidence comes in and we decide our publication policy. And that's what we do so to talk beyond some of the evidence that we have published can become problematic in terms of our remit. As I said, I was content to let you finish answering that question because it was important to you to get that on record and it's important to committee members to hear that. I just want to give a warning as to where we go from here. And then I'll follow your guidance. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Camina. Um, just to go back to my previous question, Mr Salmon. You name in your evidence four senior figures within the SNP, including the Chief Executive, who of course is married to the First Minister, and the First Minister's Chief of Staff. Do you believe the First Minister herself played any role in this? Well, as I've said, uh, Mr Fraser, everything I've said in the evidence I've submitted to you can be backed up by documentary evidence. So every statement I make, uh, and therefore, since I don't have documentary evidence which suggests that the First Minister uh, has text messages or, or any other piece of information which involve the First Minister, then I haven't made that, uh, that accusation. Uh, that is because I decided uh, quite uh, properly, I think, only to make statements that could be backed up by documentary evidence. Can I also, also say that you, you mentioned earlier, you said, look, you've never mentioned the word conspiracy. That's for the same reason. It's the easiest thing in the world, and it's been done over the last few days, to say something is a conspiracy, is a conspiracy theory. Uh, the reason I've described this in the way I've done, uh, as a malicious scheme or plan or campaign over a prolonged period of time involving the people I've named, is precisely because there is documentary evidence which substantiates that. And that's not a theory, it's not a, a, a point that can't be established. 
it is a point that can be established from the documentary evidence. So it's more than just terminology and people's ability to dismiss it. What it is, is saying what can be verified uh, by documentary evidence. And the only question is how much documentary evidence this committee is allowed to see. Thank you. Um, Convener, my final question. Um, Mr Salmon, you conclude your um, written evidence to us of the 17th of February by saying this. Uh, the real cost of the Scottish people runs into many millions of pounds, and yet no one in this entire process has uttered the simple words which are necessary on occasions to renew and refresh democratic institutions. I resign. Who should resign? I think the people responsible for the disaster of the judicial review, I think uh, the, in terms of the Scottish Government, the Crown Office, uh, and in, in terms of the, the overall uh, approach, the people who are responsible should resign. The people I've named, uh, uh, as I have the evidence for their behaviour, uh, they should be all considering their, uh, their positions. Uh, yeah, well, as I said in January, I mean, the Permanent Secretary, and I think I say it in my evidence, I mean, I, to my knowledge, Cabinet Ministers uh, thought she should have resigned on January the 8th, 2019. I, I, I can't think many people wouldn't have thought that would have been an appropriate thing to do. Yes, she should have considered her position then, and no doubt she can wait the, the findings of this, uh, of this inquiry. But uh, yeah, and if you're asking my opinion, yes, she should. Lord Advocate. I think the Lord Advocate should be considering his position for this and a, a, a range of other issues. The, the issue here is that uh, it's an argument as to whether there's an institutional failure. Uh, many people uh, whose opinions might be close to yours, much closer to, to yours uh, uh, than mine, have been using this argument to say, ah, the institutions, there's something wrong with them. The, the, the Scotland is almost a failed state. Uh, that's not a view I take. I, I take the view that the institutions fundamentally are sound, but there has to be some form of political responsibility. You know, uh, institutions have to be refreshed from time to time. And one of the things in public policy is when a, an issue like this arises of the extent it arises, that people have to take the consequences. If they don't take the consequences, then the institution itself comes under question. The, Scottish Government, in terms of the administration of civil service, needs new leadership. So does the Crown Office. And in terms of the, of the people I name, because I have the documentary evidence to establish uh, what they were involved in, then they should be facing the consequences as well. But in terms of the institutions of Scotland, I think they're absolutely sound. And what it needs is public accountability and facing up to the extent of what has been demonstrated by this uh, extraordinary affair. If the First Minister has broken the Ministerial Code, should she resign? Not for me. I, I believe the First Minister has broken the Ministerial Code, but the, the, you know, that is a finding that can be discussed, at least by this committee, uh, by Mr James Hamilton. It's not the case that every Minister who breaks the Ministerial Code resigns. I mean, your own uh, party would have a, an example of that relatively recently. Uh, it depends on what is found and, and the, the degree by which the ministerial code has been broken. I've got no doubt that Nicola has broken the ministerial code, but it's not for me to suggest the concept, what the consequences should be. It's for the, the people who are judging that, including this committee. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Salmond, <clears throat> earlier on um, you spoke about the discussion that you had with uh, Nicola Sturgeon uh, at her home. Uh, and uh, you indicated also that, uh, that at some point afterwards that, uh, that Nicola Sturgeon uh, had seemed to have kind of changed her opinion. Uh, can you remember what was actually said uh, at the meeting in terms of what you said to, to Nicola Sturgeon and what she said to you to give you uh, an indication that, uh, that she was looking to assist or help? Uh, there, no doubt uh, the, the people at the meeting uh, that uh, Mr Aberdeen and Mr, uh, Mr Hamilton and they, they were there uh, and certainly Mr Hamilton was there when I when N Nicola said that and she said it in the private meeting to, to me as well that she was anxious to assist but of course it's not I don't have to remember it it's in the uh, it's in the whatsapp messages that, that you have as a committee that uh, uh, when I I'm surprised by Nicola's uh, response, uh, and I, I say to her, look, that's not mine. I'm, I was being, uh, because obviously I was looking for, for Nicola's friendship and assistance uh, quite properly. Uh, when I say in the, 
message you have before you of the 3rd of June 2018, my recollection of our Monday the 2nd of April meeting was rather different. You wanted to assist, but then decide against the intervention to help resolve the position amicably. Now it's different, and that's when we go on to the judicial review. Uh, the, I believed it was a substantial change, as this indicates, in Nicola's position, and I was extremely disappointed. However, uh, I thought there were other possibilities. Uh, I, and obviously we, we've discussed arbitration, and that came uh, later in the, in the discussion. Uh, so that was the, the, the purpose. But I was extremely disappointed because I thought that at that stage that mediation was an entirely proper thing to suggest, and I thought that Nicola could entirely properly support it for the reasons I've already given. And I simply don't have any time for the idea that it's impossible for First Ministers in terms of the Ministerial Code to make proper interventions. I mean, the first thing you should do if you get contacted on a, an issue of government policy is you should contact the, the civil service, tell them, in this case the permanent secretary, and my assumption is not only was I suggesting Nicola should do it, but that was the right thing for Nicola to do. She obviously took a different opinion, but she changed her mind. Well, thank you for that. But can you remember exactly what was said uh, at the meeting uh, that gave you the indication that, that Nicola Sturgeon would have intervened as you had requested? She wanted to assist. She said, I, um, I want to assist. There was a discussion about how she could do it. So the discussion wasn't whether she wanted to help. It was about what were the circumstances which would enable her to do it. And she wanted, as, she, uh, as the discussion with the permanent secretary, to come to her or to find a... Uh, an occasion by which they could adduce I found this rather puzzling because it's not the relationship that I had with my permanent secretaries. That, uh, you know, so, but that was, it wasn't a discussion about whether she was going to help in the 2nd of April. It was how she could best do it. That was the discussion. That's why I was so disappointed in the message I've just read out to you. Okay, thank you. I've got one more question. It's in a different area, convener. No, just... Yeah, I could just okay. OK, thank you. Um, certainly, earlier on today, uh, and also in your evidence, uh, uh, discussed about a number of um, employees and associates, and certainly in your evidence, you, you seem to consider instances of people uh, reaching out to employees and associates to offer support on the, on the subject of sexual harassment as evidence of a fishing exercise. Mm. And do you think that it's actually perfectly reasonable for political employers, whether it's the SNP or the Labour Party or Lib Dems or Conservatives or Greens, do not think it's actually imperative upon the political parties to actually reach out to uh, their uh, current staff members and, uh, and former staff members? Certainly, as a, uh, certainly, they would have that duty of care uh, to them. And the, uh, bearing in mind also kind of what was going on uh, at the time with, with society, and do you not think that it's actually it was the right thing for certainly for the uh, for the SNP to do to engage with uh, their staff? Uh, yes, I do, but that is not what I'm suggesting, Mr. McMillan. Uh, I, I made the point that the police investigation started, if I remember right, on the 25th of August and was publicly announced. At the point. Uh, police investigation starts, they are the investigatory authority. I'm not talking about reaching out to people. And Peter Murrow, in his evidence, gave the, a, the not the impression, I think he gave it to the committee, the, the email that went out from Nicola Sturgeon to all party members a, towards late August uh, a, 2018. What he didn't give this committee was the email that went out from Susan Ruddock, a, not on uh, to a, all party members, but to selected members of staff and former members of staff. Uh, <clears throat> I could produce for this committee member, many members of staff who didn't receive this email. Uh, it uh, didn't go to people who were known to be close to me or worked in my office. Now, you'd think if you had a duty of care, these are exactly the people you'd be sending a, an email to. But the primary point is this. This is taking place after the police investigation has started. Uh, and secondly, the response from Anne Harvey, as I say, a solicitor, officer of the court to it, she had no, no misunderstanding or no uh, appreciation that it was anything other than she, what she described, her words, as a witch hunt. Uh, and she described it at that time. And nothing more important than the understanding 
that once the police are doing their job, they should be left to get on with it. They shouldn't be pressurised. Uh, they don't need anybody else doing the investigation. They are the competent lawful authority for doing it. Uh, unfortunately, as these emails substantiate, uh, there were people who didn't believe that it should be left like that. Now, you don't need my word for this, because before this committee, when asked, uh, Barbara Allison was asked, would it be proper for the Scottish Government to be doing that after the police investi investigation started? And she said, no. The problem is that they were. And the email you have before you demonstrates that they were. I also know that the former member of staff that she's talking about in that email happened to be a special advisor. I also know that special advisor was given the, was given the, the details, which in itself is a question uh, of the person concerned by a um, significant person in the Scottish National Party. Uh, that should not be happening, Mr McMillan. That is totally out of order. But can I tell you that the information I would like to bring to this committee goes way, way beyond that. Okay, thank you. Thank you right, can we go now, please, to Jackie Bailey? Thank you very much, convener. Um, Mr. Salmon, have you covered in your response to Murdo, Murdo Fraser all the text messages that are in the public domain? Uh, I've, yes, I, the, the reason that I covered these ones is precisely because they're in the public domain. That's because, yeah. as you know, uh, uh, Section 162 has further clauses which, which exclude things that are in the public domain. For, for example, this committee was able to consider the, the messages that were mentioned earlier precisely because they ended up in the public domain. And once they were in the public domain, could be properly, and the same provision applies. Uh, I'm restricted under legal advice and under pain of, uh, of prosecution by the, uh, the Crown Office not to tell you messages which are not in the public domain, but equally I can. And I pointed out that, uh, uh, never mind the ones that are not in the public domain, there is a substantial body of evidence that we can speak about. OK, thank you very much. Can I just check that I've got my timeline right? So you were told by the Permanent Secretary on the 7th of March 2018 that there were complaints against you. Um, you were told by Jeff Aberdeen um, following a meeting he had about complaints against you, and that was on the 9th of March you were told by him. Was that also the date you were told the name of one of the complainers? And then the meeting between the First Minister and Jeff Aberdeen on the 29th of March you were saying was pre-arranged. Have I got all of that right? Yeah, the, the one thing I'd say, the, the meeting, the, sorry, the, the telephone conversation on the 9th of March with, uh, with my former Chief of Staff, I was in a car with other people uh, and I did no talking whatsoever. Uh, I can't be absolutely sure because I spoke to him again and about four days later on the 13th of March, uh, whether it was on the 9th of March or the 13th of March, he told me the name of, uh, of one of the complainants because he'd been told by a, a, a government official. Uh, but he's, what I can be absolutely certain of is he told me, uh, uh, whether it was in the 9th or the 13th, uh, that uh, Jeff Aberdeen told me the name because he'd been given it by the government official. Okay. <coughs> so clearly before the 2nd of April, um, when you were going to visit the First Minister in her home, you knew um, that there were complaints against you and you knew the name of one of the complainants. You've already established with other colleagues that you weren't resigning from the SNP. So when Peter Murrell said it was a government matter and Nicola Sturgeon said it was a party matter, it would appear that Peter Murrell was right on this occasion. It, it was a, a government matter. It was about the complaints okay. against me. There's no okay. doubt about that. So can I ask you again, as a former First Minister, if you were approached by a political colleague as you approached Nicola Sturgeon um, on the 2nd of April, would you have notified the civil service? Uh, well, in the circumstances and, uh, that uh, were there, I would have gone to the permanent secretary. Uh, uh, OK. And uh, that's obviously what I was urging or asking Nicola to, to do or seriously consider. Or, and and I'm, I was obviously disappointed that she couldn't, she couldn't uh, see that was the way forward. And I wouldn't have asked her to do it if I didn't believe it was totally legitimate. You can see the, from the, the WhatsApp messages, I, I tried to argue that this was the, 
legitimate thing to do. It not, I wasn't asking her to out with the ministerial code because I, I don't see there's anything in the ministerial code that prohibits uh, Nicola from doing what I asked her to do. What I, what I think there is in the ministerial code uh, a great deal of uh, information that uh, that if you are told by uh, seriously that your government may be drifting into illegality, you're meant to do something about it, and that is specific. Okay. Well, whether let let me drive home my point. Whether she intended to help you or not, by the conclusion of the meeting, there was no doubt what you were there for and what you were discussing. So at that point, is there a requirement by the Ministerial Code that she should report that to the Permanent Secretary? Because it potentially was a conflict of interest on her part. Well, yes, um, to, she certainly should report it to the, uh, to the Civil Service. In this case, I would say the Permanent Secretary because of the, the, the nature, yes. Okay, so failure to report it would be a breach of the Ministerial Code? I, I, I think that's in my evidence. That, uh, it's, it's not, the, in my view, it's, the, it's not the... the uh, it wouldn't have been the intervention that's the, uh, that's the breach, because I think the intervention is perfectly proper if it had taken place. It's the, the failure to report that, that is a breach. Yeah. It's okay. a non-intervention, if you like. So, so the First Minister offered to intervene, according to, to you. Is it... That... She said uh, when it was the appropriate time, when, when the, as I say, the conversation was not about if she'd intervene, but when. Uh, and Nicola's uh, anxiety was that uh, she wanted to, per wanted to find a situation where uh, the permanent sector came to her or a suitable, a suitable moment to do it. But uh, there was no doubt that uh, I, I believe she was going to uh, assist in that direction in what I believe was a perfectly proper purpose of, uh, of securing mediation. Okay. Can I ask you, was that just a conversation between you and her, or can anybody else substantiate that? I am absolutely certain that Duncan Hamilton was present when we were discussing that. I can't be absolutely certain about uh, anybody else, but I, I know that, uh, that uh, Duncan was there, because as my counsel, obviously, when we were talking after the meeting, uh, and assessing what was happening, we, we both were of the opinion that the intervention was going to be made and, and we, we thought the meeting had gone extremely well. So therefore, I absolutely know that uh, that uh, was then and is now, presumably, his recollection. Okay. Can I ask you then, could, there was contact by telephone, I think on the 23rd of April, there were messages from, from the First Minister to you on the 1st of June, um, you messaged her on the 3rd of June, and 7th of June you had a meeting in Aberdeen. Why did the First Minister wait until June before reporting this contact to the Civil Service? Now, that's a, a question you should direct to the, the First Minister. Okay. As a former First Minister, when would you have reported the contact to the Civil well, Service? Well, I, I, obviously I'm not a partial observer of this. Uh, if, if somebody had come to me, let's put it this way, if Nicola had come to me in similar circumstances, hopefully we wouldn't have been in the, uh, the problem for a policy which was misdirected for some reason because hopefully we wouldn't have had a misdirected policy but if we had and these things happen that come to me then I would have uh, uh, I would have intervened in that direction because I could see from the ministerial code it was perfectly proper to do so my view is that uh, there are times as first minister of times in life that you cannot uh, uh, assist your associates because it's diametrically opposed to, to, to something which you have to abide by because you've uh, pledged the allegiance to and all ministers have to pledge allegiance to the ministerial code. But if there is, within that code, the proper reason for doing something, then you would do it. Certainly I would, and I suspect you would as well. It's a long time since I've been a minister. I can remember it, though. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you one last question. Um, it, Given your knowledge of the Ministerial Code, is it not the case, if you are misleading Parliament and you don't take the opportunity to correct it, it is automatic that it is a resignation matter? Yeah, the, the two things are a bit different. For the, uh, there have been uh, there are very, very few occasions of somebody established as misleading Parliament who hasn't uh, resigned. Uh, other breaches of the Ministerial Code, which would probably include uh, a, a, the time of a correction, would be a breach, but it's not as open and shut as whether that's a resignation matter. I mean, it's, uh, these things are movable goal. But the, the generally applied uh, position is if you have knowingly misled Parliament, 
then, then you would resign. It's not as clear as if it's inadvertent, but certainly not reporting an inadvertent misleading would be as serious. Whether that's a resignation matter, as I said earlier to Mr Fraser, is for others to judge. Thank you. And uh, now move on to Alistair Allen, please. Thank you very much, convener. Um, as you know, Mr Salmon, we've been looking at uh, mountains of evidence about this over the last few months. Um, I think there's probably, although I don't want to try and speak for the whole committee, quite a lot of agreement about the shambolic nature of, of some of the elements or some of the, the ways in which um, parts of this whole story were, were handled. Um, however, your written statement to the committee and some of what you've said today goes a great deal further than that and names a large number of people, uh, including the Crown Office. I just want to ask, I appreciate you, you've set out some of the reasons why you feel frustrated about evidence being publishable and so forth. But I just wonder if you also appreciate our predicament, which is that in our report that we produce, we have to rely on evidence. And, and do you understand why evidence is required for some of the statements that you've made? Well, the, uh, any statement I've made is evidenced by evidence you have. I've brought forward the, the evidence which demonstrates that after the police investigation had started, others in government and the SNP were taking on, interfering, if you like, with that investigatory function. Uh, they, I mean, they, the email from uh, Ms Allison is quite specific about me. Uh, the, uh, so that is pretty strong evidence. Uh, I brought forward evidence from Anne Harvey, uh, which is strengthened by the fact it's contemporary, and an affidavit which has been much redacted, but nonetheless you have, uh, which uh, supports that. So both in the contemporary sense from August 2018 and her reaction now, uh, then uh, you can see that. That is evidence that has been, has been brought forward. Uh, there are, let's see, six text messages which we have referred to, which are in the public domain, some of which you have in evidence before this committee. You have the, uh, the ones that were, were, were read out earlier. Uh, you have the uh, lost the battle, win the war text message. Uh, I, made, I made the point that both of these were denied uh, until, of course, they came into the public domain and before this committee. And I've read you out today uh, another four messages which are in the public domain elsewhere, including two which were at the criminal trial. Uh, now, that is a substantial body of evidence. Uh, in terms of the section 162 and what it's applied, being applied. I'm afraid I, I, I don't uh, think this committee is helpless and I don't think it should be helpless. Uh, that is a misapplication of a, a section in an act. I was first minister, Mr. McCaskill was justice secretary. Frank Mulholland was, uh, was Lord Advocate. Uh, between the three of us, we must know as to what the purpose of that section was. I've pointed out exactly what the purpose it was. It was never, ever to prevent a parliamentary inquiry receiving evidence. And I can, as I pointed out earlier, I think, questioning to, to Andy Whitman, Andy Whitman, that uh, the, this is not just about text messages in the SNP. This is also about government documents that this committee should have seen. You should have seen. I'm not talking just about the external legal advice. I'm talking about documentation that you don't have for about a four-month period uh, between late August 2018 and early January 2019. All the documentation you've got is virtually silent on that entire period. So, you know, I, I don't think a parliamentary committee in these terms is helpless to, to say to the people who are not giving them the evidence, we want to have it. And, of course, um, I think it was offered uh, in one of, I think it was... Uh, I think the evidence session from the investigating officer, uh, she, she was asked that question and said she'd have a look and see if she could find it. Well, I, unless you've got it and not published it, I, I certainly don't see it. So I don't, I don't think you're helpless in this matter. Well, when you mention Section 162, you, you, have, um, you have said that the Crown, specifically the Lord Advocate, has more discretion than has been used uh, on some of these matters, um, to, which would allow to disclose to this committee material uh, which you obtained as part of the criminal trial. Now, you, you've mentioned 
I think you'll mention the 2010 Criminal Justice and Licensing Act, um, which, as you say, was introduced while you were First Minister, um, and you have material in your written evidence in relation to that. I think my question is really that um, if that discretion exists, um, is it not the case that during the, the introduction of that bill, um, the government seemed to rule out introducing a power that would give them such discretion? So when the Act was in draft form, it included a section 100, a provision that explicitly allowed exactly what you seem to be suggesting, the disclosure of evidence to a third party. Um, but on the 4th of May 2010, uh, at stage two of the bill, um, the government removed that section from the bill. Now, without getting drawn too far back into history about all of that, I uh, appreciate. Uh, do you understand why some people do not feel that the Crown has the kind of discretion that you are setting out and suggesting that it does? Well, can I, can I compliment you on your research, uh, uh, Mr Allen? Uh, what I can tell you for an absolute definite that that legislation was constructed in the back of Lord Coolsfield's report of 2007. If you read Lord Coolsfield's report, you'll see exactly what the concern was. The concern was that witness statements were uh, not being kept properly by uh, solicitors. Presumably, at that, in these years, their filing cabinets were, were uh, full up and they were, were appearing in skips all over the country. Uh, and there was also a concern that witness statements might be used for pernicious purposes by uh, by people to get revenge on on people who'd uh, who'd given witness statements. Uh, you, this committee, are not a third party. You are a parliamentary committee. You're a committee of the Scottish Parliament. You're not uh, Joe Soap or Joe Bloggs. You're a committee which uh, is there to to find out and investigate and to, to do it in terms of the duty you have to the people of Scotland. You're not uh, people who are not entitled to receive that information. And you say the Crown hasn't exercised discretion. That has not been the attitude of the Crown. I've got here the letters, three of them that have been written uh, to me and my lawyers. Uh, the first of which provoked by, we offered at the, uh, I think it was the assistant of clerks, that, that we would as opposed to giving you the evidence, it, we would set out which evidence at that stage you didn't have before you as a committee. And what we got from the Crown Office was a letter saying if we did that, they'd prosecute effectively. Uh, then uh, uh, we got a second letter, just in case we hadn't, uh, hadn't appreciated the content of the first letter. And then finally, we got a letter which, uh, uh, which said, even if we responded to a request of the, uh, the, of the clerk, uh, then not only would they consider us for prosecution, but they said anybody using that information would be prosecuted. The only way to read that is this committee. Now, if you think uh, that would happen in terms of reality, I suspect, uh, I suspect it wouldn't. But the degree of effort of the Crown Office to prevent this committee from seeing evidence that it requested, not just SNP text messages, goes beyond any imagination. And then, of course, when they did provide you with messages, they provided you with messages that no committee could ever have published because they were outside your remit. Nothing I have ever asked uh, of evidence to produce it would involve divulging the identity of complainants. The people for which the evidence could come from the SNP were not complainants, and the government documents that are concerned here are matters that this committee should have had by right when you were promised the full cooperation of the government when you establish your proceedings. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. Thank you for your patience, Mr Salmond. Time's moving on. Um, I, I don't want to turn this inquiry into debate about the meaning of legislation, whether the Arbitration Act or the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, but uh, I would just observe, I have section 162 in front of me, and subsection 2 says the accused must not use or disclose the information or anything recorded in other, in a, other than in accordance with subsection 3, and there's nothing in subsection 3 that allows you to disclose that information to a committee of the Scottish Parliament. So we can have a debate about the, the, the actual intention of, of, of that, but the, the actual act as passed seems to be very um, clear. But, well, but, well, I, I was only saying, Mr Whiteman, that, uh, you know, the per it's very unusual to have the person responsible uh, for the, the act sitting in front of you, and uh, therefore it's, it's not just an observation. And I'm sure that uh, 
if he wanted to check the matter with uh, the then Justice Secretary and the then Lord Advocate, they would be able to inform the committee of what the intention was. No, I don't doubt that that may well have been in the intention. All I'm, all I'm doubting is that actual intention never made its way into uh, an enactment. But I also don't deny the fact that the information you're talking about, Scottish Government documents, should be with this committee. I don't doubt that at all. They should be. I have no uh, view on that. Um, can I just go back to your, your mention of the uh, email, um, the, the affidavit of Anne Harvey that you mentioned? Um, you have a view uh, on the purpose of the email from Sue Ruddick, etc. And I don't want to rehearse that. You've made it clear what you believe the purpose is. Um, but I just want to clarify that as a matter of principle, if um, I, for example, were a, a victim of a, um, an alleged uh, uh, crime, and the police were investigating uh, what I'd reported. Do, do you agree that it would be legitimate as a matter of principles, setting aside the exact circumstances of this case, it would be perfectly legitimate for me to contact people who I thought were potentially the victims of the same crime because a police investigation was underway and if they had any complaints, this would be a good opportunity for them to bring it to the attention of the police and make a complaint. That would be, a, in principle, a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Mm, yes, it would. Okay, thanks. Um, can I move on to your... In that case, you wouldn't be the person who was responsible within the, the organisation uh, in terms of doing it. But there's a, obviously a crossover between uh, somebody pursuing uh, complaints and, and somebody who's responsible for, uh, for providing that information in the organisation. No, I, I, I don't understand. Want to... I understand the specifics, you have a different interpretation, of, but that, that's just an in-principle question. Um, in your fourth submission uh, to the committee, on page two, you talk about uh, the parliamentary committee has already heard evidence of activities by civil servants, special advisors, ministers and SNP officials, which taken individually could be put down to incompetence, albeit on an epic scale. However, taken together and over such a prolonged period, it becomes impossible to explain such conduct as inadvertent coincidence. The inescapable conclusion, you say, is a malicious and concerted attempt to damage my reputation and remove me from public life in Scotland. You, you've said that you, everything you say in evidence to us, in written evidence, that you can back up. Can I put it to you that um, there's nothing that we've heard that proves that this, in fact, is the inescapable conclusion. Nevertheless, that such a conclusion may be consistent with these facts, but there's nothing actually that proves it. Would you agree? Uh, no, I, I think the, the reason I set it out like that uh, is, I mean, I can go through the, the various things if you like, but I mean, uh, you know, if I, I suppose if I was to highlight six things to you that you know, uh, one would be the timing of the policy on former ministers and uh, the fact that uh, as uh, has been said earlier that uh, what two days before uh, this policy started to be constructed the, there was the query uh, about uh, Edinburgh Airport uh, I've already said that query came to nothing and understandably so but I don't think that was the reaction of the permanent secretary at the time uh, that was on I think the 6th of November and the 8th and 9th of November of course is the first iterations of any sort of policy from two different civil servants one who said he was starting with a blank sheet of paper but there was another civil servant who also presumably had a blank sheet of paper uh, I'd have thought the the, the open record a uh, meeting of the 29th or 30th of November between the permanent secretary and the first minister is significant basically because up until then, every iteration of the policy placed the, the First Minister uh, in the policy at an early stage. But by the 5th of December, the policy had changed uh, dramatically so that the Permanent Secretary became the, the key decision maker. You, you know, this committee knows, that the Permanent Secretary had knowledge of the emerging complaints, certainly by the 22nd of November and actually before then. Uh, therefore, the very least you could say is that the Permanent Secretary put herself at the centre of a policy as the decision maker with the knowledge that complaints were coming forward. That is the minimum conclusion you could draw from that. And it was a radical departure in terms of, of Scottish Government uh, uh, policy. I think, thirdly, the, the Crown Agent, uh, as you, I think actually it was you in the, questioning the Permanent Secretary, uh, you pointed out that uh, what the policy says under certain circumstances, the Scottish Government would refer to the police. It doesn't say refer to the Crown agent. 
Uh, I think that is significant, and it's highly significant that the Crown agents attempt to, to give the, uh, uh, the Chief Constable and the lead officer a copy of the Permanent Secretary's report was declined by them because they said it might uh, influence their investigation. Uh, and the decision, despite the information that was offered by the police, that they would be opposed to the matters becoming public in case it contaminated their investigation, that despite that, it was the intention uh, to release a press statement on the 23rd of August, two days later, which was stopped, of course, by the threat of interdict. The fourth point I would put, which is well known to this committee, is the question of the external legal advice, probably, as we know, on the 31st of October, and the extraordinary lengths that have been gone to prevent that advice being shared by this committee and the Parliament. Uh, we know that uh, what was in the content of that advice, even reading it, was, was strong. We don't know the full extent of it, but um, certainly I think we conclude that the the external legal advisers were telling the government at that stage that the prospects were not looking good, to say the least, for the uh, judicial review. Therefore, what possible reason could there be for extending that action, which would be much, much more difficult when it came to court than it would be in an earlier concession, never mind the hundreds of thousands of pounds that are being wasted, uh, unless there was a hope of the review perhaps being assisted, never coming to court, which is why it comes to uh, be a major point uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the non-provision of assisting information. The fifth point I'd have is, is also, uh, uh, which we've been discussing, is the question of the integrity of the investigative function. Uh, and my belief is that once the police start an uh, investigation, then it's not for other agencies to be conducting parallel investigations. That is quite wrong. It's one matter to be assisting the police with their inquiries, which every responsible citizen should do. But you shouldn't be trying to assist them with inquiries to the extent of producing the evidence you're frustrated that the police can't find, or creating the evidence, or suborning witnesses, or pressurising witnesses, or pressurising the police, all information which this a committee has. Uh, and finally, although the full extent of neither the government information nor the text messages known to the committee. We've already read out and Ms. Mitchell and my, between Ms. Mitchell and myself half a dozen such messages which are in the public domain and which can be considered by this committee because the one exemption there is in section 162, if you look further down, is that it exempts information which is in the public domain. Now, these six instances, I think, give you pretty substantial justification for what you've just read out to me, looking at them individually, but all six, and perhaps another dozen that I could mention as well, but just taking these as the, as the main themes, that, I think, is not an unreasonable conclusion. Obviously, my conclusion is informed by other material that I've seen. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Um, again, on your fourth submission, I've just got four, I think five points should be de dealt with a little bit more briefly. Um, uh, on page 11, of your fourth submission, you say, uh, from a very early stage in the digital review, the government realised that they were at risk of losing. By October, they were told by external counsel that on the balance of probability, they would likely lose. Now, again, you've said that everything you write here can be backed up by evidence. What's your evidence of that, given that we haven't seen that advice? How well, do you make I, that conclusion? Well, I, I, how do you prove a, uh, advice hasn't been produced? Uh, yeah. I've not, I've not, you say quite clearly, by October well, they were told. Yeah, that, How do you know that? Right, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that uh, that is the case, and I've got every reason to believe that's the case, and I believe that's the reason you haven't been shown the external counsel legal advice. Uh, no, but uh, I, I wouldn't be here saying it's the case unless it absolutely was the case. Because you're speaking under oath. I'm speaking under oath, yes, okay, and, uh, and uh, that's the whole point of speaking under oath, and you won't be getting a correcting letter several days hence to correct that statement. I have every absolute reason to believe that legal advice on the 31st of October, as I understand it, but certainly about then, it indicated that on the balance of probability, the government were going to lose the judicial review. Okay, and on page 15, can I ask you if it is on the same basis that you've just answered that question, 
that where you write, this information on likely defeat in the GR was communicated to key decision makers, the permanent secretary, first minister, the Lord Advocate, the chief of staff, in meetings with external counsel through October and November 2018. So on the same basis that you've just told me that you believe that to be true. Well, uh, and also the basis that you've seen from the Freedom of Information request, sure. the list of uh, the 17 meetings, and you've seen the sequence of meetings, as you under, I mean, Paul Coquette indicated, it was read out earlier on, of the, the, nobody was under any illusions about the significance of the information that had come forward. He didn't explain why it hadn't come forward, but nonetheless, the, nobody was under any illusions. And the sequence of meetings of external counsel is set out on the FOI. And of course, the participants at these meetings, and you'll have seen that on three, uh, three meetings running, the First Minister's Chief of Staff was there, the Permanent Secretary was there, and then the Permanent Secretary and the First Minister were there in early November 2018. So you have the, that evidence plus the, the evidence from the FOI and the sequence of meetings. What you don't have, of course, is anything from either these meetings, out with the external legal advice itself. You don't have anything from these meetings or any of the daily meetings spoken about by Paul Coquette or any of the three times a week meetings spoken about by Judith McKinnon. I really think you should go and get them. Well, it's not for want of trying, Mr. Salmond. We have, I think. Um, uh, second last question. In the ICO, Information Commissioner Office um, report that you helpfully provided to us, with us, which is an investigation, actually I understand it's in a, an appeal or review of a decision, but nevertheless, it's a detailed analysis of the attempt to um, ascertain why uh, information in the decision, port, decision report got into the public domain. And at 4.3, um, uh, the, the, the author of the ICO letter, forgive me, I don't recall who it, who it is, but it doesn't matter. It says 4.3, I have also considered the statement of Detective Chief Superintendent, their names redacted, helpfully provided by Levy and McRae. The statement confirms that at a meeting on the 21st August 2018, the police were offered a copy of the internal misconduct investigation report, but refused to take it. Furthermore, at that meeting, DCS redacted, voiced concerns about the SG, Scottish Government, making a public statement about the outcome of their investigations. So this statement um, that confirms these things, is this a statement that you have seen? Uh, the proposed statement of two days later? No, sorry, the statement of Detective Chief Superintendent yeah, redacted. It, yes, it is, and it's a very interesting point you've just raised, because, of course, that is an exemption to Section 162. Uh, the reason that we were able to give the ICO a copy of that statement is because the Crown Office permitted us to do so. Uh, so we've just had a discussion, and you know, congratulations for, 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 for pinpointing the point, as to whether this parliamentary committee was entitled to, to see information under 162. That statement was provided for the ICO with the permission of the Crown Office in itself an exemption uh, to 162. So the idea that was put forward a few seconds ago that the Crown Office has no discretion in these matters, well, clearly they, they found discretion as far as the ICO is concerned. And let me say, no complaints about that. That was exactly the right thing to do, uh, to provide that information to assist the ICO in its investigations. My argument would be it would also be the right thing to do to assist a, a parliamentary committee of the Scottish Parliament. Okay, and just on that, the reason for asking that really was um, due to my own ignorance as to whether this committee has that statement. To your knowledge, has that been disclosed to this committee? No, it was disclosed to the ICO. As a, as Do you a, have a copy of it? Yeah, Levy and McRae? Well, Levy and McRae have a, a, would you a, be a, able? Would you be able, were this committee to ask you or to ask Levy and McRae, would they be able to provide it to this uh, committee? Well, not according to the Crown Office. Okay, thanks. We can, uh, we can, we can the same. We'll, get, uh, we'll get the fourth letter okay. telling us... Uh, Fine. what we can and can't provide to a parliamentary committee. But the ICO investigators' report, as you know, is, is, is very revealing. And uh, I raised earlier the apparent uh, discrepancy between what's said in this report about who had access to the information in terms of the principal private secretary in the First Minister's office and what has been said and then corrected to this committee, which I, I think is worth, uh, worth pursuing. Thanks. Uh, and just finally, this goes back to questions from Jackie Bailey about 
whether meetings in, on the 2nd of April, for example, and subsequent ones were by the First Minister were in a party capacity or government business. Uh, can I put it to you that there's a third possibility here, that actually the subject matter of these meetings was complaints by civil servants against a former minister as part of the employment process, a process you disagree with and all the rest of it, but nevertheless, a complaints procedure in the civil service. It's not really party and neither is it really government. Government is about the government's policy on housing and independence, etc. It is, is, is it, I'm just putting it to you, there's a third possibility that because this is an internal employment matter, that it's not quite as stark as being party or government. But you can, they can, you can put that uh, uh, to me, but that's not been the point I've been making about uh, the, the meetings. What I've said about the meetings, there was never any doubt about what the subject matter was. Uh, it's up for, for others to explain uh, as they've been trying to do in front of this committee as to whether they thought it was a party meeting or a, a government meeting. Uh, my point is there was never any dubiety about what the meeting was about. Uh, and in my view, there's no dubiety about the meeting on the 29th of March, which set up the meeting on the 2nd of April. And there's no dubiety that the 29th of March meeting somehow disappeared from the, the public record for an extended period uh, until the, the the fact of it was broadcast on Sky Television in July of last year. That's the questions I'm asking. Uh, you could put any uh, construction of, on whether that's a, a meeting of one or a hybrid meeting or whatever it might be, but that's not been my point. Uh, it's maybe a point that others have, uh, have developed, but not me. Okay, thanks very much, Convener. Thank you. Uh, we're almost at a close. Uh, I have Maureen Watt and then Margaret Mitchell, both with short contributions. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr. Salmond, you said in your written evidence that you support protecting the anonymity of complainers and that this is something that you've had held, upheld at every stage in this process, yet you've provided material directly to committee MSPs, some of which has then leaked into the public domain. Um, there is a process that um, evidence goes to committee clerks so that it can be um, scrutinised uh, by committee lawyers. It's not up to you or your lawyers, it's up to committee clerks and committee lawyers to um, decide what should go to uh, MSPs and whether there's a risk uh, within the material that um, there could be identification. So what was your motivation for not following the correct procedure, which was designed to protect the, identify, the identities of complainers in a criminal trial? Well, let, let me firstly refute absolutely that anything we have done or published or sent uh, questions the identity or anonymity of, uh, of uh, complainants. Uh, and the, uh, I've already given you the example in what's under your purview in terms of the uh, uh, of the uh, remit of the committee in terms of the, the civil case and the efforts we went to to protect that anonymity in the, uh, the court of session hearing where the government didn't bother to turn up. Uh, but in terms of the argument uh, that we shouldn't send stuff to members of a parliamentary committee and somehow that's an irresponsible thing to do or not the right thing to do, I, I don't accept that. Every single member of this committee has uh, their duties and responsibilities as a member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, they're equal before this committee, and that is not sending to a parliamentary committee. What uh, you know, I, uh, I thought was interesting uh, that uh, when Kenny McCaskill sent this committee information that he had received and sent it to the Crown Office, nothing happened with that information. Uh, the, it wasn't until it was published in the press that it became public and therefore was, and to me that was an extraordinary, an extraordinary situation to develop. But I don't think, to answer your question, Ms. Watt, that it's a, a wrong or irresponsible thing to do. And I refute absolutely that anything we've submitted to anybody puts a question mark on the anonymity of complainants. And furthermore, the one paragraph that the Crown Office objected to, and I know you follow these things closely, was objected to not on the basis of being jigsaw identification in itself, but on the basis of 
information which had been previously published by this committee, which led to the jigsaw identification. Now, there's, uh, these arguments can get very technical, but what is beyond argument is that two weeks ago, the, the Crown Office did not consider anything, anything, uh, in the uh, submission that was made to this committee to be in danger of breaching anything. And for some reason, earlier this week, on the very point of coming before the committee, there was a change in position. Anybody who has seen that evidence, and everybody who has seen that evidence, cannot understand why anything in that evidence uh, gives rise to a risk of identification. These things are there correctly to protect the vulnerable, not to shield the mighty. Can I just uh, remind everybody again that that would be an issue for the Scottish Parliament corporate body rather than this committee? Margaret Mitchell. Yeah, thank you. And these are my final questions, um, Mr. Salmond. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the committee wrote to Police Scotland and we got information about the contact that had been made with them during the policy being developed and actually that three month period. And um, I think. Police Scotland were told uh, there were actually six meetings um, between first a contact on the 5th of December 2017 right up to um, the 3rd of August and hypothetical um, questions were put and the police quite clearly said um, without knowing any details or hypothetical things if criminality was suspected individuals should be directed to support and advocacy. They also went on to say that um, this advice was reiterated on several occasions and they conclude by saying really that if there was, um, if the, the parliament was seeking to investigate themselves, they clearly um, were, not, um, were not qualified to do so. They didn't have the training. So that was before the, um, the final policy was concluded. So I suppose my question in, in going back to um, Stuart, Stuart Macmillan is duty of care for these, um, these uh, women who had come forward. We know they didn't want to go to the police. That's been substantiated in evidence. The sounding board and the duty of care absolutely is something you would want to put in place, but there was a real intensity of contact with the women, and I think it may have been your solicitors that said that may have been bordering on encouragement. And if that is the case, then the question is, for this, this plan, this malicious um, plan that you've, you've outlined to um, discredit you and remove you from public life. If this was in place, the big question is, what was the motivation? Why? I think that's what everyone was, was asking. Uh, just why did they do it? It just seems, you know, so bizarre. But do you have um, a reason why you think that this process started and perhaps got a bit out of hand? I think motivation changed uh, over time, and, and, and just for clarity, I've, uh, I've never suggested for a second that the original complaints uh, and uh, complainers were anything to do with uh, a motivation about me in politics or anything like that. I don't think they had anything to do with it at all. Uh, I think the complainants were incredibly poorly served, uh, as you just outlined by being forced into a criminal process against their direct wishes and against every assurance they'd been given over months that that wouldn't happen. Uh, I think it was Judith McKinnon who was asked, uh, who asked you to sound them out? Uh, and she said that she thought it was Nicky Richards. It wasn't, it was the permanent secretary. Uh, and the consequences of that for, for the people concerned are huge. And uh, it's totally wrong, completely and utterly wrong. Uh, I think the, the motivation for what I've said about the, uh, the people I've named in the, in the document is quite different. I, I think it came to be believed that the solution to a huge, looming, enormous difficulty and problem 
it wasn't to just, as I'm sure the Lord Advocate did, to consider assisting as an academic exercise or something that might have to come into play, and, but was actually a, a, a means of preventing something, uh, a, something unfortunate, more than unfortunate, something disastrous happening in terms of a defeat in the judicial review. The two things became to be combined. It became to be very important that the uh, criminal case overtook the judicial review. Uh, and the messages that I've seen uh, indicate that as a prime motivation. So when I saw them, and I think it was the 23rd or maybe earlier of, of January last year, I, I found them extraordinary, probably the most shocking thing I'd ever seen in my life, unless it was there in, in front of me. I couldn't have possibly believed it. So the these people, if they ever came before a committee, should be asked about their motivations. But uh, certainly what they uh, revealed of themselves in these text messages would indicate that was the prime concern was defeat in the judicial review and the idea that somehow the criminal case would either overtake it or alternatively, after the, the judicial review was lost, the, the a criminal case against me, as of course, would blanket out all other publicity. It would be the most uh, enormous uh, story. And if I had been convicted on anything, and as I said earlier, we wouldn't have been having these hearings and, and nothing of that. So that would what I'd point to uh, as, uh, uh, as motivation. Right. So there wouldn't be any motivation, I think it's been thought about, that you are a private citizen, that you might be contemplating a return to public life, and that <clears throat> by moving forward in this way where there were so many times they were told the procedure was unlawful. They were told they weren't qualified to carry it out. If um, they had serious concerns, they should be directed to advocacy. They weren't trained. Uh, the, the, the government staff weren't trained. But they persisted. And they persisted with the judicial review to a point that just um, defies comprehension. So is that just absolute incompetence from people who are civil servants, well qualified, um, guilt edge pensions there to, to be impartial, in which case then <laughs> that's deeply worrying, or was there something else behind it? What was your relationship with the, the First Minister over years? I, I, first, I, I don't think the civil servants had a political motivation. I, I think motivations lay elsewhere in the, in the case of the Permanent Secretary. And, uh, I've seen previous evidence sessions where there are documents which suggest that uh, the, uh, motivation was being uh, seen to be in the vanguard of, of, uh, of events, perhaps. But you have to ask the Permanent Secretary again exactly what her motivation was. In terms of not conceding the judicial review, then I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, it is, I mean if the judicial review had been conceded, let's, for example, let's say October, then the, the bill to the public would have been very small in comparison with what it became. The, the huge bills came from having to go to the Commission in Diligence, you know, like two days before Christmas, uh, as it sat and people came in to under oath. Uh, so any, any calculation that said, you know, we are going to lose this uh, and what's the best thing to do? Well, it would be to settle it as quickly as you could and to minimise the damage, unless, of course, you believe for some reason or another uh, that the judicial review might never come to, to court. It might be sisted into the, the ever after by the events in the, in the criminal case. And my belief, strong belief, is that uh, some people, unfortunately, weren't willing to let matters take their course, but wanted to give the, uh, the criminal case a, a big shove forward. And the, the messages I read were one of the most uh, distressing days of my life. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I just ask, oh, Andy, was that you saying you wished to come uh, in? I just have short... one very short question. Very short, Whenever. please. Cause... Now? OK, yes. thank you. Uh, Mr Salmond, do you have full confidence in the independent advisers on the ministerial code? Uh, and thus, can we rely on Mr Hamilton's findings as an authoritative statement of the facts and circumstances that he's been asked to look at yeah. when, they, when, 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 when they're published? One, uh, I set up the system. Uh, two, I appointed Mr Hamilton. Uh, I should say I never met him uh, 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 in my life, and I've, uh, I've only corresponded with him 
uh, uh, recently. Uh, I'm being interviewed by him, I think, on Monday or, or Tuesday, certainly in the, in the very near future. I've got every reason to, to, to believe that he is a, a, a man of uh, great integrity and experience and is uh, uh, the sort of person, well, I did appoint him to the, the panel. So the, the panel, of course, was introduced by me. Before that, there was, there was no independent supervision of the ministerial code at all. Uh, and the panel, I think, has been a, a good innovation. The one thing I would say from recent experience, and you've seen the correspondence, is I think it's heavily unsatisfactory that uh, uh, the remit of should be confined <coughs> in any way. I mean, the, the remit should be it should be determined by the the independent panels, not not set in, in strict terms. And I hope and believe that uh, that problem has been overcome. But I've got every confidence that, uh, that Mr Hamilton will discharge his duties in a, in a proper way, and I think it's fundamentally a good system. Thank you. Right, I'm going to be very strict from now on. <clears throat> Jackie Bailey assures me with great intent that it's a tiny question. <clears throat> and can I have a tiny answer, please, Mr Salmond, if at all possible? Jackie it is Bailey. indeed a tiny question, convener, I do promise. Um, Mr Salmond has been very, very careful not to call for Nicola Sturgeon to resign. Does that mean you've forgiven her for her handling of this? No, it, it means that the, the people I've, uh, <coughs> uh, I've named and the evidence uh, that I put forward, I believe there's documentary evidence for the reasons that, uh, that they should consider their positions. Uh, that, uh, uh, whether you call it careful, whether you call it anything else, uh, uh, I don't think it's for me to judge what happens to someone who may have broken the ministerial code. If they have broken the ministerial code, if Mr Hamilton finds that or this committee finds that, then I suppose the next question is, what is the breach? Uh, and then that will be determined. But I'm in, the, I'm in the fortunate position as a former First Minister, that is no longer uh, my responsibility. It's partially the responsibility of this committee, substantially the responsibility of Mr James Hamilton and all of the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. I have only one final uh, little thing I wanted <coughs> to ask, following up from what Margaret Mitchell was talking about. Um, there has been a lot of discussion, obviously, and the, the word conspiracy has been used a lot, although I do note, Mr Simon, that you said that that's not a word that you, you wanted to use. You talk about a malicious plan. From what I've picked up today, you, you've said repeatedly um, about your concern about this being after the police investigation has started. Can I just ask you to confirm to me, is that when you believe any plan started that was, um, what could we say, malicious towards you in its intent? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, that is the, my view on the, on the, the nature of what I've seen this. Uh, and, the, and it became because of the circumstances that I've described, because of what was going to happen in the judicial review and, uh, and the hope that the police investigation would, uh, would come to the rescue of that. I've got many parts of information. I, I would just say to you that almost happened. That very, very mm. close to happening, uh, not just in the time of... Uh, of the, the police interview, but the original date for the police interview came before the judicial review uh, was due to hear, and it was only with the great work of, uh, of my legal team that we were able to argue that shouldn't happen. So that almost uh, came to pass uh, now. Uh, we're in a position that... Uh, a, and we are in a, a position that the court and jury have decided, and therefore the matters before you are uh, are now very pertinent in the, in the public interest again. But yes, uh, the broad answer to your question is uh, is correct. Thank you. Uh, now, can I ask you, Mr. Salmon, do you wish to make any final comments? Only one, uh, and that is that uh, you know beyond the individual. Uh, in detail of this, uh, there is an underlying issue, which is about the uh, powers of the Parliament, the powers of a parliamentary committee, the obstruction from the civil service, the obstruction, as I see it, from the Crown Office and the leadership of the Crown Office in terms of the parliamentary committee doing its job. I, I believe and hope uh, and know that among this committee there would be a desire 
to be able to discharge that function if it was clearly able to do so. Uh, we have examined the, uh, the issue of uh, Clause 162 and whether there can be exemptions from it and, and whether that presents difficulties and the behaviour of the Crown Office with regard to it. I think there is a solution, and I will offer it to the committee and leave it in your hands. Hitherto, you have been serving orders as a parliament on people who have been unwilling to give you information. Can I suggest that you use your powers under the Scotland Act, and it is a matter for this committee, to serve that order on my solicitors, who are extremely willing to give you information? It is a matter for this committee, but if you do so, eh, then I am sure you will get full cooperation under the law from my solicitors. Eh, furthermore, if we are on a roll here, uh, then the information of the letters from the Crown Office preventing me from furnishing you with that information hitherto is something you might also like to request under, uh, under the same powers of the Scotland Act. And any other information which Mr Whiteman has, has uh, come up with today, which would also be of assistance uh, to the committee. Uh, for example, the, uh, official record, uh, sorry, the official record of the Commission on Diligence. Uh, which uh, I also think I have all these documents here, as it happens. Uh, but uh, if you decide as a committee you would like to go down that course, and clearly you have got to deliberate, uh, then if you serve that order on my solicitors, you will have the documentation on Monday morning uh, in time uh, for your uh, sessions with the Lord Advocate and, I understand it, the Crown Agent, Mr David Harvey. It is a matter for you, convener. And other than that, can I thank all committee members for their, their courtesy and forbearance, and particularly you, convener, for uh, allowing the, uh, uh, the break earlier on. Uh, that, that was much appreciated, and uh, I wish you well in your deliberations. Uh, thank you, Mr Salmond. There may be some other things that the committee may feel they would like some information on, and if so, uh, we can write to you via your solicitor. Uh, it may be that you wish to send us any further information when you look over the official report today. Please send that to our clerks, as previously requested, as per our publication policy. Thank you very, very much for your evidence and volunteering to come today. And I will now have to move on to the next agenda item. Uh, so I close the public part of this meeting.